Princeton University Press Audio presents The Origins and History of Consciousness by Eric Neumann Read by William Roberts He whose vision cannot cover history's three thousand years must in outer darkness hover, live within the day's frontiers. Goethe, Das Töstlicher Divan Forward. The author has requested me to preface his book with a few words of introduction, and to this I accede all the more readily because I found his work more than usually welcome. It begins just where I, too, if I were granted a second lease of life, would start to gather up the disjecta membra of my own writings, to sift out all those beginnings without continuations, and knead them into a whole. As I read through the manuscript of this book, it became clear to me how great are the disadvantages of pioneer work. One stumbles through unknown regions, one is led astray by analogies, forever losing the Ariadne thread. One is overwhelmed by new impressions and new possibilities, and the worst disadvantage of all is that the pioneer only knows afterwards what he should have known before. The second generation has the advantage of a clearer, if still incomplete, picture. Certain landmarks that at least lie on the frontiers of the essential have grown familiar, and one now knows what must be known if one is to explore the newly discovered territory. Thus forewarned and forearmed, a representative of the second generation can spot the most distant connections. He can unravel problems and give a coherent account of the whole field of study, whose full extent the pioneer can only survey at the end of his life's work. This difficult and meritorious task the author has performed with outstanding success. He has woven his facts into a pattern and created a unified whole, which no pioneer could have done nor could ever have attempted to do. As though in confirmation of this, the present work opens at the very place where I unwittingly made landfall on the new continent long ago, namely the realm of matriarchal symbolism. And, as a conceptual framework for his discoveries, the author uses a symbol whose significance first dawned on me in my recent writings on the psychology of alchemy, the Uruboros. Upon this foundation he has succeeded in constructing a unique history of the evolution of consciousness, and at the same time in representing the body of myths as the phenomenology of this same evolution. In this way he arrives at conclusions and insights which are among the most important ever to be reached in this field. Naturally, to me as a psychologist, the most valuable aspect of the work is the fundamental contribution it makes to a psychology of the unconscious. The author has placed the concepts of analytical psychology, which for many people are so bewildering, on a firm evolutionary basis, and erected upon this a comprehensive structure in which the empirical forms of thought find their rightful place. No system can ever dispense with an overall hypothesis which in its turn depends upon the temperament and subjective assumptions of the author, as well as upon objective data. This factor is of the greatest importance in psychology, for the personal equation colors the mode of seeing. Ultimate truth, if there be such a thing, demands the concert of many voices. I can only congratulate the author on his achievement. May this brief forward convey to him my heartfelt thanks. C. G. Jung, March the 1st, 1949 Introduction The following attempt to outline the archetypal stages in the development of consciousness is based on modern depth psychology. It is an application of the analytical psychology of C. G. Jung, 
even where we endeavor to amplify this psychology, and even though we may speculatively overstep its boundaries. Unlike other possible and necessary methods of inquiry, which consider the development of consciousness in relation to external environmental factors, our inquiry is more concerned with the internal, psychic, and archetypal factors which determine the course of that development. The structural elements of the collective unconscious are named by Jung archetypes, or primordial images. They are the pictorial forms of the instincts, or the unconscious reveals itself to the conscious mind in images, which, as in dreams and fantasies, initiate the process of conscious reaction and assimilation. These fantasy images undoubtedly have their closest analogues in mythological types. We must therefore assume that they correspond to certain collective and not personal structural elements of the human psyche in general, and, like the morphological elements of the human body, are inherited. The archetypal structural elements of the psyche are psychic organs upon whose functioning the well-being of the individual depends, and whose injury has disastrous consequences. Moreover, they are the unfailing causes of neurotic and even psychotic disorders, behaving exactly like neglected or maltreated physical organs or organic functional systems. It is the task of this book to show that a series of archetypes is a main constituent of mythology, that they stand in an organic relation to one another, and that their stadial succession determines the growth of consciousness. In the course of its ontogenetic development, the individual ego consciousness has to pass through the same archetypal stages which determine the evolution of consciousness in the life of humanity. The individual has, in his own life, to follow the road that humanity has trod before him, leaving traces of its journey in the archetypal sequence of the mythological images we are now about to examine. Normally, the archetypal stages are lived through without disturbance, and the development of consciousness proceeds in them just as naturally as physical development proceeds in the stages of bodily maturation. As organs of the psyche's structure, the archetypes articulate with one another autonomously, like the physical organs, and determine the maturation of the personality in a manner analogous to the biological hormone components of the physical constitution. Besides possessing an eternal significance, the archetype also has an equally legitimate historical aspect. Ego consciousness evolves by passing through a series of eternal images, and the ego, transformed in the passage, is constantly experiencing a new relation to the archetypes. Its relation to the eternality of the archetypal images is a process of succession in time. That is to say, it takes place in stages. The ability to perceive, to understand, and to interpret these images changes as ego consciousness changes in the course of man's phylogenetic and ontogenetic history. Consequently, the relativity of the eternal image to the evolving ego consciousness becomes more and more pronounced. The archetypes that determine the stages of conscious development form only a segment of archetypal reality as a whole. But by availing ourselves of the evolutionary or synoptic view, we can make out a kind of guiding line running through limitless symbolism of the collective unconscious, which helps us to orient ourselves in the theory and practice of depth psychology. An investigation of the archetypal stages also affords a better psychological orientation in a number of ancillary subjects. For example, the history of religion, anthropology, folk psychology, and the like. All these can then be brought together on a psycho-evolutionary basis, which would promote a deeper understanding. Surprisingly enough, these specialized sciences 
have not so far allowed themselves to be sufficiently enriched by depth psychology, and least of all by union psychology. In spite of that, the psychological starting point of these disciplines emerges more and more plainly, and it is beginning to become obvious that the human psyche is the source of all cultural and religious phenomena. Hence, a final reckoning with depth psychology cannot be evaded much longer. We must emphasize that our exposition of myth is not based on any specialized branch of science, whether archaeology, comparative religion, or theology, but simply and solely on the practical work of the psychotherapist, whose concern is the psychic background of modern man. The connection between his psychology and the deeper layers of humanity still alive in him is therefore the real starting point and subject of this work. The deductive and systematic method of exposition here adopted may at first obscure the topical and therapeutic significance of our findings, but anyone familiar with psychic events at the deepest level will recognize the importance and relevance of these connections, whose detailed illustration by modern empirical material is reserved for later examination. As is well known, the comparative method of analytical psychology collates the symbolic and collective material found in individuals with the corresponding products from the history of religion, primitive psychology, and so on, and in this way arrives at an interpretation by establishing the context. This method we now supplement by the evolutionary approach, which considers the material from the standpoint of the stage reached by the developing consciousness, and hence by the ego in its relations with the unconscious. Our work, therefore, links up with that fundamental early work of Jung's The Psychology of the Unconscious even though we may be obliged to make certain emendations. Whereas in Freudian psychoanalysis, the evolutionary approach led only to a concretistic and narrowly personalistic theory of libido, analytical psychology has so far failed to pursue this line of inquiry any further. The emergence of the collective human background as a transpersonal reality has forced us to recognize the relativity of our own position. The multiplicity of forms and phenomena in which the infinite diversity of the human psyche is expressed, the wealth of cultures, values, patterns of behavior, and worldviews produced by the vitality of man's psychic structure, must make any attempt at a general orientation seem, at the outset, a perilous venture. Yet such an attempt has to be made, even with the knowledge that our specifically Western orientation is only one among many. The evolution of consciousness as a form of creative evolution is a peculiar achievement of Western man. Creative evolution of ego consciousness means that through a continuous process stretching over thousands of years, the conscious system has absorbed more and more unconscious contents and progressively extended its frontiers. Although from antiquity right down to recent times, we see a new and differently patterned canon of culture continually superseding the previous one, the West has nevertheless succeeded in achieving an historical and cultural continuity in which each canon gradually came to be integrated. The structure of modern consciousness rests on this integration, and at each period of its development, the ego has to absorb essential portions of the cultural past transmitted to it by the canon of values embodied in its own culture and system of education. A creative character of consciousness is a central feature of the cultural canon of the West. In Western culture and Partly also in the Far East, we can follow the continuous, though often fitful, development of consciousness over the last 10,000 years. Here alone, as the canon of stadial development, collectively embodied in mythological projections, become a model for the development of the individual human being. 
Here alone have the creative beginnings of individuality been taken over by the collective and held up as the ideal of all individual development. Wherever this type of creative ego consciousness has developed or is still developing, the archetypal stages of conscious evolution are in force. In stationary cultures or in primitive societies, where the original features of human culture are still preserved, the earliest stages of man's psychology predominate to such a degree that individual and creative traits are not assimilated by the collective. Indeed, creative individuals possessed of a stronger consciousness are even branded by the collective as antisocial. The creativity of consciousness may be jeopardized by religious or political totalitarianism, for any authoritarian fixation of the canon leads to sterility of consciousness. Such fixations, however, can only be provisional. So far as Western man is concerned, the assimilative vitality of his ego consciousness is more or less assured. The progress of science and the increasingly obvious threat to humanity from unconscious forces impel his consciousness from within and without to continual self-analysis and expansion. The individual is the bearer of this creative activity of the mind, and therefore remains the decisive factor in all future Western developments. This holds true regardless of the fact that individuals cooperate and mutually determine the spiritual democracy in which they live. Any attempt to outline the archetypal stages from the standpoint of analytical psychology must begin by drawing a fundamental distinction between personal and transpersonal psychic factors. Personal factors are those which belong to one individual personality and are not shared by any other individual, regardless of whether they are conscious or unconscious. Transpersonal factors, on the other hand, are collective, supra- or extra-personal, and are to be regarded not as external conditions of society, but as internal structural elements. The transpersonal represents a factor that is largely independent of the personal, for the personal, both collectively and individually, is a late product of evolution. Every historical inquiry, and every evolutionary approach is in this sense historical, must therefore begin with the transpersonal. In the history of mankind, as in the development of the individual, there is an initial preponderance of transpersonal factors, and only in the course of development does the personal realm come into view and achieve independence. The individualized conscious man of our era is a late man, whose structure is built on early pre-individual human stages from which individual consciousness has only detached itself step by step. The evolution of consciousness by stages is as much a collective human phenomenon as a particular individual phenomenon. Ontogenetic development may therefore be regarded as a modified recapitulation of phylogenetic development. This interdependence of collective and individual has two psychic concomitants. On the one hand, the early history of the collective is determined by inner primordial images whose projections appear outside as powerful factors, gods, spirits, or demons, which become objects of worship. On the other hand, man's collective symbolisms also appear in the individual, and the psychic development or misdevelopment of each individual is governed by the same primordial images which determine man's collective history. Since we have undertaken to expound the whole canon of mythological stages, their sequence, their interconnections, and their symbolism, it is not only permissible, but imperative, to draw the relevant material from different spheres of culture and different mythologies, irrespective of whether or not all stages are present in any one culture. We do not therefore maintain that all the stages of conscious development are to be found always, everywhere, and in every mythology. 
any more than the theory of evolution maintains that the evolutionary stages of every animal species are repeated in man's evolution. What we do maintain is that these developmental stages arrange themselves in an orderly sequence and thus determine all psychic development. Equally, we maintain that these archetypal stages are unconscious determinants and can be found in mythology and that only by viewing the collective stratification of human development together with the individual stratification of conscious development can we arrive at an understanding of psychic development in general and individual development in particular. Again, the relation between the transpersonal and the personal, which plays a decisive role in every human life, is prefigured in human history. But the collective aspect of this relationship does not mean that unique or recurrent historical events are inherited, for up to the present there has been no scientific proof of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. For this reason, analytical psychology considers the structure of the psyche to be determined by a priori transpersonal dominance, archetypes, which, being essential components, and organs of the psyche from the beginning mold the course of human history. The castration motif, for instance, is not the result of the inheritance of an endlessly repeated threat of castration by a primordial father, or rather by an infinity of primordial fathers. Science has discovered nothing that could possibly support such a theory, which, moreover, presupposes the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Any reduction of the castration threat, parricide, the primal scene of parental intercourse and so on, to historical and personalistic data, which presumes to paint the early history of humanity in the likeness of a patriarchal bourgeois family of the 19th century, is scientifically impossible. It is one of the tasks of this book to show that, in regard to these and similar complexes, We are really dealing with symbols, ideal forms, psychic categories, and basic structural patterns whose infinitely varied modes of operation govern the history of mankind and the individual. The development of consciousness in archetypal stages is a transpersonal fact, a dynamic self-revelation of the psychic structure, which dominates the history of mankind and the individual. Even deviations from the path of evolution, their symbology and symptomatology must be understood in relation to the prior archetypal pattern. In the first part of our exposition, the mythological stages in the evolution of consciousness, the accent lies on the wide distribution of the mythological material and on demonstrating the connections between the symbols and the various strata of conscious development. Only against this background can we understand the normal developments of the psyche, as well as the pathological phenomena in which collective problems constantly appear as the basic problems of human existence and so must be understood in that light. Besides uncovering the evolutionary stages and their archetypal connections, Our inquiry also has a therapeutic aim, which is both individual and collective. The integration of personal psychic phenomena with the corresponding transpersonal symbols is of paramount importance for the further development of consciousness and for the synthesis of the personality. The rediscovery of the human and cultural strata from which these symbols derive is, in the original sense of the word, Bildent, informing. Consciousness thus acquires images. Builder, an education. Bildung, widens its horizon and charges itself with contents which constellate a new psychic potential. New problems appear, but also new solutions. As the purely personal data enter into association with the transpersonal and the collective human aspect is rediscovered and begins to come alive, New insights, new possibilities of life, add themselves to the narrowly personalistic and rigid personality of the sick-souled modern man. 
Our aim is not confined to pointing out the correct relation of the ego to the unconscious and of the personal to the transpersonal. We have also to realize that the false personalistic interpretation of everything psychic is the expression of an unconscious law which has everywhere constrained modern man to misinterpret his true role and significance. Only when we have made it clear to what degree the reduction of the transpersonal to the personal springs from a tendency which once had a very deep meaning, but which the crisis of modern consciousness has rendered wholly meaningless and nonsensical, will our task be fulfilled. Only when we have recognized how the personal develops out of the transpersonal, detaches itself from it, but, despite the crucial role of ego consciousness, always remains rooted in it, can we restore to the transpersonal factors their original weight and meaning, lacking which a healthy collective and individual life is impossible. This brings us to a psychological phenomenon which will be fully discussed in Part 2, under the Law of Secondary Personalization. This maintains that contents which are primarily transpersonal and originally appeared as such are, in the course of development, taken to be personal. The secondary personalization of primary transpersonal contents is, in a certain sense, an evolutionary necessity, but it constellates dangers which, for modern man, are altogether excessive. It is necessary for the structure of personality that contents originally taking the form of transpersonal deities should finally come to be experienced as contents of the human psyche. But this process ceases to be a danger to psychic health only when the psyche is itself regarded suprapersonally as a numinous world of transpersonal happenings. If, on the other hand, transpersonal contents are reduced to the data of a purely personalistic psychology, the result is not only an appalling impoverishment of individual life that might remain merely a private concern, but also a congestion of the collective unconscious, which has disastrous consequences for humanity at large. Psychology, having penetrated to the collective layer in its investigation of the lower levels of the individual psyche, is faced with a task of evolving a collective and cultural therapy adequate to cope with the mass phenomena that are now devastating mankind. One of the most important objectives of any depth psychology in the future is its application to the collective. It has to correct and prevent the dislocation of collective life of the group by applying its specific points of view. The relation of the ego to the unconscious and of the personal to the transpersonal decides the fate not only of the individual, but of humanity. The theater of this encounter is the human mind. In the present work, a substantial part of mythology is seen as the unconscious self-delineation of the growth of consciousness in man. The dialectic between consciousness and the unconscious, its transformation, its self-liberation, and the birth of human personality from this dialectic form the theme of Part 1. Part 1. The Mythological Stages and the Evolution of Consciousness Nature rejoices in nature. Nature subdues nature. Nature rules over nature. Osthenes A. The Creation Myth Nature Rejoices in Nature Chapter 1 The Ouroboros For what the center brings must obviously be that which remains to the end and was there from eternity. Goethe, the Stestlicher Divan The mythological stages and the evolution of consciousness begin with the stage when the ego is contained in the unconscious and lead up to a situation in which the ego not only becomes aware of its own position and defends it heroically, 
but also becomes capable of broadening and relativizing its experiences through the changes effected by its own activity. The first cycle of myth is the creation myth. Here, the mythological projection of psychic material appears in cosmogonic form as the mythology of creation. The world and the unconscious predominate and form the object of myth. Ego and man are only nascent as yet, and their birth, suffering, and emancipation constitute the phases of the creation myth. At the stage of the separation of the world parents, the germ of ego consciousness finally asserts itself. While yet in the fold of the creation myth, it enters upon the second cycle, namely the hero myth, in which the ego, consciousness, and the human world become conscious of themselves and of their dignity. In the beginning is perfection, wholeness. This original perfection can only be circumscribed or described symbolically. Its nature defies any description other than a mythical one, because that which describes the ego and that which is described the beginning, which is prior to any ego, prove to be incommensurable quantities as soon as the ego tries to grasp its object conceptually as a content of consciousness. For this reason, a symbol always stands at the beginning, the most striking feature of which is its multiplicity of meanings, its indeterminate and indeterminable character. The beginning can be laid hold of in two places. It can be conceived in the life of mankind as the earliest dawn of human history, and in the life of the individual as the earliest dawn of childhood. The self-representation of the dawn of human history can be seen from its symbolic description in ritual and myth. The earliest dawn of childhood, like that of mankind, is depicted in the images which rise up from the depths of the unconscious and reveal themselves to the already individualized ego. The dawn state of the beginning projects itself mythologically in cosmic form, appearing as the beginning of the world, as the mythology of creation. Mythological accounts of the beginning must invariably begin with the outside world, for world and psyche are still one. There is as yet no reflecting, self-conscious ego that could refer anything to itself, that is, reflect. Not only is the psyche open to the world, it is still identical with and undifferentiated from the world. It knows itself as world and in the world, and experiences its own becoming as a world becoming, its own images as the starry heavens, and its own contents as the world-creating gods. Ernst Kassirer has shown how, in all peoples and in all religions, creation appears as the creation of light. Thus, the coming of consciousness manifesting itself as light in contrast to the darkness of the unconscious is the real object of creation mythology. Kassirer has likewise shown that in the different stages of mythological consciousness, the first thing to be discovered is subjective reality, the formation of the ego and individuality. The beginning of this development, mythologically regarded as the beginning of the world, is the coming of light, without which no world process could be seen at all. But the earliest dawn is still prior to this birth of light out of darkness, and a wealth of symbols surrounds it. The form of representation peculiar to the unconscious is not that of the conscious mind. It neither attempts nor is able to seize hold of and define its objects in a series of discursive explanations and reduce them to clarity by logical analysis. The way of the unconscious is different. Symbols gather round the thing to be explained, understood, interpreted. The act of becoming conscious consists in the concentric grouping of symbols around the object, all circumscribing and describing the unknown from many sides. Each symbol 
lays bare another essential side of the object to be grasped, points to another facet of meaning. Only the canon of these symbols congregating about the center in question, the coherent symbol group, can lead to an understanding of what the symbols point to and of what they are trying to express. The symbolic story of the beginning, which speaks to us from the mythology of all ages, is the attempt made by man's childlike pre-scientific consciousness to master problems and enigmas which are mostly beyond the grasp of even our developed modern consciousness. If our consciousness, with epistemological resignation, is constrained to regard the question of the beginning as unanswerable and therefore unscientific, it may be right. But the psyche, which can neither be taught nor led astray by the self-criticism of the conscious mind, always poses this question afresh as one that is essential to it. The question of the beginning is also the question, whence? It is the original and fateful question to which cosmology and the creation myths have ever tried to give new and different answers. This original question about the origin of the world is at the same time the question about the origin of man, the origin of consciousness and of the ego. It is the fateful question, where did I come from, that faces every human being as soon as he arrives upon the threshold of self-consciousness. The mythological answers to these questions are symbolical, like all answers that come from the depths of the psyche, the unconscious. The metaphorical nature of the symbol says, this is this, that is that. The statement of identity and the logic of consciousness erected upon it have no value for the psyche and the unconscious. The psyche blends, as does the dream, it spins and weaves together, combining each with each. The symbol is therefore an analogy, more an equivalence than an equation, and therein lies its wealth of meanings, but also its elusiveness. Only the symbol group, compact of partly contradictory analogies, can make something unknown and beyond the grasp of consciousness more intelligible and more capable of becoming conscious. One symbol of original perfection is the circle. Allied to it are the sphere, the egg, and the rotundum, the round of alchemy. It is Plato's round that was there in the beginning. Therefore, the demiurge made the world in the shape of a sphere, giving it that figure which of all is the most perfect and most equal to itself. Circle, sphere, and round are all aspects of the self-contained, which is without beginning and end. In its pre-worldly perfection, it is prior to any process, eternal, for in its roundness there is no before and no after, no time, and there is no above and no below, no space. All this can only come with the coming of light, of consciousness, which is not yet present. Now all is under sway of the unmanifest Godhead, whose symbol is therefore the circle. The round is the egg, the philosophical world egg, the nucleus of the beginning, and the germ from which, as humanity teaches everywhere, the world arises. It is also the perfect state in which the opposites are united, the perfect beginning because the opposites have not yet flown apart and the world has not yet begun, the perfect end because in it the opposites have come together again in a synthesis and the world is once more at rest. The container of opposites is the Chinese Tai Chi, a round containing black and white, day and night, heaven and earth, male and female. Lao Tzu says of it, there was something formless yet complete that existed before heaven and earth, without sound, without substance, dependent on nothing, unchanging, all-pervading, unfailing. One may think of it as the mother of all things under heaven. Each of these pairs of opposites forms the nucleus of a group of symbols, which cannot be described here in any great detail. A few examples must suffice. 
the round, is the calabash containing the world parents. In Egypt, as in New Zealand, in Greece, as in Africa and India, the world parents, heaven and earth, lie one on top of the other in the round, spacelessly and timelessly united. For as yet nothing has come between them to create duality out of the original unity. The container of the masculine and feminine opposites is the great hermaphrodite, the primal creative element, the Hindu Purusha, who combines the poles in himself. In the beginning this world was soul, Atman, alone in the form of a person. Looking around, he saw nothing else than himself. He said first, I am. He was, indeed, as large as a woman and a man closely embraced. He caused that self to fall, pat, into two pieces. Therefrom arose a husband, Pati, and a wife, Patni. What is said here of the deity recalls Plato's original man. There, too, the hermaphroditic round stands at the beginning. This perfect state of being, in which the opposites are contained, is perfect because it is autarkic. Its self-sufficiency, self-contentment, and independence of any you and any other are signs of its self-contained eternality. We read in Plato, And he established the universe a sphere revolving in a circle, one and solitary yet by reason of its excellence able to bear itself company and needing no other friendship or acquaintance. The perfection of that which rests in itself in no way contradicts the perfection of that which circles in itself. Although absolute rest is something static and eternal, unchanging and therefore without history, it is at the same time the place of origin and the germ cell of creativity. Living the cycle of its own life, it is the circular snake, the primal dragon of the beginning that bites its own tail, the self-begetting Ouroboros. This is the ancient Egyptian symbol of which it is said, Draco interfecet se ipsum, maritat se ipsum, impregnat se ipsum. It slays, weds, and impregnates itself. It is man and woman begetting and conceiving, devouring and giving birth, active and passive, above and below, at once. As the heavenly serpent, the Ouroboros was known in ancient Babylon. In later times, in the same area, it was often depicted by the Mandaeans. Its origin is ascribed by Macrobius to the Phoenicians. It is the archetype of the Hentopan, the All-One, appearing as Leviathan and as Ion, as Oceanus, and also as the primal being that says, I am Alpha and Omega. As the Neph of antiquity, it is the primal snake, the most ancient deity of the prehistoric world. The Ouroboros can be traced in the Revelation of St. John, and among the Gnostics, as well as among the Roman syncretists. There are pictures of it in the sand paintings of the Navajo Indians, and in Giotto. It is found in Egypt, Africa, Mexico, and India, among the gypsies as an amulet, and in the alchemical texts. The symbolic thinking portrayed in these images of the round endeavors to grasp contents which even our present-day consciousness can only understand as paradoxes, precisely because it cannot grasp them. If we give the name of all or nothing to the beginning and speak in this connection of wholeness, unity, non-differentiation, and the absence of opposites, all these concepts, if we look at them more closely and try to conceive them, instead of just going on thinking them, are found to be images derived and abstracted from these basic symbols. Images and symbols have this advantage over the paradoxical philosophical formulations of infinite unity and unimaged wholeness, that their unity can be seen and grasped as a unity at one glance. More, all these symbols with which men have sought to grasp the beginning in mythological terms 
are as alive today as they ever were. They have their place not only in art and religion, but in the living processes of the individual psyche, in dreams and in fantasies. And so long as man shall exist, perfection will continue to appear as the circle, the sphere, and the round. And the primal deity who is sufficient unto himself, and the self who has gone beyond the opposites, will reappear in the image of the round, the mandala. This round, and this existence in the round, existence in the Ouroboros, is the symbolic self-representation of the dawn state, showing the infancy both of mankind and of the child. The validity and reality of the Ouroboros symbol rest on a collective basis. It corresponds to an evolutionary stage, which can be recollected in the psychic structure of every human being. It functions as a transpersonal factor that was there as a psychic stage of being before the formation of an ego. Moreover, its reality is re-experienced in every early childhood, and the child's personal experience of this pre-ego stage retraces the old track trodden by humanity. An embryonic and still undeveloped germ of ego consciousness slumbers in the perfect round and awakens. It is immaterial whether we are dealing with a self-representation of this psychic stage, manifesting itself as a symbol, or whether a later ego describes this preliminary stage as its own past. Since the ego has and can have no experiences of its own in the embryonic state, not even psychic experiences, for its experiencing consciousness still slumbers in the germ, the later ego will describe this earlier state, of which it has indefinite but symbolically graspable knowledge, as a prenatal time. It is a time of existence in paradise, where the psyche has her pre-worldly abode, the time before the birth of the ego, the time of unconscious envelopment, of swimming in the ocean of the unborn. The time of the beginning before the coming of the opposites, must be understood as the self-description of that great epoch when there was still no consciousness. It is the Wu Qi of Chinese philosophy, whose symbol is the empty circle. Everything is still in the now and forever of eternal being. Sun, moon, and stars, these symbols of time and therefore of mortality, have not yet been created and day and night, yesterday and tomorrow, genesis and decay, the flux of life and birth and death, have not yet entered into the world. This prehistoric state of being is not time, but eternity, just as a time before the coming of man and before birth and begetting is eternity. And just as there is no time before the birth of man and ego, only eternity, so there is no space only infinity. The question whence, which is both the original question and the question about the origin, has but one answer, and of this there are two interpretations. The answer is the round, and the two interpretations the womb and the parents. It is crucial for every psychology, and especially for every psychology of childhood, to understand this problem and its symbolism. The Ouroboros appears as the round container, that is to say, the maternal womb, but also as the union of masculine and feminine opposites, the world parents joined in perpetual cohabitation. Although it seems quite natural that the original question should be connected with the problem of the world parents, we must realize at once that we are dealing with symbols of origination and not with sexuality or a genital theory. The problem around which mythological statements revolve, and which was from the very beginning the crucial question for man, is really concerned with the origins of life, of the spirit and the soul. This is not to say that early man was something of a philosopher. Abstract questions of this kind were wholly alien to his consciousness. Mythology, however, is the product of the collective unconscious, 
and anyone acquainted with primitive psychology must stand amazed at the unconscious wisdom which rises up from the depths of the human psyche in answer to these unconscious questions. The unconscious knowledge of the background of life and of man's dealing with it is laid down in ritual and myth. These are the answers of what he calls the human soul and the human mind to questions which were very much alive for him, even though no ego consciousness had consciously asked them. Many primitive peoples do not recognize the connection between sexual intercourse and birth. Whereas among primitive sexual intercourse often begins in childhood, but does not lead to the begetting of children, it is natural to conclude that the birth of the child has nothing to do with impregnation by a man in the sexual act. The question about the origin, however, must always be answered by womb, for it is the immemorial experience of mankind that every newborn creature comes from a womb. Hence, the round of mythology is also called the womb and uterus, though this place of origin should not be taken concretely. In fact, all mythology says over and over again that this womb is an image, the woman's womb being only a partial aspect of the primordial symbol of the place of origin from whence we come. This primordial symbol means many things at once. It is not just one content or part of the body, but a plurality, a world or cosmic region where many contents hide and have their essential abode. The mothers are not a mother. Anything deep, abyss, valley, ground, also the sea and the bottom of the sea, fountains, lakes and pools, the earth, the underworld, the cave, the house and the city, are all parts of this archetype. Anything big and embracing, which contains, surrounds, and wraps, shelters, preserves, and nourishes anything small, belongs to the primordial matriarchal realm. When Freud saw that everything hollow was feminine, he would have been right if only he had grasped it as a symbol. By interpreting it as the female genitalia, he profoundly misunderstood it, because female genitalia are only a tiny part of the archetype of the primordial mother. Compared with this maternal Ouroboros, human consciousness feels itself embryonic, for the ego feels fully contained in this primordial symbol. It is only a tiny, helpless newcomer. In the pleuromatic phase of life, when the ego swims about in the round like a tadpole, there is nothing but the Ouroboros in existence. Humanity does not yet exist. There is only divinity. Only the world has being. Naturally, then, the first phases of man's evolving ego consciousness are under the dominance of the Ouroboros. They are the phases of an infantile ego consciousness which, although no longer entirely embryonic and already possessing an existence of its own, still lives in the round not yet detached from it, and only just beginning to differentiate itself from it. This initial stage, when ego consciousness is still on the infantile level, is marked by the predominance of the maternal side of the Ouroboros. The world is experienced as all-embracing, and in it man experiences himself as a self, sporadically and momentarily only. Just as the infantile ego, living this phase over again, feebly developed, easily tired, emerges like an island out of the ocean of the unconscious for occasional moments only, and then sinks back again, so early man experiences the world. Small, feeble, and much given to sleep, that is to say, for the most part unconscious, he swims about in his instincts like an animal and folded and upborne by great mother nature, rocked in her arms, he is delivered over to her for good or ill. Nothing is himself. Everything is world. The world shelters and nourishes him, while he scarcely wills and acts at all. Doing nothing, lying inert in the unconscious, merely being there in the inexhaustible twilight world, all needs effortlessly supplied by the great nourisher, 
Such is that early beatific state. All the positive maternal traits are in evidence at this stage, when the ego is still embryonic and has no activity of its own. The Ouroboros of the maternal world is life and psyche in one. It gives nourishment and pleasure, protects and warms, comforts and forgives. It is the refuge for all suffering, the goal of all desire. For always, this mother is she who fulfills, the bestower and helper. This living image of the great and good mother has at all times of distress been the refuge of humanity and ever shall be. For the state of being contained in the whole, without responsibility or effort, with no doubts and no division of the world into two, is paradisal and can never again be realized in its pristine, happy-go-luckiness in adult life. The positive side of the Great Mother seems to be embodied in this stage of the Ouroboros. Only at a very much higher level will the good mother appear again. Then, when she no longer has to do with an embryonic ego, but with an adult personality matured by rich experience of the world, she reveals herself anew as Sophia, the gracious mother, or pouring forth her riches and the creative fullness of true productivity, as the mother of all living. The dawn state of perfect containment and contentment was never an historical state. Rousseau was still projecting this psychic phase into the historical past as the natural state of the savage. It is rather the image of a psychic stage of humanity, just discernible as borderline image. However much the world forced early man to face reality, it was with the greatest reluctance that he consciously entered into this reality. Even today we can see from primitives that the law of gravity, the inertia of the psyche, the desire to remain unconscious, is a fundamental human trait. Yet even this is a false formulation, since it starts from consciousness as though that were the natural and self-evident thing. But fixation in unconsciousness the downward drag of its specific gravity cannot be called a desire to remain unconscious. On the contrary, that is the natural thing. There is, as a counteracting force, the desire to become conscious, a veritable instinct impelling man in this direction. One has no need to desire to remain unconscious. One is primarily unconscious and can at most conquer the original situation in which man drowses in the world drowses in the unconscious, contained in the infinite like a fish in the environing sea. The ascent towards consciousness is the unnatural thing in nature. It is specific of the species man, who on that account has justly styled himself Homo sapiens. The struggle between the specifically human and the universally natural constitutes the history of man's conscious development. So long as the infantile ego consciousness is weak and feels the strain of its own existence as heavy and oppressive, while drowsiness and sleep are felt as delicious pleasure, it has not yet discovered its own reality and differentness. So long as this continues, the Ouroboros reigns on as the great whirling wheel of life where everything not yet individual is submerged in the union of opposites, passing away and willing to pass away. Man is not yet thrown back upon himself against nature, nor the ego against the unconscious. Being oneself is still a wearisome and painful experience, still the exception that has to be overcome. It is in this sense that we speak of uroboric incest. It goes without saying that the term incest is to be understood symbolically, not concretistically and sexually. Wherever the incest motive appears, it is always a prefiguration of the Yeros Gamos, of the sacred marriage consummation which attains its true form only with a hero. Uroboric incest is a form of entry into the mother, of union with her, and it stands in sharp contrast to other and later forms of incest. In Uroboric incest, the emphasis upon pleasure and love is in no sense active 
It is more a desire to be dissolved and absorbed. Passively, one lets oneself be taken, sinks into the pleroma, melts away in the ocean of pleasure, a Liebestod. The great mother takes the little child back into herself, and always over uroboric incest there stand the insignia of death, signifying final dissolution and union with the mother. Cave, earth, tomb, sarcophagus, and coffin are symbols of this ritual recombination, which begins with burial in the posture of the embryo in the barrows of the Stone Age and ends with the cinerary urns of the moderns. Many forms of nostalgia and longing signify no more than a return to uroboric incest and self-dissolution, from the unio mystica of the saint to the drunkard's craving for unconsciousness and the death romanticism of the Germanic races. The incest we term uroboric is self-surrender and regression. It is the form of incest taken by the infantile ego, which is still close to the mother and has not yet come to itself. But the sick ego of the neurotic can also take this form, and so can a later exhausted ego that creeps back to the mother after having found fulfillment. Notwithstanding its own dissolution and the deadly aspect of the Ouroboros, the embryonic ego does not experience Ouroboric incest as anything hostile, even though it be annihilated. The return to the great round is a happening full of passive, childlike confidence, for the infantile ego consciousness always feels its reawakening after having been immersed in death as a rebirth. It feels protected by the maternal depths even when the ego has disappeared and there is no consciousness of itself. Man's consciousness rightly feels itself to be the child of these primordial depths. For not only in the history of mankind is consciousness a late product of the womb of the unconscious, but in every individual life consciousness re-experiences its emergence from the unconscious in the growth of childhood. And every night in sleep, dying with the sun, it sinks back into the depths of the unconscious to be reborn in the morning and to begin the day anew. The Ouroboros, the great round, is not only the womb, but the world parents. The world father is joined to the world mother in Ouroboric union, and they are not to be divided. They are still under the rule of the primordial law, Above and below, father and mother, heaven and earth, God and world, reflect one another and cannot be put apart. How could the conjunction of opposites, as the initial state of existence, ever be represented mythologically except by the symbol of the conjoined world parents? Thus, the world parents, who are the answer to the question about the origin, are themselves the universe and the prime symbol of everlasting life. They are the perfection from whence everything springs, the eternal being that begets, conceives, and brings itself to birth, that kills and revivifies. Their unity is a state of existence transcendent and divine, independent of the opposites, the inchoate ensof of the Kabbalah, which means unending plenitude and nothingness. The tremendous force of this primordial symbol of the psyche does not lie only in the fact that it contains in itself the non-differentiated state of union beyond the opposites. The Ouroboros also symbolizes the creative impulse of the new beginning. It is the wheel that rolls of itself, the initial rotatory movement in the upward spiral of evolution. This initial movement, the procreative thrust, naturally has an affinity with the paternal side of the Ouroboros and with the beginning of evolution in time, and is far harder to visualize than the maternal side. For instance, when we read in Egyptian theology such passages as Atum, who indulged himself in Heliopolis, took his phallus in his hand in order to arouse pleasure. A brother and sister were produced, Shu and Tefnut. Or, I copulated in my hand, I joined myself to my shadow, 
and spurted out of my own mouth. I spewed forth as Shu and spat forth as Tefnut. This clearly expresses the difficulty of grasping the creative beginning in a symbol. What is meant would nowadays be called spontaneous generation, or the self-manifestation of a god. The original force of the images still shines through our rather more abstract terms. The Ouroboric mode of propagation, where begetter and conceiver are one, results in the image of immediate genesis from the semen without partner and without duality. To call such images obscene is to be guilty of a profound misunderstanding. Actually, life in those times was far more disciplined sexually, far purer than in most of the later cultures. The sexual symbolism that appears in primitive cult and ritual has a sacral and transpersonal import, as everywhere in mythology. It symbolizes the creative element, not personal genitality. It is only personalistic misunderstanding that makes these sacral contents obscene. Judaism and Christianity between them, and this includes Freud, have had a heavy and disastrous hand in this misunderstanding. The desecration of pagan values and the struggle for monotheism and for a conscious ethic was necessary and historically in advance, but it resulted in a complete distortion of the primordial world of those times. The effect of secondary personalization in the struggle against paganism was to reduce the transpersonal to the personal. Sanctity became sodomy. Worship became fornication, and so on. An age whose eyes are once more open to the transpersonal must reverse this process. Later creation symbols show how these matters came to be better formulated. Not that any repression had crept in. What was to be expressed had from the very outset no sexual connotations. It was meant symbolically. But the efforts with which early man wrestled for words give us some indication of what it was all about. The image of the self-fecundating primal god undergoes new variations in Egypt and India, and in both cases there is a move in the direction of spiritualization. But this spiritualization is the same as the endeavor to apprehend the nature of the creative force that was there in the beginning. It is the heart which makes all that results to come out, and it is the tongue which repeats, expresses, the thought of the heart. That is what causes all the gods to be born. Atum with his Aeneid, and every divine utterance manifests itself in the thought of the heart and the speech of the tongue. Or, the demiurge who created all the gods and their castes is in his heart and in his tongue. And finally, we come to the most abstract and spiritual symbolism of all, where God is the breath of life. He did not bring me forth from his mouth, nor conceive me in his hand, but he breathed me forth from his nostrils. The transition from image to idea in this formulation of the creative principle becomes doubly clear when one knows that in the hieroglyphs thought is written with the image for heart and speech with that for tongue. At this point in Egyptian mythology and its wrestlings with the problem of creation, we have the first beginnings of what was to be expressed several thousand years later as the Word of God in the Bible story of the creation and in the doctrine of the Logos, an expression that was never able to break away altogether from the primordial image of the self-manifesting and self-expressing God. Understandably enough, the creative principle that brings the world into being is derived from the creative nature of man himself. Just as a man, our figures of speech say the same thing today, brings forth his creations from his own depths and expresses himself. So do the gods. In like manner, Vishnu the boar scoops the earth out of the sea, and the god ponders the world in his heart and expresses it in the creative word. The word, speech, is a higher product, the utterance of one sunk in himself, in his own depths, when we talk of introversion, 
we say the same thing. In India, tapas, inward heat, and brooding is the creative force with whose help everything is made. The self-incubating effect of introversion, a fundamental experience of the self-generating spirit, is clearly expressed in the following text. He, Prajapati, took to praying and fasting because he desired offspring, and he made himself fruitful. An Egyptian text says, My name was He Who Created Himself, First God of First Gods. The same principle of heating is described in another Brahmana as the way of creation. In the beginning this world was nothing at all. Heaven was not, nor earth, nor space. Because it was not, it bethought itself, I will be. It emitted heat. After describing a long series of cosmogonic heatings and the production of elements, the text goes on, He found foothold on the earth. When he had found a firm foothold there, he thought, I will propagate myself. He emitted heat and became pregnant. Just as the maternal side of the Ouroboros gives birth without procreation, so the paternal side procreates without the maternal womb. The two sides are complementary and belong together. The original question asks about the origin of that which moves all life. To this question, the creation myths give one answer. They say that creation is something not altogether expressible in the symbols of sexuality, and they proceed to formulate the unformulable in an image. A creative word, creative breath, that is, creative spirit. But this breath concept is only an abstraction from the image of the procreative wind, rauch, pneuma, animus, which animates through inspiration. The solar phallus, symbolizing the creative element, is the source of the wind, both in an Egyptian magic papyrus and in the vision of a modern psychotic. This wind, in the form of the rauch dove of the Holy Ghost, is wafted under the robe of the immaculately conceiving Virgin Mary through a tube held out to her by God the Father in the sun. The wind is the fructifying bird known to the primitives, the ancestral spirit that blows upon the women, and also upon tortoises and female vultures, and makes them fruitful. Animals as fructifiers, gods as fructifiers, gods as animals, animals as gods, everywhere the enigma of fructification is ranged alongside that of creative inspiration. Mankind asks about the origin of life, and immediately life and soul fuse into one, as living psyche, power, spirit, motion, breath, and the life-giving mana. This one who stands at the beginning is the creative force contained in the uroboric unity of the world parents, from whom it blows, begets, gives birth, moves, breathes, and speaks. As the wind blows, everything grows, says the Upanishad. Although the ego experiences, and must experience, the Ouroboros as a terrible dark power of the unconscious, mankind does not by any means associate this stage of its pre-conscious existence only with feelings of dread and drowsiness. Even if, for the conscious ego, light and consciousness cleave together, like darkness and unconsciousness, man still has inklings of another and, so he thinks, a deeper extra-worldly knowledge. In mythology, this illumination is usually projected into a knowledge acquired before birth or after death. In the Bardo Total, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the dead man receives instruction and the instruction culminates in the doctrine that he shall know himself identical with the great white light that shines beyond life and death. Thine own consciousness, shining, void, and inseparable from the great body of radiance, hath no birth nor death, and is the immutable light, Buddha Amitabha. This knowledge is post-conscious, outside and not of this world a knowing and being in the perfection that comes after death. But it is also pre-conscious, pre-worldly, and pre-natal. This is what the Jewish Midrash means 
when it ascribes knowledge to the unborn babe in the womb, saying that over its head there burns a light in which it sees all the ends of the world. Also, existence in the time before the beginning is supposedly connected with foreknowledge. The creature that still exists in the round participates in the knowledge of the unformed, is merged in the ocean of wisdom. The primal ocean, likewise an origination symbol, for, as a ring snake, the Ouroboros is also the ocean, is the source not only of creation, but of wisdom, too. Hence the early culture heroes often come up from the sea in the shape of a half-fish, like the Babylonian Oannes, and bring their wisdom as a revelation to mankind. Since the original wisdom is pre-worldly, that is to say, prior to the ego and the coming of consciousness, the myths say it is prenatal. But existence after death and prenatal existence in the Ouroboros are the same thing. The ring of life and death is a closed circuit. It is the wheel of rebirth, and the dead man instructed in the bardo total will infallibly be born again if he fails to attain to the highest knowledge in his afterlife. So for him, the instruction after death is equally a prenatal one. The mythological theory of foreknowledge also explains the view that all-knowing is memory. Man's task in the world is to remember with his conscious mind what was knowledge before the advent of consciousness. In this sense, it is said of the Sadiq, the perfect righteous man of Hasidism, the mystical Jewish movement dating from the end of the 18th century, the Sadiq finds that which has been lost since birth and restores it to men. It is the same conception as Plato's philosophical doctrine of the prenatal vision of ideas and their remembrance. The original knowledge of one who is still enfolded in the perfect state is very evident in the psychology of the child. For this reason, many primitive peoples treat children with particular marks of respect. In the child, the great images and archetypes of the collective unconscious are living reality and very close to him. Indeed, many of his sayings and reactions, questions and answers, dreams and images express this knowledge which still derives from his prenatal existence. It is transpersonal experience not personally acquired, a possession acquired from over there. Such knowledge is rightly regarded as ancestral knowledge and the child as a reborn forebear. The theory of heredity proving that the child has the ancestral heritage biologically in himself, and to a large extent actually is this heritage, also has a psychological justification. Jung, therefore, defines the transpersonal, or the archetypes and instincts of the collective unconscious, as the deposit of ancestral experience. Hence, the child, whose life as a pre-personal entity is largely determined by the collective unconscious, actually is the living carrier of this ancestral experience. In the dawn world of consciousness, where the feebly developed ego is still under the dominance of the unconscious, there rules, beside the symbolism whose mythological stages we are trying to describe, another set of symbols— which correspond to the magic body image in the psyche. Certain groups of symbols are coordinated with certain regions of the body. Even today, the primitive body scheme of belly, breast, and head is used in ordinary psychology, where belly is an abbreviation for the instinctual world, breast and heart for the zone of feeling, and head and brain for the zone of spirit. Modern psychology and language have been influenced to this day by this original body scheme. The scheme is most developed in Indian psychology. In Kundalini Yoga, the ascending consciousness rouses and activates the different body-soul centers. The diaphragm is supposed to correspond to the Earth's surface, and development beyond this zone is coordinated with the rising sun, the state of consciousness that has begun to leave behind the unconscious and all ties with it. The body scheme, as the archetype of the original man in whose image the world was created, is the basic symbol in all systems where parts of the world are coordinated with regions of the body. 
This coordination is to be found everywhere, in Egypt as in Mexico, in Indian literature as in the Kabbalah. Not God alone, but the whole world is created in man's image. The relation of the world and the gods to the body scheme is the earliest concretistic form of the anthropocentric world picture, with man standing in the middle or at the heart of the world. It derives from one's own body sensations, which are charged with mana and are commonly misunderstood as narcissistic. The mana charge, originally associated with everything that belongs to the body, is expressed in primitive man's fear of magical influences due to the fact that every part of the body, from hair to excrement, can stand for the body as a whole and bewitch it. Also, the symbolism of the creation myths, where everything that comes out of the body is creative, derives from the latter's mana potency. Not only the semen, but urine and spittle, sweat, dung and breath, words and flatus, are heavy with creation. Out of it all comes the world and the whole turnout is birth. For primitive man and the child, with his overemphasized unconscious, the main accent falls on the visceral region and its dead weight of vegetative life. The heart is for him the highest center, representing what the thinking head means for us. For the Greeks, the midriff was the seat of consciousness. For the Indians and Hebrews, the heart. In both cases, Thinking is emotional, bound up with effects and passions. The dissolution of emotional components is not yet complete. See Part 2. Only if a thought is a passion that grips the heart can it reach ego consciousness and be perceived. Consciousness is only affected by the proximity of the idea to the archetype. But the heart is also the seat of ethical decision. It symbolizes the center of the personality, and in the Egyptian judgment of the dead, it was weighed. The heart plays the same role in Jewish mysticism, and even today we still speak of a man having a good heart, as though it were an ethical organ. Anything situated lower down than the heart belongs to the realm of instinct. The liver and the kidneys are visceral centers of great importance for psychic life. God trieth the heart and reigns of the man whose conscious and unconscious are to be searched, and the examination of the liver as a divinatory center in haruspicy is as well known as the fate of Prometheus, who for the theft of fire and the hybristic overextension of his consciousness was punished with the aginbite of Inuit by Zeus, who sent an eagle to feed upon his liver. But all visceral centers, which also function as effective centers controlling sexuality, are already centers of a higher order. Deeper down lies the psychic plane of intestinal processes of the alimentary tract. The instinct to eat, hunger, is one of the most elementary of man's psychic instincts, and the psychology of the belly plays a correspondingly large part with primitives and children. One's state of mind is the more dependent upon whether one is satisfied or not, or thirsty or not the less one's consciousness and one's ego are developed. For the embryonic ego, the nutritional side is the only important factor, and this fear is still very strongly accentuated for the infantile ego, which regards the maternal Ouroboros as the source of food and satisfaction. The Ouroboros is properly called the tail-eater, and the symbol of the alimentary canal dominates this whole stage. The swamp stage of the Ouroboros and early matriarchate, as described by Bakhoffen, is a world in which every creature devours every other. Cannibalism is symptomatic of this state of affairs. On this level, which is pregenital because sex is not yet operative and the polar tension of the sex is still in abeyance, there is only a stronger that eats and a weaker that is eaten. In this animal world, since rutting is relatively rare, the visceral psychology of hunger occupies the foreground. Hunger and food are the prime movers of mankind. Everywhere we find in the initial creation myths a pre-genital food symbolism, transpersonal, 
because sprung from the original collective layer of symbols. The systole and diastole of human existence center on the functions of the digestive tract. Eating equals intake, birth equals output, food the only content, being nourished the fundamental form of vegetative animal existence. That is the motto. Life equals power equals food. The earliest formula for obtaining power over anything appears in the oldest of the pyramid texts. They say of the risen dead, The sky clouds over, the stars rain down, the mountains stir themselves, the cattle of the earth god tremble at the sight of him as he appears before them with the living soul of a god who lives upon his fathers and devours his mothers. It is he who devours men and lives upon the gods, the catcher of skulls. He catches them for him. He of the resplendent head watches them for him and drives them to him. Their great ones are for his breakfast, their lesser ones for his dinner, and their little ones for his supper. Whomsoever he meets on his ways, he eats raw. He has taken away the hearts of the gods. He has eaten the red crown and swallowed the green crown. He eats the lungs of wise men. He is content to live upon hearts and their magic. He rejoices if he can devour those who are in the red crown. He flourishes, and their magic is in his body, and his glory is not taken from him. He has devoured the understanding of all the gods. We find a corresponding symbolism in India. In one account of the creation, the first divinities fall headlong into the sea, and hunger and thirst are delivered up to the negative powers of the primeval waters. The account continues, Hunger and thirst said to him, the self, For us two also find an abode. To them he said, I assign you two a part among these divinities. I make you two partakers among them. Therefore to whatever divinity an oblation is made, hunger and thirst become partakers in it. He bethought himself, Here now are worlds and world guardians. Let me create food for them. He brooded upon the waters, and out of them that were brooded upon there arose a form. The form that arose is food. Food becomes a cosmic content to be seized hold of, and when the self finally managed to seize it with apana, the digestive breath, he consumed it. In another passage, hunger is symbolized as death. He is the eater and devourer, as we know from the deadly and devouring aspect of the Ouroboros. Even today, language cannot get away from these elementary images. Eating, devouring, hunger, death, and maw go together. And we still speak, just like the primitive, of death's maw, a devouring war, a consuming disease, being swallowed and eaten is an archetype that occurs not only in all the medieval paintings of hell and the devil. We ourselves express the swallowing of something small by something big in the same imagery, when we say that a man is consumed by his work, by a movement or an idea, or eaten up with jealousy. On this level, where the Ouroboros is coordinated with cosmogony, the world or cosmic content to be assimilated is food, Food is a phase of Brahma. From food all creatures are produced, all creatures that dwell on earth. By food they live, and into food they finally pass. Food is the chief among things. Therefore they call it the panacea. Verily he obtains all food who worships Brahma as food. For food is the chief among beings. Therefore they call it the panacea. All creatures are born of food. By food they continue to grow. Creatures feed on it, it upon creatures. Therefore it is called food. Brahma arises through tapas. From Brahma comes food. From food, breath, spirit, truth, worlds, and, in works, immortality. The same symbolism is used in the Maitriana Upanishad where the relation between the world and God 
is equivalent to that between food and the eater of food. God, once glorified as a world nourisher, is now seen as the world devourer, for the world is God's sacrificial food. Just as in primitive psychology and mythology, the alimentary Ouroboros is a cosmic quantity, so its symbolism also appears in the relatively late philosophical speculations of India for the purpose of clarifying the relations between God as subject and world as object and vice versa. In this connection, we must mention the sacrifice that is offered to the god in the form of food and eaten by him. It is at once an act of incorporation or inward digestion and of seizure for increase of power. So the world in India is the food of the gods. As Dyson has explained, the world, according to an early Vedic idea, was created by Prajapati who was at once life and death, or hunger. It was created in order to be eaten as the sacrifice which he himself offers to himself. This is how the horse sacrifice is interpreted, the horse standing for the universe like the bull in other cultures. Whatever he brought forth, he resolved to eat, because he eats ad everything. He is called infinite, aditi. Therefore, he who knows the essence of Aditi becomes the eater of the world. Everything becomes food for him. From this it is clear that at a later age, correctly interpreting the old symbolism has spiritualized it or inwardly digested it. For the act of eating, digesting, and assimilating the world now appears as a means to possess and obtain power over it. To know the essence of Aditi, is to experience the infinite being of the Creator who eats the world He has created. Thus, on the primitive level, conscious realization is called eating. When we talk of the conscious mind assimilating an unconscious content, we are not saying much more than is implied in the symbol of eating and digesting. The examples from Indian and Egyptian mythology could be multiplied at will for this sort of elementary food symbolism is archetypal. Wherever liquor, fruit, herbs, etc. appear as the vehicles of life and immortality, including the water and bread of life, the sacrament of the host, and every form of food cult down to the present day, we have this ancient mode of human expression before us. The materialization of psychic contents, by which contents that we would call psychic, like life, immortality, and death, take on material form in myth and ritual and appear as water, bread, fruit, etc., is a characteristic of the primitive mind. Inside is projected outside, as we say. In reality, there is a psychization of the object. Everything outside us is experienced symbolically, as though saturated with a content which we coordinate with the psyche as something psychic or spiritual. This material object outside is then assimilated, that is to say, eaten. Conscious realization is acted out in the elementary scheme of nutritive assimilation, and the ritual act of concrete eating is the first form of assimilation known to man. Over this whole sphere of symbolism, looms the maternal Ouroboros in its mother-child aspect, where need is hunger and satisfaction means satiety. The body and its autoerotic narcissistic sense of itself, we shall be reviewing this idea later on, is an Ouroboric closed circuit. In this pregenital stage, self-gratification is not masturbation, but the satisfaction of being nourished with the infant's finger-sucking as a substitute. To obtain is to eat. It does not mean to be fertilized. To produce, to express, means to excrete, spit, urinate, later to speak, but not to give birth or beget. The masturbatory stage of Ouroboric creation is, on the other hand, genital in character, and precedes the sexual stage of the world parents, which is the stage of propagation and duality, and both are preceded by the stage of the alimentary Ouroboros. All the above bodily functions, 
symbolize something that is at the same time a psychic process. The rites of cannibalism and the funeral feast, the eating of gods in the pyramid texts, and the communion mysteries represent a spiritual act. The assimilation and ingestion of the content, the eaten food, produces an inner change. Transformation of the body cells through food intake is the most elementary of animal changes experienced by man. How a weary and feebled and famished man can turn into an alert, strong, and satisfied being, or a man perishing of thirst can be refreshed or even transformed by an intoxicating drink, this is and must remain a fundamental experience as long as man shall exist. The emergence of corresponding symbolisms does not mean regression to the oral zone in the sense that this is an infantile perverse zone of sexual pleasure which we ought to overcome, but simply a return to Uroboric symbolism, positively accented by the unconscious. Being fertilized by eating does not imply ignorance of the sexual act, nor is it in any sense an unenlightened substitute. It means total assimilation rather than union with. It is something different from the above-mentioned fertilization by the wind. In eating, the accent falls on the bodily intake, but in the latter case, on the invisibility of the animating and fertilizing agent. Accordingly, at the stage of the maternal alimentary Ouroboros, the breasts are always emphasized, as, for instance, in the mythological pictures of the many-breasted Great Mother or in the innumerable statues of the goddess who presses her breasts. Here the nourishing great mother is more generative than parturient. Breast and lactic flow are generative elements, which can also appear in phallic form, because the milk is then understood symbolically as a fertilizing agent. The milk-giving mother, whose commonest symbol is the cow, is procreative, and on that account may even have a paternal character. Her child, as something she fertilizes, is then receptive and feminine, regardless of its sex. The maternal Ouroboros is still hermaphroditic and presexual, like the child. So the mother propagates by nourishing, just as the child is fertilized by eating and gives birth by evacuating. For both of them, the nutrient flow is a symbol of life without polar tension and entirely unsexual. The accentuation of the mother's breast and its phallic character, however, already forms the transition stage. The original situation is one of complete containment in the Ouroboros. When the phallic character of the breast emerges, or the mother is seen as the phallus bearer, it is a sign that the infantile subject is beginning to differentiate himself. Active and passive strivings gradually become distinct, the opposites making their appearance. Conceiving by eating and giving birth by excreting are differentiated as separate acts within the nutrient flow, and the ego begins to distinguish itself from the Ouroboros. This means the end of that beatific Ouroboric state of autarky, perfection, and absolute self-sufficiency. So long as the ego was swimming in the belly of the Ouroboros, a mere ego germ, it shared in that paradisal perfection. This autarky holds absolute sway in the womb, where unconscious existence is combined with absence of suffering. Everything is supplied of its own accord. There is no need of the slightest exertion, not even an instinctive reaction, let alone a regulating ego consciousness. One's own being and the surrounding world, in this case the mother's body, exist in a participation mystique, never more to be attained in any environmental relationship. This state of egolessness, interrupted by no-pleasure-pain reactions, is naturally experienced by the later ego consciousness as one of the most perfect forms of autarky, bringing utter contentment. Plato describes the formation of the world in words that recall this containment within the Ouroboros. It had no need of eyes, for there was nothing outside it to be seen, nor of ears, for there was nothing outside it to be heard. 
There was no surrounding air to be breathed, nor was it in need of any organ by which to supply itself with food or to get rid of it when digested. Nothing went out from or came into it anywhere, for there was nothing. Of design it was made thus, its own waste providing its own food, acting and being acted upon entirely within and by itself because its designer considered that a being which was sufficient unto itself would be far more excellent than one which depended upon anything. Once more we meet the Ouroboric cycle of self-propagation on the alimentary level. Just as the Ouroboros fertilizes itself in the mouth by eating its own tail, so its own waste provides its own food an ever-recurrent symbol of autonomy and self-sufficiency. This primordial image of the autarchic Ouroboros underlies the homunculus of alchemy, who is begotten in the round, the retort, by rotation of the elements, and it even underlies the perpetuum mobile of physics. We shall have to concern ourselves with the problem of autarchy at all stages of our inquiry because it is bound up with an important trend in man's development, namely, with the problem of his self-formation. So far, we have distinguished three stages of Ouroboric autarchy. The first is the pleuromatic stage of paradisal perfection in the unborn, the embryonic stage of the ego, which a later consciousness will contrast with the sufferings of the non-autarchic ego in the world. The second stage is that of the alimentary Ouroboros, a closed circuit whose own waste provides its own food. The third, genital masturbatory phase, is that of Atum, copulating in his own hand. All these images, like the self-incubation of one made pregnant through tapas, a later spiritual form of autarky, are images of the self-contained creative principle. Uroboric autarchy, even when it appears as a dominant archetype, must not be reduced to the level of autoeroticism and narcissism. Both these conceptions are only valid in cases of misdevelopment, when the evolutionary stage ruled by the Uroboros persists for an unnaturally long time. But even then, the positive aspect must be borne in mind. Autarchy is just as necessary a goal of life and development as is adaptation. Self-development, self-differentiation, and self-formation are trends of the libido no less legitimate than the extroverted relation to the object and the introverted relation to the subject. The negative evaluation implied by the terms autoeroticism, autism, and narcissism is only justified in pathological cases where there are deviations from this natural basic attitude. For the development of the ego, of consciousness, of personality, and lastly of individuality itself, is actually fostered by the autarchy whose symbol is the Ouroboros. In many cases, therefore, the appearance of Ouroboric symbolism, especially if its formative and stabilizing character is strongly marked, as, for instance, in the mandala, indicates that the ego is moving toward the self rather than in the direction of objective adaptation. Detachment from the Ouroboros, entry into the world, and the encounter with the universal principle of opposites are the essential tasks of human and individual development. The process of coming to terms with the objects of the outer and inner worlds, of adapting to the collective life of mankind both within and without, governs with varying degrees of intensity the life of every individual. For the extrovert, the accent lies on the objects outside, people, things, and circumstances. For the introvert, it lies on the objects inside, the complexes and archetypes. Even the introvert's development, which relates mainly to the psychic background, is in this sense bound to the object, despite the fact that the objects lie inside him and not outside being psychic forces rather than social, economic, or physical ones. But besides this trend of development, there is another equally legitimate, which is self-related or centroverted, 
and which makes for the development of personality and for individual realization. This development may derive its contents from outside and inside equally, and is fed by introversion as much as by extroversion. Its center of gravity, however, lies not in objects and objective dealings, irrespective of whether the objects be external or internal, but in self-formation. That is to say, in the building up and filling out of a personality which, as the nucleus of all life's activities, uses the objects of the inner and outer worlds as building material for its own wholeness. This wholeness is an end in itself, autarkic. It is quite independent of any utility value it may have either for the collective outside or for the psychic powers inside. That we are nevertheless concerned here with a creative principle of decisive importance for civilization will be shown in its proper place. Self-formation, whose effects in the second half of life Jung has termed individuation, has its critical developmental pattern not only in the first half of life, but also back in childhood. The growth of consciousness and of the ego is largely governed by this pattern. The stability of the ego, that is to say, its ability to stand firm against the disintegrative tendencies of the unconscious and the world, is developed very early, as is also the trend toward extension of consciousness, which is likewise an important prerequisite for self-formation. Although in the first half of life, ego and consciousness are mainly preoccupied with adaptation, and the self-formative trend seems to be in abeyance, yet the beginnings of this self-realization process, while it only becomes noticeable with increasing maturity, lie far back in childhood. And it is here that the first struggles for self-formation are decided. The allegedly narcissistic, autistic, autoerotic, egocentric, and, as we saw, anthropocentric stage of the Ouroboros, so obvious in the child's autarkic and naive self-relatedness, is the precondition of all subsequent self-development. The same Ouroboric symbolism that stands at the beginning, before ego development starts, reappears at the end, when ego development is replaced by the development of the self, or individuation. When the universal principle of opposites no longer predominates, and devouring or being devoured by the world has ceased to be of prime importance, the Ouroboros symbol will reappear as the mandala in the psychology of the adult. The goal of life now is to make oneself independent of the world, to detach oneself from it and stand by oneself. The autarkic character of the Ouroboros appears as a positive symbol pointing in a new direction. Whereas the Ouroboric incest of the neurotic and his pleuromatic fixation denote an inability to break away from his origins and a refusal to be born into the world, the appearance of mandala and Ouroboros symbolism in the mature man is an indication that he must once more free himself from this world, for now he is fed up with it and come to himself. He has, by a new process, to bear himself out of this world, just as he had to bear himself into it with his nascent ego. Hence, the perfect figure of the Ouroboros, standing as it does at the center of the unconscious world of the primitive and the child, is simultaneously the central symbol of the second half of life and the nucleus of the developmental trend we have called self-formation or central version. The symbol of the circular mandala stands at the beginning as at the end. In the beginning, it takes the mythological form of paradise, in the end of the heavenly Jerusalem. The perfect figure of the circle from whose center radiate the four arms of a cross, in which the opposites are at rest, is a very early and a very late symbol historically. It is found in the sanctuaries of the Stone Age. It is the paradise where the four streams have their source, and in Canaanite mythology it is the central point where the great god El sits, 
at the source of the streams, in the midst of the sources of the two seas. The Ouroboros, traceable in all epochs and cultures, then appears as the latest symbol of individual psychic development, signifying the roundedness of the psyche, life's wholeness, and perfection regained. It is the place of transfiguration and illumination, of finality, as well as the place of mythological origination. Thus, the great round of the Ouroboros arches over man's life, encompassing his earliest childhood and receiving him again in altered form at the end. But in his own individual life, too, the pleroma of universal unity can be sought and found in religious experience. In mysticism, where the self-re-entrant figure of the Ouroboros appears as the ocean of Godhead, there is often a dissolution of the ego, an ecstatic surrender, which is equivalent to Ouroboric incest. But when, instead of the death ecstasy of the ego, the Stirb und Werde principle of rebirth predominates, and the theme of rebirth prevails over that of death, this is not a regression, but a creative process. Its relation to the Ouroboric stage will be fully discussed elsewhere, for the distinction between creative and pathological processes is of the utmost importance in all depth psychology. For both processes, the Ouroboros is appropriate as a symbol of origination. In creative phenomena, too, and not only in religious phenomena, the life-spanning figure of the round signifies the regenerative sea and the source of higher life. It is, however, this same figure whose clinging embrace prevents the neurotic from being born into life. Then it is no longer the primordial figure of the Ouroboros, but, in the case of a more developed ego, the indication that a further stage has been reached, namely the dominance of the Ouroboros over the ego or the stage of the Great Mother. Chapter 2 The Great Mother The Ego Under the Dominance of the Ouroboros When the ego begins to emerge from its identity with the Ouroboros and the embryonic connection with the womb ceases, the ego takes up a new attitude to the world. The individual's view of the world changes with every stage of his development, and the variation of archetypes and symbols, gods and myths, is the expression but also the instrument of this change. Detachment from the Ouroboros means being born and descending into the lower world of reality, full of dangers and discomforts. The nascent ego becomes aware of pleasure-pain qualities, and from them it experiences its own pleasure and pain. Consequently, the world becomes ambivalent. The unconscious life of nature, which is also the life of the Ouroboros, combines the most meaningless destruction with the supreme meaningfulness of instinctive creation, for the meaningful unity of the organism is as natural as the cancer which devours it. The same applies to the unity of life within the Ouroboros, which, like the swamp, begets, gives birth, and slays again in an endless cycle. The world experienced by the waking ego of humanity is the world of J.J. J. Bachofen's matriarchate with its goddesses of motherhood and destiny. The wicked devouring mother and the good mother lavishing affection are two sides of the great Uroboric mother goddess who reigns over this psychic stage. This growing ambivalence gives rise to an equally ambivalent attitude on the part of the ego towards the archetype in whose power it lies. The overwhelming might of the unconscious, that is to say, the devouring, destructive aspect under which it may also manifest itself, is seen figuratively as the evil mother, whether as the blood-stained goddess of death, plague, famine, flood, and the force of instinct, or as the sweetness that lures to destruction. But as the good mother, she is fullness and abundance 
the dispenser of life and happiness, the nutrient earth, the cornucopia of the fruitful womb. She is mankind's instinctive experience of the world's depth and beauty, of the goodness and graciousness of Mother Nature, who daily fulfills the promise of redemption and resurrection, of new life and new birth. Over against all this, the ego, consciousness, the individual, remains small and impotent. It feels itself a tiny, defenseless speck, enveloped and helplessly dependent, a little island floating on the vast expanse of the primal ocean. At this stage, consciousness has not yet wrested any firm foothold from the flood of unconscious being. For the primitive ego, everything is still wrapped in the watery abyss, in whose eddyings it washes to and fro without orientation with no sense of separateness, defenseless against this maelstrom of mysterious being which swamps it again and again from within and without. Exposed to the dark forces of the world and the unconscious, early man's life feeling is necessarily one of constant endangerment. Life in the psychic cosmos of the primitive is a life full of danger and uncertainty and the demonism of the external world with its sickness and death, famines and floods, droughts and earthquakes, is heightened beyond measure when contaminated with what we call the inner world. The terrors of a world ruled by the irrationality of chance and mitigated by no knowledge of the laws of causality are made even more sinister by the spirits of the dead, by demons and gods, witches and magicians, Invisible workings emanate from all these beings, and the reality of these all-pervading effluences shows itself in fears, emotional outbursts, orgiastic frenzies, and psychic epidemics, seasonal bouts of lust, murderous impulses, visions, dreams, and hallucinations. One has only to know how great, even today, is Western man's primordial fear of the world, despite his relatively highly developed consciousness, to understand the world fear of the primitive and his feeling of endangerment. This same horror of nameless lurking forces is known also to the child, who is still incapable of conscious orientation and discrimination, confronting every event as though it were a devastating innovation and exposed to every whim of the world and man. In him, too, there dwells this primitive dread which comes from an outside world contaminated with the inside and made mysterious by projection, as we see it in the dynamistic and animistic world picture. This dread is an expression of the dawn situation when a small and feeble ego consciousness pits itself against the cosmos. The supremacy of the world of objects and the world of the unconscious is an experience that has to be accepted. For this reason, fear is a normal phenomenon in the psychology of the child. Although it is outgrown as consciousness increases in strength, it provides at the same time a transpersonal incentive to such development. Vital components in the growth of the ego and in the evolution of consciousness Culture, religion, art, and science spring from the urge to overcome this fear by giving it concrete expression. It is therefore quite wrong to reduce it to personal or environmental factors and to seek to get rid of it in that way. Owing to the disorientation of the infantile ego, the pleasure-pain components are experienced inseparately from one another or at any rate, the object of experience is colored by a mixture of both. The non-separation of opposites and the resultant ambivalence of the ego towards all objects evoke a feeling of fear and impotence. The world is uroboric and supreme, whether this uroboric supremacy be experienced as the world or the unconscious, one's environment or one's own body. The dominance of the Ouroboros during the infantile phase of ego consciousness is what Bachhofen describes as the time of the matriarchate, and all the symbols he associates with it still appear in this psychic stage. We must again emphasize that stage 
refers to a structural layer and not to any historical epoch. In individual development, and perhaps also in that of the collective, these layers do not lie on top of one another in an orderly arrangement, but, as in the geological stratification of the earth, early layers may be pushed to the top and late layers to the bottom. We shall have to consider later on the contrast between masculine and feminine development. But one thing, paradoxical though it may seem, can be established at once as a basic law. Even in woman, consciousness has a masculine character. The correlation consciousness light day and unconsciousness darkness night holds true regardless of sex and is not altered by the fact that that the spirit-instinct polarity is organized on a different basis in men and women. Consciousness, as such, is masculine even in women, just as the unconscious is feminine in men. Bachhofen's matriarchate stands for the stage when ego consciousness is undeveloped and still embedded in nature and the world. Consequently, the Uroboric principle is also associated with the predominance of earth and vegetation symbolism. It is not the earth that imitates woman, but woman who imitates the earth. Marriage was regarded by the ancients as an agrarian matter. The whole terminology of matrimonial law is borrowed from agriculture, says Bachofen, recalling Plato's remark in fertility and generation, woman does not set an example to the earth, but the earth sets an example to woman. These sayings recognize the priority of the transpersonal and the derivative nature of the personal. Even marriage, the regulation of the sexual principle of opposites, derives from the earth principle of the matriarchate. At this stage, food symbolism and the organs coordinated with it are of prime importance. This explains why mother goddess cultures and their mythologies are closely connected with fertility and growth, and particularly with agriculture, hence with the sphere of food, which is the material and bodily sphere. The stage of the maternal Ouroboros is characterized by the child's relation to its mother, who yields nourishment, but at the same time it is an historical period in which man's dependence on the earth and nature is at its greatest. Connected with both aspects is the dependence of the ego and consciousness on the unconscious. The dependence of the sequence child-man-ego-consciousness on the sequence mother-earth-nature-unconscious illustrates the relation of the personal to the transpersonal and the reliance of the one upon the other. This stage of development is ruled by the image of the mother goddess with the divine child. It emphasizes the necessitous and helpless nature of the child and the protective side of the mother. In the form of a goat, she suckles the Cretan boy Zeus and protects him from the devouring father. Isis brings the boy Horus back to life when he is stung by a scorpion and Mary protects the Jesus child fleeing from Herod, just as Leto hides her divinely begotten children from the wrath of the hostile goddess. The child is the companion god of the great mother. As child and Kabir, it stands beside and beneath her, her dependent creature. Even for the youthful god, the great mother is fate. How much more then for the child? whose nature it is to be an appendage of her body. This relationship is most vividly expressed in the pre-human symbols, where the mother is the sea, a lake, or a river, and the child a fish swimming in the enveloping waters. Little Horus, the son of Isis, Hyacinthus, Erichthonius, and Dionysus, Melisertes, the son of Ino, and countless other beloved children are all under the dominion of the all-powerful Mother Goddess. For them she is still the beneficent birth-giver and protectress, the young mother, the Madonna. There is as yet no conflict, for the original containment of the child in the maternal Ouroboros is a state of uninterrupted reciprocal bliss. 
The adult ego connects the Madonna with this infantile stage, but the infantile ego, having as yet no central consciousness, still feels the amorphous, pleuromatic character of the maternal Ouroboros. Nevertheless, this child suffers the same fate as the adolescent lover who succeeds him. He is killed. His sacrifice, death, and resurrection are the ritual center of all child sacrifice cults. Born to die, dying to be reborn, the child is coordinated with the seasonal life of vegetation. The Cretan Zeus child, nurtured by the great mother in the shape of a goat, cow, bitch, sow, dove, or bee, is born every year, only to die every year. But the boy is also light, and therefore more than mere vegetation. One myth, very original in its primitivity, although only recorded in later times, tells us that the child was born every year, for it speaks of a light which every year shone forth from a grotto when the blood flowed at the birth of Zeus. The fate of the dying and sacrificed child, however, is not tragic like that of the adolescent lover. In the return to the deadly mother, the mater larum of the Romans, he finds shelter and comfort, for containment in the great mother enfolds the child, whether in life or in death. During the phase when consciousness begins to turn into self-consciousness, that is, to recognize and discriminate itself as a separate individual ego, the maternal Ouroboros overshadows it like a dark and tragic fate. Feelings of transitoriness and mortality, impotence and isolation now color the ego's picture of the Ouroboros in absolute contrast to the original situation of contentment. Whereas in the beginning the waking state was sheer exhaustion for the feeble ego consciousness and sleep was bliss so that it could later surrender itself rapturously to Ouroboric incest and return to the great round, now this return becomes more and more difficult, and is accomplished with increasing repugnance as the demands of its own independent existence grow more insistent. For the dawning light of consciousness, the maternal Ouroboros turns to darkness and night. The passage of time and the problem of death become a dominant life feeling. Bach often describes the mother-born, who know that they are born only of earth and mother, as being sad by nature, for decay and the necessity of death are one side of the Ouroboros, just because its other side signifies birth and life. The world wheel, the humming loom of time, the weird sisters, and the wheel of birth and death, all these symbols express the sadness that rules over the life of the adolescent ego. In this third phase, the ego germ has already attained a certain degree of autonomy. The embryonic and infantile stages are over. But although the adolescent no longer confronts the Ouroboros as a mere child, he has still not thrown off its suzerainty. The development of the ego goes hand in hand with a heightened plastic representation of the objects to which the ego is related. The maternal Ouroboros, unformed in the sense that the human figure has a form, is now succeeded by the figure of the Great Mother. The Ouroboric character of the Great Mother is apparent wherever she is worshipped in androgynous form, for instance, as the bearded goddess in Cyprus and Carthage. The woman with the beard or with the phallus betrays her Ouroboric character in the non-differentiation between male and female. Only later will this hybrid be replaced by sexually unequivocal figures, for its mixed and ambivalent character represents the earliest stage from which the opposites will subsequently be differentiated. Thus, the infantile consciousness constantly aware of its ties with and dependence upon the matrix from which it sprang, gradually becomes an independent system. Consciousness becomes self-consciousness, and a reflecting ego having cognizance of itself emerges as the center of consciousness. Even before the centering of the ego, 
There is consciousness of a sort, just as we can observe conscious acts in the infant before the appearance of ego consciousness. But only when the ego experiences itself as something distinct and different from the unconscious is the embryonic stage overcome. And only then can a conscious system be formed that stands entirely on its own. This early stage of conscious-unconscious relations is reflected in the mythology of the mother goddess and her connection with the sun lover. The Attis, Adonis, Tammuz, and Osiris figures in the Near Eastern cultures are not merely born of a mother. On the contrary, this aspect is altogether eclipsed by the fact that they are their mother's lovers. They are loved, slain, buried, and bewailed by her, and are then reborn through her. The figure of the sun lover follows on the stage of the embryo and child. By differentiating itself from the unconscious and reaffirming his masculine otherness, he very nearly becomes the partner of the maternal unconscious. He is her lover, as well as her son. But he is not yet strong enough to cope with her. He succumbs to her in death and is devoured. The mother beloved turns into the terrible death goddess. She is still playing cat and mouse with him, and she overshadows even his rebirth. Where, as the god who dies to rise again, he is connected with the fertility of the earth and vegetation, the sovereignty of the earth mother is as obvious as his own independence is questionable. The masculine principle is not yet a paternal tendency, balancing the maternal female principle. It is still youthful and vernal, the merest beginning of an independent movement away from the place of origin and the infantile relation. These relations are summarized in Bachofen. The mother is earlier than the son. The feminine has priority, while masculine creativity only appears afterwards as a secondary phenomenon. Woman comes first, but man becomes. The prime datum is the earth, the basic maternal substance. Visible creation proceeds from her womb, and it is only then that the sexes are divided into two. Only then does the masculine form come into being. Thus, male and female do not appear simultaneously. They are not of the same order. The female is primary. The male is only what comes out of her. He is part of the visible but ever-changing created world. He exists only in perishable form. Woman exists from everlasting, self-subsistent, immutable. Man, evolving, is subject to continual decay. In the realm of the physical, therefore, the masculine principle is of second rank, subordinate to the feminine. Herein lies the prototype and justification of genocracy. Herein is rooted that age-old conception of an immortal mother who unites herself with a mortal father. She is perennially the same, but from the man the generations multiply themselves into infinity. Ever the same great mother mates with ever new men. Visible creation, the offspring of Mother Earth, shapes itself into the idea of the progenitor. Adonis, the image of the annually decaying and resurgent world of nature, becomes Papas, the only begetter of what he himself is. It is the same with Plutus. As Demeter's son, Plutus is the visible created world which continually renews itself. But as Pena's husband, he is its father and begetter. He is at once the riches teeming out of the womb of the earth and the bestower of riches, the object and the active potency, creator and creature, cause and effect. But the first earthly manifestation of masculine power takes the form of the sun. From the sun we infer the father. The existence and nature of masculine power are evidenced only by the sun. On this rests the subordination of the masculine principle to that of the mother. The man appears as creature, not as creator, as effect, not cause. The reverse is true of the mother.
She comes before the creature, appearing as a cause, the prime giver of life, and not as an effect. She is not to be inferred from the creature, but is known in her own right. In a word, the woman first exists as a mother, and the man first exists as a son. Man then comes forth from woman by a miraculous metamorphosis of nature, which repeats itself in the birth of every male child. In the son, the mother appears transformed into the father. The he-goat, however, is merely Aphrodite's attribute, subject to her and intended for her usage. The daughter's sons of Entoria, in Aristophanes' poem Erigone, quoted by Plutarch, have a similar meaning. When a man is born of woman's womb, the mother herself marvels at the new apparition, for she recognizes in the form of her son the very image of that fecundating power to which she owes her motherhood. Her eyes linger with delight upon his limbs. Man becomes her plaything. The goat is her mount, the phallus her constant companion. Sibylle, the mother, overshadows Attis. Verbius is dwarfed by Diana, Phaeton by Aphrodite. Everywhere the material, feminine, natural principle has the advantage. It takes the masculine principle, which is secondary and subsists only in perishable form, as an ever-changing epiphenomenon into its lap, as Demeter took the sister. The young men whom the mother selects for her lovers may impregnate her, they may even be fertility gods, but the fact remains that they are only phallic consorts of the great mother, drones serving the queen bee, who are killed off as soon as they have performed their duty of fecundation. For this reason, these youthful companion gods always appear in the form of dwarfs. The pygmies, who were worshipped in Cyprus, Egypt, and Phoenicia, all territories of the great mother, display their phallic character just like the Dioscuri, the Kabiri, and the Dactyls, including even the figure of Harpocrates. The attendant serpent, apart from its numinous nature, is likewise a symbol of the fertilizing phallus. That is why the Great Mother is so often connected with snakes, not only in Cretomycenan culture and its Greek offshoots, but as far back as Egypt, Phoenicia, and Babylon. And similarly, in the Bible story of Paradise, the snake is the companion of woman. In Ur and in Iruch, they found in the lowest layer of excavations primitive representations of very old cult images of the mother goddess with her child, both having the heads of snakes. The Uruboric form of the oldest mother goddess is the snake, mistress of the earth, of the depths, and the underworld, which is why the child who is still attached to her is a snake like herself. Both become humanized in the course of time, but retain the snake's head. Then the lines of development diverge. The fully human end figure, the human Madonna with a human child, has her forerunner in figures of the human mother with her companion snake in the form of a child or phallus, as well as in figures of the human child with the big snake. The Ouroboros as a ring snake, for instance the Babylonian Tiamat and Chaos Serpent, or the Leviathan who, as the ocean twines his girdle of waves about the lands, later divides or is divided into two. When the Great Mother assumes human form, the masculine part of the Ouroboros, the snake-like phallus demon, appears beside her as a residuum of the originally bisexual nature of the Ouroboros. Now it is characteristic that the phallic youths, the vegetation deities, are not fertility deities only. As something sprung up from the earth, they are the vegetation itself. Their existence makes the earth fruitful but as soon as they have reached maturity, they must be killed, mown down, and harvested. The Great Mother, with the ear of corn, her corn son, is an archetype whose power extends as far as the mysteries of Eleusis, the Christian Madonna, and the Wheaton host in which the Wheaton body of the sun is eaten. The youths who belong to the Great Mother are gods of spring, 
who must be put to death in order to be lamented by the Great Mother and reborn. All lovers of mother goddesses have certain features in common. They are all youths whose beauty and loveliness are as striking as their narcissism. They are delicate blossoms, symbolized by the myths as anemones, narcissi, hyacinths, or violets, which we, with our markedly masculine patriarchal mentality, would more readily associate with young girls. The only thing we can say about these youths, whatever their names may be, is that they please the amorous goddess by their physical beauty. Apart from that, they are, in contrast to the heroic figures of mythology, devoid of strength and character, lacking all individuality and initiative. They are, in every sense of the word, obliging boys whose narcissistic self-attraction is obvious. The myth of Narcissus makes it quite clear that this is an attraction to one's own body, especially characteristic of this adolescent stage, is the narcissistic accentuation of the phallus as the epitome of the body and the narcissistic personality. The cult of phallic fertility, like the phallic sexual orgy, is everywhere typical of the Great Mother. Fertility festivals and rites of spring are sacred to the youthful phallus and its rampant sexuality. Or rather, this would be better formulated the other way round. The phallus of the young god is sacred to the great mother. For originally she was not concerned with the youth at all, but with the phallus of which he is the bearer. Only later, with secondary personalization, is the primary sacrament of fertility with its gruesome castration rites replaced by the love motif. Then, instead of an impersonal and suprapersonal ritual cosmically guaranteeing the fertility of the earth for the community, we have myths relating to human beings. Only then do we hear tales about the adventures of gods and goddesses with mortals, and the line finally ends with a romantic novel and the love story, which are better suited to the personalistic psychology of modern times. The grim contrast between these orgiastic feasts in which the youth and his phallus play the central part and the subsequent ritual castration and killing defines archetypally the situation of the adolescent ego under the dominance of the Great Mother. Although the situation is an historical and cultural one, it must be understood in terms of the psychological evolution of the ego. The relation of son-lover to Great Mother is an archetypal situation which is operative even today, and the overcoming of it is the precondition for any further development of ego consciousness. Those flower-like boys are not sufficiently strong to resist and break the power of the Great Mother. They are more pets than lovers. The goddess, full of desire, chooses the boys for herself and rouses their sexuality. The initiative never comes from them. They are always the victims, dying like adorable flowers. The youth has at this stage no masculinity, no consciousness, no higher spiritual ego. He is narcissistically identified with his own male body and its distinguishing mark, the phallus. Not only does the mother goddess love him simply for his phallus and in castrating him take possession of it to make herself fruitful, but he too is identified with the phallus and his fate is a phallic fate. All these youths, with their weak egos and no personality, only have a collective fate, not a fate of their own. They are not yet individuals, and so they have no individual existence, only a ritual one. Nor is the mother goddess related to an individual, but only to the youth as an archetypal figure. Even rebirth through the Great Mother, her healing and positive aspect, is in this sense unrelated. It is not an ego, much less a self or a personality, that is reborn and knows itself to be reborn. Rebirth is a cosmic occurrence, anonymous and universal, like life. From the point of view of the Earth Mother, or Great Mother, all vegetation is the same. 
Every newborn creature is a mother's darling who remains one and the same in every spring and in every birth, just as she remains one and the same. But this only means that for her, the newborn is a reborn, and every beloved the same, the one beloved. And when the goddess ritually unites herself with every fertility king, with father, son, and grandchild, or with each of her archpriests, these are always one and the same for her, because for her, sexual union means only one thing, no matter who the bearer of the phallus may be, which is the only thing that does matter. Similarly, in her priestesses, the sacred prostitutes, she is a multiple womb, but in reality, she always remains herself, the one goddess. The Great Mother is a virgin, too, in a sense other than that intended by the Patriarchate, which later misunderstood her as a symbol of chastity. Precisely in virtue of her fruitfulness, she is a virgin, that is, unrelated and not dependent upon any man. In Sanskrit, independent woman is a synonym for a harlot. Hence, the woman who is unattached to a man is not only a universal feminine type, but a sacral type in antiquity. The Amazon is unattached in her independence, but so is the woman who represents and is responsible for the fertility of the earth. She is the mother of all that has been born or will be born, but only in a brief access of passion, if at all, does she burn for the male, who is simply a means to an end the bearer of the phallus. All phallus cults, and they are invariably solemnized by women, harp on the same thing, the anonymous power of the fertilizing agent, the phallus that stands by itself. The human element, the individual, is merely the bearer, the passing and interchangeable bearer of that which does not pass away and cannot be interchanged because it is ever the self-same phallus. Accordingly, the fertility goddess is both mother and virgin, the hetera, who belongs to no man but is ready to give herself to any man. She is therefore anybody who, like herself, stands in the service of fertility. By turning to her womb, he serves her, the sacred representative of the great fertility principle. The bridal veil must be understood in this sense as the symbol of Kadesha, the harlot, she is unknown, that is to say, anonymous. To be unveiled means to be naked, but this is only another form of anonymity. Always the goddess, the transpersonal, is the real and operative factor. The personal incarnation of this goddess, that is to say, the particular woman, is of no consequence. For the man, she is a kadesha, a holy one. Kadosh equals holy the goddess who stirs up the deeper layers of his being in sexuality. Yoni and lingam, female and male, are two principles which come together beyond the person, in holiness, where the personal is shed away and remains insignificant. The youths who personify the spring belong to the Great Mother. They are her bond slaves, her property, because they are the sons she has borne. Consequently, the chosen ministers and priests of the Mother Goddess are eunuchs. They have sacrificed the thing that is for her the most important, the phallus. Hence the phenomenon of castration associated with this stage appears here for the first time in its proper sense, because specifically related to the genital organ. The castration threat makes its appearance with the Great Mother and is deadly. For her... Loving, dying, and being emasculated are the same thing. Only the priests, at least in later times, escape being put to death because, by castrating themselves, they have voluntarily submitted to a symbolical death for her sake. An essential characteristic of this adolescent ego stage is that the female, under the aspect of the Great Mother, is experienced as having a negative fascination. Two features are especially common and well-marked. The first is the bloody and savage nature of the great mother goddess. The second is her power as a sorceress and a witch. Worshipped from Egypt to India, from Greece and Asia Minor to darkest Africa, 
The Great Mother was always regarded as a goddess of the chase and of war. Her rites were bloody, her festivals orgiastic. All these features are essentially interconnected. This blood layer deep down in the Great Earth Mother only makes it more understandable why the youths she loves should fear castration. The womb of the earth clamors for fertilization, and blood sacrifices and the corpses are the food she likes best. This is the terrible aspect, the deadly side of the earth's character. In the earliest fertility cults, the gory fragments of the sacrificial victim were handed round as precious gifts and offered up to the earth in order to make her fruitful. These human sacrifices for fertility occur all the world over, quite independently of one another, in the rites of America and in the eastern Mediterranean, in Asia and in northern Europe. Everywhere, blood plays a leading part in fertility ritual and human sacrifice. The great terrestrial law that there can be no life without death was early understood, and still earlier represented in ritual to mean that a strengthening of life can only be bought at the cost of sacrificial death. But the word bought is really a late and spurious rationalization. Slaughter and sacrifice, dismemberment and offerings of blood are magical guarantees of earthly fertility. We misunderstand these rites if we call them cruel. For the early cultures, and even for the victims themselves, this sequence of events was necessary and self-evident. The basic phenomenon behind woman's connection with blood and fertility is in all likelihood the cessation of the menstrual flow during pregnancy, by which means, in the archaic view, the embryo was built up. This intuitively sensed connection underlies the relationship between blood and fertility. Blood means fruitfulness and life just as the shedding of blood means loss of life and death. Consequently, the shedding of blood was originally a sacred act, whether it was the blood of a wild beast, a domestic animal, or a man. The earth must drink blood if she is to be fertile, and therefore libations of blood are offered up to increase her power. But the mistress of the blood zone is woman. She has the blood magic that makes life grow. Hence, the same goddess is very often the mistress of fertility, of war, and of hunting. The ambivalent character of the great mother goddess, if we disregard India, is seen most clearly in Egypt, where the great goddesses, be they called Neith or Hathor, Bast or Mut, are not only nourishing goddesses who give and sustain life, but goddesses of savagery, bloodlust, and destruction. Neith, the heavenly cow and first birth-giver, the mother who bore the son who gave birth before birth was, and of whom Ehrman finds it remarkable that, in ancient times she was especially honored by women, was a goddess of war and led the charge in battle. This same Neith, invoked to adjudicate in the dispute about Horus, says threateningly, Or I shall wax wroth, and the heavens shall fall upon the earth. Similarly, Hathor, the cow and giver of milk, is the mother. She, too, is the mother of the sun, is especially honored by women, and is the goddess of love and destiny. Dancing, singing, the clashing sistrum, the rattling of necklaces and the beating of hand drums pertain to her festivities and bear witness to her provocative, orgiastic nature. She is a war goddess or rather, the bloodthirsty, frenzied despoiler of mankind. As thou truly livest, I have prevailed over men, and it was comforting to my heart, she says, when sent forth to bring judgment upon men. So drunken with blood was she, that the gods, in order to save the human race from total destruction, had to prepare quantities of red beer, which she mistook for blood. Then she drank of it, and it tasted good, and she returned home drunken, and knew not men. She is identified with the friendly cat goddess Bast, who in her terrible form is the lion goddess Sekhmet. So it is not at all remarkable, as Keyes thinks, 
that the worship of the lion should have prevailed throughout Upper Egypt. The lion is the most beautiful and the most obvious symbol for the lacerating character of the great female deity. Sekhmet, too, is a goddess of battles, belching fire. As the friendly bast, her rites are celebrated with dancing, music, and the sistrum, but in her paw she holds a lion's head, as if to show that this terrible head suited her equally well. In this connection we might mention the legend of the lion goddess Tefnut, who has to be brought back to Egypt from the desert. Thoth, the god of wisdom, undertakes this task. When he upbraids her and says how desolate Egypt is at having been abandoned by her in her rage, she begins to weep like a cloudburst. But suddenly her weeping turns to wrath, and she changes into a lion. Her mane smoked with fire, her back had the color of blood, her countenance glowed like the sun, her eyes shone with fire. Again, Taurt, a huge pregnant monster rearing up on its hind legs, whose cult dates from prehistoric times, is depicted as a hippopotamus, with a crocodile's back, lion's feet, and human hands. She is the protectress of women in childbirth and of nursing mothers, though her aspect as the terrible mother is plain enough. Later, as Hesimut, she was correlated with the constellation of the bear, whose maternal characteristics are well known. Blood also plays a decisive part in feminine taboos, which from earliest times until far into the patriarchal cultures and religions have caused men to turn away from all feminine matters as though from something numinous. The blood of menstruation, defloration, and birth proves to men that women have a natural connection with this sphere. But in the background there is a dim knowledge of the blood affinity of the Great Mother, who, as chthonic mistress of life and death, demands blood and appears to be dependent upon the shedding of blood. We know from prehistoric times the role played by the divine kings, who had either to kill themselves or be killed when their powers failed and they could no longer personally guarantee fertility. This whole corpus of rites, whose significance and wide distribution have been described by Fraser, is dedicated to the Great Mother and serves her fertility. If, in Africa today, the sacred king is rainmaker, Rain and vegetation in one, he was so from the very beginning as the sun lover of the Great Mother. Fraser says, There is some reason to think that in early times Adonis was sometimes personated by a living man who died a violent death in the character of the god. That is an understatement, for everything points to the fact that in ancient times a human victim, whether god, king, or priest, was always offered up to ensure the fertility of the earth. Originally, the victim was the male, the fertilizing agent, since fertilization is only possible through libations of blood in which life is stored. The female earth needs the fertilizing blood seed of the male. Here, as nowhere else, we can see the meaning of the female deity. The emotional, passionate nature of the female in wild abandon is a terrible thing for a man in his consciousness. The dangerous side of woman's lasciviousness, although suppressed, misunderstood, and minimized in patriarchal times, was still a living experience in earlier ages. Deep down in the evolutionary stratum of adolescence, the fear of it still dwells in every man, and works like a poison whenever a false conscious attitude represses this layer of reality into the unconscious. Mythology, however, tells us that woman's wildness and bloodlust are subordinated to a higher natural law, that of fertility. The orgiastic element does not occur only in the sex festivals, which are fertility festivals. Women also celebrated orgiastic rites amongst themselves. These rites, often known to us only from the later mysteries, mostly revolved around the orgiastic dismemberment of a sacred animal or animal deity, whose bloody portions were devoured and whose death served the fertility of woman 
and consequently of the earth. Death and dismemberment or castration are the fate of the phallus-bearing youthful god. Both are clearly visible in myth and ritual, and both are associated with bloody orgies and the cult of the Great Mother. Dismemberment of the corpse of the seasonal king and the burial of his parts are an age-old piece of fertility magic. But only when we view the disjecta membra as a unity can we grasp the original meaning. The preservation of the phallus and its embalming as a guarantor of fertility are the other side of the ritual. They supplement the castration and together with it form a symbolic whole. Behind the archetype of the terrible Earth Mother looms the experience of death, when the Earth takes back her progeny as the dead, divides and dissolves them in order to make herself fruitful. This experience has been preserved in the rites of the terrible Mother, who in her Earth projection becomes the Flesh Eater, and finally the Sarcophagus, the last vestige of man's age-old and long-practiced fertility cults. Castration, death, and dismemberment on this level are all equivalent. They are correlated with the decay of vegetation, with harvesting, and the felling of trees. Castration and tree felling, closely associated in myth, are symbolically identical. Both are found in the Attis myth of the Phrygian Sibylle, in the myth of the Syrian Astarte, and the Ephesian Artemis and in the Bata fairy tale of the Osiris cycle. The meaning of certain parallel features, for example the fact that Attis emasculates himself under a pine, changes into a pine, is hanged on a pine, and is felled as a pine, cannot be elucidated here. The sacerdotal sacrifice of hair is likewise a symbol of emasculation, just as, conversely, a rich growth of hair is taken to be a sign of enhanced virility. The sacrifice of men's hair is an ancient mark of priesthood, from the baldness of Egyptian hierophants to the tonsure of Catholic priests and Buddhist monks. Notwithstanding the great disparities of religious views, hairlessness is always associated with sexual abstinence and celibacy, that is to say, with symbolic self-castration. The shaving of the head played this part officially in the cult of the Great Mother, by no means only as a token of mourning for Adonis, so that, here again felling the tree, harvesting the grain, the decay of vegetation, cutting the hair, and castration, are all identical. The equivalent in woman is the sacrifice of her chastity. By surrendering himself, the devotee becomes the property of the Great Mother and is finally transformed into her. The priests of Gadis, modern Cadiz, like the priests of Isis, were shaved, and in some way not known to us, barbers were among the attendants of Astarte. In the use of women's clothing, known to have been worn by the Gali, the castrated priests of the Great Mother in Syria, Crete, Ephesus, etc., and preserved in the dress of the Catholic priests today, the sacrifice is carried to the point of identification. Not only is the male sacrificed to the Great Mother, but he becomes her representative, a female wearing her dress. Whether he sacrifices his masculinity in castration or in male prostitution is only a variant. The eunuchs are, as priests, also sacred prostitutes, for the Kadishim, like the Kadishath, or female sacred prostitutes, are representatives of the goddess whose orgiastic sexual character excels her fertility character. Since these castrated priests play a leading role in the cults of the Bronze Age in Syria, Asia Minor, and even in Mesopotamia, we find the same presuppositions at work in all the territories of the Great Mother. Death, castration, and dismemberment are the dangers that threaten the youthful lover but they do not adequately characterize his relationship to the Great Mother. Were she terrible only, and a death goddess, her resplendent image would lack something that makes her perhaps even more terrible, and yet at the same time infinitely desirable, for she is also the goddess who drives mad and fascinates, the seducer and bringer of delight, the sovereign enchantress. 
the fascination of sex and the drunken orgy, culminating in unconsciousness and death, are inextricably combined in her. Whereas Euroboric incest meant dissolution and extinction, because it had a total and not a genital character, incest on the adolescent level is genital and restricted absolutely to the genitalia. The great mother has become all womb, the young lover all phallus, and the whole procedure remains entirely on the sexual level. Hence, the phallus and the phallic cult go together with the sexuality of the adolescent stage, and the deadly aspect of this stage likewise appears as the slaying of the phallus, that is to say, as castration. The orgiastic character of the Adonis, Attis, and Tammuz cults, not to speak of the Dionysian, is all part of this sexuality. The young lover experiences an orgy of sex, and in the orgasm the ego dissolves, is transcended in death. On this level, orgasm and death go together, just as do orgasm and castration. For the youthful god with his feebly developed ego the positive and negative aspects of sexuality are dangerously close to one another. When intoxicated, he surrenders his ego and returns to the womb of the Great Mother, regressing to the pre-ego state. He is not consummating the beatific uroboric incest of the earliest stage, but the death ecstasy of sexual incest belonging to a later stage, whose motto is post coitum omne animal triste. Sexuality here means losing the ego and being overpowered by the female, which is a typical or rather archetypal experience in puberty. Because sex is experienced as the all-powerful transpersonal phallus and womb, the ego perishes and succumbs to the supreme fascination of the non-ego. The mother is still too great, the seat of the unconscious still too near, for the ego to resist the surge of the blood. The terrible mother is an enchantress who confuses the senses and drives men out of their minds. No adolescent can withstand her. He is offered up to her as a phallus. Either this is taken by force, or else, overpowered by the great mother, the frenzied youths mutilate themselves and offer up the phallus to her as a sacrifice. Madness is a dismemberment of the individual, just as the dismemberment of the body in fertility magic symbolizes dissolution of the personality. Since the dissolution of personality and individual consciousness pertains to the sphere of the mother goddess, Insanity is an ever-recurrent symptom of possession by her or by her representatives. For, and in this lies her magical and fearful power, the youth burns with desire even when threatened with death, even when the consummation of his desire is attended by castration. The Great Mother is therefore the sorceress who transforms men into animals, Circe, mistress of wild beasts, who sacrifices the male and rends him. Indeed, the male serves her as an animal, and no more, for she rules the animal world of the instincts which ministers to her and to her fertility. This explains the theriomorphic male consorts of the Great Mother, her priests and victims. And that is why, for example, the male votaries of the Great Goddess who prostituted themselves in her name were called Calabim dogs, and wore women's clothing. For the great mother, the divine youth means happiness, glory, and fertility. But she remains eternally unfaithful to him and brings him nothing but misfortune. Well might Gilgamesh reply to the seductive wiles of Ishtar as she raised an eye to the beauty of Gilgamesh. What am I to give thee, that I may take thee in marriage? Should I give oil for the body and clothing? Should I give bread and victuals, food fit for divinity, drink fit for royalty? If I take thee in marriage, thou art but a brazier which goes out in the cold, a back door which does not keep out blast and windstorm, a palace which crushes the valiant, a turban whose cover 
pitch which soils its bearers, a water skin which soaks through its bearer, limestone which springs the stone rampart, jasper which enemy land, a shoe which pinches the foot of its owner. Which lover didst thou love forever? Which of thy shepherds pleased thee for all time? Come, and I will name for thee thy lovers. Of, for Tammuz, the lover of thy youth, thou hast ordained wailing year after year. Having loved the dappled shepherd bird, thou smotest him, breaking his wing. In the groves he sits, crying, My wing! Then thou lovest a lion, perfect in strength. Seven pits and seven thou didst dig for him. Then a stallion thou lovest, famed in battle. The whip, the spur, and the lash thou ordainst for him. Thou decreedst for him to gallop seven leagues. Thou decreedst for him the muddied to drink. For his mother, Sillili, thou ordainest wailing. Then thou lovest the keeper of the herd, who ash cakes ever did heap up for thee. Yet thou smotest him, turning him into a wolf, so that his own herd boys drive him off, and his dogs bite his thighs. Then thou lovest Ishalanu, thy father's gardener, who baskets of dates ever did bring to thee, and daily did brighten thy table. Thine eyes raised at him, thou didst go to him. O oh, my Ishulanu, let us taste of thy vigor. Put forth thy hand, and touch our modesty. Ishulanu said to thee, What dost thou want with me? Has my mother not baked? Have I not eaten, that I should taste the food of offense and curses? Does reed work afford cover against the cold? As thou heardst this his talk, thou smotest him, and turnedest him into a spider. Thou placed him in the midst of... He cannot go up, nor can he come down. If thou shouldst love me, thou wouldst treat me like them. The stronger the masculine ego consciousness becomes, the more it is aware of the emasculating, bewitching, deadly, and stupefying nature of the great goddess. Domains of the Terrible Mother in order to illustrate the main features of the archetype of the great and terrible mother and her son-lover, we shall take as an example the great myth of Osiris and Isis. The patriarchal version of this myth shows clear traces of the transition from matriarchate to patriarchate, and despite the editorial rearrangement and alteration of the material, it is still possible for us to hear the original accents. The myth has also been preserved as the oldest fairy tale in the world's literature, namely as the story of Bata. In spite of the secondary personalizations which are inevitable in the passage from myth to fairy tale, this story likewise preserves in clear and interpretable form the relationships and symbols which disclose the original meaning. In the myth, Isis, Nephthys, Set, and Osiris form a quaternity of two brothers and two sisters. Even in the womb, Isis and Osiris cleave together. And in its final phase, the myth represents Isis as the positive symbol of conjugal and motherly love. But besides her characteristics as a sister-wife, Isis also preserves something magical and maternal in her relations with Osiris. For when the latter is done to death and dismembered by his enemy and brother, Set, it is his sister-wife Isis who brings about his rebirth, thus proving herself to be at the same time the mother of her brother-husband. In later developments of the myth, she largely discards the character of the great mother and assumes that of the wife. Nevertheless, Isis, who seeks, mourns, finds, recognizes, and brings her dead husband to birth again, is still the great goddess adored by youths whose rites are everywhere typified by this sequence of death, mourning, search, recovery, and rebirth. It is an essential function of the good Isis to give up her matriarchal dominance, which was such an obvious feature in the original matriarchate of Egyptian queens. 
typical of this surrender and of the transition to the patriarchal system, is Isis' struggle to get the legitimacy of her son Horus recognized by the gods. Whereas in the uterine system, as Moray calls it, a son is always the son of his mother, Isis fights for the recognition of the paternity of Osiris for Horus, who is to take over from him the paternal inheritance of the patriarchate. On this inheritance was based the lineage of the Egyptian pharaohs, each of whom styled himself son of Horus. Osiris is he who establishes justice over the two lands. He leaves the son in his father's place. One remarkable and evidently somewhat incongruous feature has been preserved which belies the good character of Isis as wife and mother. Horus resumes his father's struggle against the murderer Set, and in this he is encouraged by Isis. But when Set is struck by the spear of Isis, he cries out to her for pity, saying, Would you take up arms against his, Horus's, mother's brother? Her heart felt compassion, and she cried to the spear, Leave him! Leave him! See, he is my brother by the same mother! And the spear left him. Then the majesty of Horus was incensed against his mother Isis, like an upper Egyptian panther, and she fled before him on this day when the battle was appointed against the troublemaker Set. And Horus cut off the head of Isis, but Thoth, by his magic, changed it and set it upon her again, who was now called the First of the Cows. It is characteristic that Set, in accusing his sister Isis, should say that he is, after all, her brother by the same mother, and that therefore she should not love the strange man more than she loves him. This strange man is either Osiris, who is here regarded not as the brother of Isis but as her husband, or else, as Ehrman thinks, he is her own son Horus. That is to say, Set's point of view is purely matriarchal deriving from the age of exogamy, when the son went away and the maternal uncle was and remained the head of the family. The patriarchal, as opposed to the matriarchal point of view, is classically formulated by one of the gods in the dispute about the legitimacy of Horus. Should the office be given to the mother's brother, while yet there is a son of her body? Contrast this with Set's plea, Will you give the office to my little brother, so long as I, his big brother, am there? So Isis has evidently regressed, slipped back into the brother-sister relationship, which, as we know from Bachofen, had priority over the husband-wife relationship. Isis defends her brother Set because he is brother to her by her own mother, even though he has murdered her husband Osiris and cut him to pieces. Horus, as his father's avenger, makes himself guilty of matricide. The problem of the Oresteia, which we shall be dealing with later as an example of the son's conflicting loyalties to father and mother, crops up here in connection with Isis, whose essential function lies in forming a bridge from the matriarchal to the patriarchal order of society. A further trace of the originally terrible character of Isis can be seen in the strange fact that when Isis intervenes in the battle between Horus and Set, her spear first strikes her son, Horus. This is a mistake which she instantly repairs. The terrible side of Isis is apparent in several other subsidiary traits. And although these do not belong to the authentic Isis-Osiris drama, they are nevertheless extremely significant. During her search for Osiris, she becomes nurse to Queen Astarte in Byblos. There she endeavors to make the queen's child immortal by laying it in the fire, an attempt which fails. The king's younger son dies at the sight of her violent sobbing as she throws herself upon the coffin of Osiris, and the elder son she takes back with her to Egypt. When the boy catches her in the act of kissing amid her tears the face of the dead Osiris, she wrathfully turns upon him such a terrible look that he dies of fright on the spot. This clear proof of her witchcraft is tucked away as a subsidiary detail 
in the clandestine destruction of the children of Astarte, queen of Byblos, with whom, however, Isis is always identified. The good Egyptian Isis, the exemplary mother of Horus, stands side by side with the terrible mother, who in Byblos slays her children, the children of Astarte. Astarte and one of her doubles, Anath, were both worshipped as Isis in the sanctuary at Philae, which proves the affinity of the two goddesses. The figure of Astarte Anath corresponds to the matriarchal Isis, who is associated with her brother Set. And in the litigation about Horus, Anath is handed over to Set by way of indemnity. When the patriarchal development of Isis into a good wife and mother is complete, her terrible matriarchal aspect is delegated to Horus' maternal uncle, Set. Another striking fact is that Horus begets his four sons by his mother Isis. This only repeats what happens everywhere in the territory of the Great Mother. For all generations of men, she remains the one. The terrible side of Isis is also revealed in the circumstance that the Osiris who was reborn with her help remains castrated. His member was never discovered. It was swallowed by a fish. Dismemberment and castration are no longer performed by Isis, but are taken over by Set. The result, however, is the same. It is further to be noted that Isis conceives Horus, the Harpocrates of the Greeks, by the dead Osiris. That this sun-god should be begotten by Osiris after his death is a somewhat baffling feature. The symbolism recurs in the story of Bata, whose wife is made pregnant by a splinter of the felled Bata tree. It becomes more intelligible if we realize that the fecundation of the Great Mother presupposes the death of the male, and that the Earth Mother can only be made fruitful by death, killing, castration, and sacrifice. The Horus child begotten by the dead Osiris is represented, on the one hand, as weak in the legs, and, on the other hand, ethyphallically. He holds his finger to his mouth, which is supposed to indicate sucking. Generally, he is seated in the center of a flower, and his distinguishing mark is a long, curling lock of hair, besides which he carries the cornucopia and the urn. He symbolizes the very young sun, and his significance is undoubtedly phallic. The ithyphallus, the finger, and the lock of hair are evidence of this. At the same time, he has feminine attributes and is what we might call a true mother's darling. Even when, curiously enough, he is disguised as an old man, he carries a basket. This Harpocrates stands for the infantile stage of existence in the Ouroboros. He is the suckling, caught in the maternal coil. His father is a wind spirit, the dead Osiris, and thus he belongs to the matriarchal stage of the Ouroboros, where there is no personal father, but only the great Isis. The dismemberment of Osiris and the theft of his phallus, later attributed to Set, are the most ancient portions of the fertility ritual. Isis compensates for this by replacing the missing member with a wooden phallus, and is thereupon impregnated by the dead Osiris. We can reconstruct the ritual thus. While the torn limbs of Osiris scattered over the fields guarantee the year's fertility, the phallus is missing, for Osiris is robbed of his phallus, which is embalmed and preserved until the next resurrection feast of fertility. But it was from this embalmed phallus that Isis conceives the child Horus. Hence, for this Horus, as well as for Horus the sun god, it is more significant that Isis was his mother than that Osiris was his father. The fact that the queen of Byblos was identified with a cow-headed Hathor, and that Isis got her cow's head by betraying Horus and Osiris, completes the picture. The Book of the Dead contains reminders of the terrible Isis when it speaks of the slaughtering knife with which Isis cut off a piece of flesh from Horus, and of the chopper of Isis,
Again, when we are told that Horus destroyed the water flood of his mother, this only confirms her devouring character. We find the same thing in Hathor. She appears as a hippopotamus and as a cow. The hippopotamus was originally sacred to Set, but the Osiris myth relates how it passed over to the Osiris Horus faction. Here, too, it is a question of overcoming the great and terrible mother in the guise of the pregnant hippopotamus and of her transformation into the good mother, the cow. Only when Horus, as the son of his father, beheads the terrible Isis, Set's sister, is her dreadful aspect destroyed and transformed. Thoth, the god of wisdom, then endows her with a cow's head, symbol of the good mother, and she becomes Hathor. As such, she is the good mother and dutiful wife of the patriarchal age. Her power is delegated to her son Horus, heir of Osiris, and through him to the patriarchal pharaohs of Egypt. Her terrible side is repressed into the unconscious. Evidence for this repression can be found in another of Egypt's mythological figures. Beside the scales in which, at the judgment of the dead, the hearts are weighed, there sits the monster Amam, or Ammit, devourer of the dead. Those of the dead who have not passed the test are eaten by this female monster and are extinguished for good. This monster has a very remarkable shape, her forepart a crocodile, her hind part a hippopotamus, and her middle a lion. Taurt, too, is a combination of hippopotamus, crocodile, and lioness, only here the marks of the lion goddess Sekhmet are more strongly emphasized. Thus the devourer of the dead is the terrible mother of death and the underworld, though not in her splendid original form. She is repressed and crouches beside the judgment scales like a horror. As Ehrman says, she was not a subject that popular fancy cared to pursue. Further confirmation of this is provided by the Book of the Dead, where it says of Amam, here represented as the god of the dead, he maketh it to come to pass that the cedar trees grow not, that the acacia trees bring not forth. The terrible mother could not be better described than in these words, if we remember that the cedar and the acacia are symbolically very intimately connected with Osiris, whose life and everlastingness they represent. The terrible aspect of Isis is further borne out by the story of the two brothers, whose connection with the Osiris-Osiris myth is generally recognized and has been authenticated by the latest excavations in Byblos. We shall briefly enumerate the motifs which connect the Osiris myth with the story of Bata. The dead Osiris, whom Isis seeks, was found at Byblos in Lebanon, and he was found, moreover, as a tree. That is, he was enclosed in a tree trunk. From there he was brought back to Egypt. The principal symbol of Osiris is the Jed Pillar, a tree fetish, itself sufficiently remarkable in treeless Egypt. And in Byblos, too, a tree, wrapped in linen and anointed, was worshipped as the wood of Isis. The importation of trees from Lebanon was one of the essential conditions for Egyptian culture, and above all for the cult of the dead. We hear of Egyptian tributes to the Queen of Byblos as far back as 2800 B.C. Unquestionably, the close ties between the Egyptian and the Syrian centers of culture go back even further. The phallic tree fetish as a symbol of the youthful lover is known to us from numerous myths, to an even greater extent than the harvesting of the grain signifying the death of the son born of the earth mother the felling of trees was a ritual act. The mighty strength of this son in his tree form made the sacrifice even more significant and impressive. We have already discussed the slaying and hanging of son-lover priests on trees and noted that their castration must be equated with tree felling. The correctness of our view is now corroborated by the fact that the reverse process the erection of the Osiron Jed pillar 
in the coronation ceremonies at the said festival symbolizes the renewal of Pharaoh's strength. The story of the two brothers has for its setting the Valley of Cedars near Byblos. The heroine, the wife of Bata's elder brother, tries to seduce Bata. This is the old Joseph motif. Bata resists her blandishments. The wife accuses him before her husband, who thereupon tries to kill his younger brother. Bata, as a sign of his innocence, castrates himself. The gods now create a wonderful wife as a companion for the castrated Bata. Bata warns her, and this is a remarkable feature, about the dangers of the sea, saying, Go not forth, lest the sea fetch you away. I cannot protect you from the sea, for I am a woman like you. This warning about the sea is exceedingly interesting. We recall that the phallus of Osiris was swallowed by a fish, of a kind which the Egyptians regarded as sacred and not to be eaten. The excavations at ancient Agarit, now Ras Shamra, Syria, have made Astarte mistress of the sea as familiar to us as the foam-born Aphrodite. Always the primal ocean, the waters of the deep of Jewish legend, is the territorial waters of the terrible mother. For instance, the child-eating Lilith, the adversary of man who refuses to submit to Adam, withdraws to a place called the Gorge of the Sea. Bata's wife is in danger of being swept away by the waves, that is to say, of being overpowered by her negative Astarte character. Astarte had originally the form of a fish in her Atagatis aspect. As de Certe too, Astarte resembled a fish or water sprite, and in many of the myths she plunges into her native element. In the Bata tale, the very thing that Bata fears and that no poor womanish eunuch could ward off, naturally happens. His wife becomes the wife of the Egyptian king, and she causes the cedar, which is identified with Bata, whose heart reposed on its flower, to be hewn down. The dead Bata, however, is resuscitated by his brother and comes to Egypt as a bull. Once more he is slain, and from the drops of his blood grow sycamore trees, which are likewise felled at the behest of the wife. But this time, Bata enters his wife's mouth as a splinter of wood from the tree, and she is made pregnant. In this way, he is born again as his own son by the terrible mother, is adopted by the king of Ethiopia, and finally becomes king of Egypt. On his accession to the throne as a patriarch, he kills his wife, who was also his sister, and makes his brother the crown prince. We cannot concern ourselves here with the motif of the two brothers, or with the motif of self-propagation, nor yet with the extent to which this fairy tale belongs to the later stage of the fight with the dragon and conflict with the male principle. We would only point out its connection with the Osiris myth, and with the figure of the terrible mother who lurks behind Isis, the good wife and mother. Bata is the son-lover of the Great Mother, as we would expect from the cultural sphere to which Byblos belongs. The Joseph motif, the tree-felling, the self-castration, the animal form of the victim who is sacrificed as a bull, the blood sacrifice as the fertility principle that causes the trees to grow, only to be hewn down again, all this is familiar. Everywhere the female is terrible. She is the seducer, the instrument of castration, cause of the two tree fellings, and of the death of the bull. But despite everything, she is not terrible only. She is also the fruitful mother goddess who is impregnated by the splinter of wood in order to bring forth the seduced, slain, and sacrificed Bata as her son. Osiris, like Bata, has the form of a tree and a bull. The felled tree is his emblem, and not only was the cedar in fact imported into Egypt from Byblos, but the myth expressly relates that Osiris was found by Isis in Byblos in the form of a tree and was brought to Egypt from there. The whole myth clearly associates Osiris as a vegetation deity with the figures of Adonis, Attis, and Tammuz. 
Even his cult is that of the dying and resurgent god. But the power of the maternal Ouroboros is, as we have seen, already on the wane in Isis. The figure of the terrible Astarte, goddess of Byblos, clearly portrayed in the Bata fairy tale, is succeeded by Isis, the good mother. But by her side there appears the negative figure of Set, the masculine principal and twin brother, who takes over the role of the killer. Whereas in the Attis legend the negative masculine side of the androgynous Uroboric mother goddess only appears as the boar who kills Attis, in the Osiris myth this figure is an independent entity and proves to be inimical not only to Osiris, but in the end to Isis as well. The story of Vata represents the terrible nature of the Great Mother as the nature of the female in general. But with the passing of the matriarchal reign of Egyptian queens and the rise of the patriarchal Horus, the sun god under the pharaohs, Isis gradually became merged with the archetype of the Good Mother, who presided over the patriarchal family. Her magical nature, as regenitrix of her own brother and husband, was thrust into the background. Important corroboration of all this is furnished by the recently discovered Canaanite myths, which were brought to light during the excavations at Ras Shamra. We shall mention only such features as pertain to the symbolism of the Ouroboros and the Great Mother. Albright has ascertained that the Canaanite religion, in comparison with the religions of its neighbors, remained relatively primitive and aboriginal. As an example, he cites the fact that the relations of the divinities to one another, and even their sex, varied. And he further mentions the tendency of Canaanite mythology to bring opposites together, so that, for instance, the god of death and destruction is also the god of life and healing, just as the goddess Anath is the destroyer and, at the same time, the goddess of life and propagation. The Ouroboric coincidence of opposites is expressed in this juxtaposition of positive and negative features, of masculine and feminine attributes. The three goddesses Asherah, Anath, and Ashtorath are simply three different but indistinct manifestations of the archetypical Great Mother. Asherah is the enemy of the hero Baal and mother of the monsters of the desert who cause his death. And at the same time, she is the enemy of Anath, Baal's sister goddess. But here, too, as with Isis, mother beloved and sister, destroyer and helper, are inseparable aspects. The archetype has not yet split up into the firm outlines of distinct goddesses. Like Isis, Anath resuscitates her dead brother husband and vanquishes the evil brother Motset. In Ashtaroth, whose name Albright translates as sheep breeder, we can recognize the primordial figure of Rahel, the mother sheep. But Ashtaroth and Anath are at the same time virgins and mothers of the peoples, the great goddesses who conceive but do not bear, that is to say, the goddesses who are perennially fruitful without ever losing their virginity. They are therefore both mother goddesses and divine courtesans. Besides that, all three of them are sinister goddesses of sex and war, whose bloodthirstiness rivals even that of Hathor and the Hindu Kali. The later picture of the naked goddess galloping on a horse and brandishing a lance is vividly sketched in the Baal epic. After she had slaughtered the race of men, the blood was so deep that she waded in it up to her knees, nay, up to her neck. Under her feet were human heads. Above her, human hands flew like locusts. In her sensuous delight, she decorated herself with suspended heads and attached hands to her girdle. Her joy at the butchery is described in ever more sadistic language. Her liver swelled with laughter. Her heart was full of joy. The liver of Anath was full of exultation. As with all goddesses of this type, blood is dew and rain for the earth, which must drink blood in order to be fruitful. In Ashtaroth, we can also recognize the primordial image of the mistress of the sea. She is the earlier and more savage form of the sea goddess Aphrodite. 
And in one Egyptian fairy tale, the gods, threatened by the sea, bring the Syrian Astarte to Egypt so that she may be pacified by veneration. Not only are birth and death linked together in Canaanite mythology, but the original hermaphroditic form of the Euroboros reappears in the relation between the masculine morning star, Astar, or Attar, and the feminine evening star, the Ishtar of Mesopotamia. Androgyny in a deity is a primitive characteristic, and so too is the combination of virginity and fertility in goddesses, and of fertility and castration in gods. The masculine traits of the female still coexist side by side with the feminine traits of the male. If the goddess holds the lily, the feminine symbol, in one hand, and the snake, the masculine symbol, in the other, this is entirely in keeping with the fact that the eunuchs who serve her are male prostitutes, dancers, and priests. In Canaan, therefore, we find all the features of the canon which is determined by the Uroboric figure of the Great Mother and by the incomplete differentiation of the masculine principle. Cretomycenan culture is likewise a typical domain of the Great Mother. The same groups of symbolic and ritual characteristics recur as are to be met with in Egypt and in Canaan, in Phoenicia, Babylonia, Assyria, and in the Near Eastern cultures generally, among the Hittites as well as among the Indians. Aegean culture forms a link between Egypt and Libya on the one side and Greece and Asia Minor on the other. For us, it is of no consequence how the currents of culture flowed historically, because the purity of the archetypal figure is of far greater importance to our theme than the question of priority. We have to rely chiefly on pictorial representations of the Cretomycenan religion, for the texts are as yet undeciphered. But here again, the comparative interpretation of the symbols proves its value and leads us to the archetype of the Great Mother. Creto-Aegean culture is dominated by the figure of the Great Mother as a nature goddess. Originally, she was worshipped in caves, and her priests were women. She was mistress of the mountains and of wild animals. Snakes and underworld creatures were sacred to her, but birds, too, symbolized her presence. The dove especially was her attribute, and she still remained a dove goddess both as Aphrodite and as Mary, dove of the Holy Ghost. Her cult evidently dates back to the Stone Age, as is indicated by the fur garments that were worn in the ritual. Her great mother character is revealed in the dress of the goddess and of her priestesses, and in the women's costume generally, which left the breasts exposed. It is also evident in the numerous representations of animal mothers that have survived to our own day. The mythological meaning of these faience paintings of cows with calves and she-goats with kids is obviously connected with the myths that have been handed down to us from Greece via Crete. We have already mentioned that the youthful Zeus was the Cretan Zeus child who was suckled by a goat, cow, bitch, or sow these being the representatives of Gaia, the Earth Mother, in whose charge he was placed. Central to the great Cretan fertility cult is the bull, the male instrument of fertility, and also its victim. He is the chief protagonist in the hunts and festival games. His is the blood of the offerings. His head and horns are, besides the double axe, or labris, the sacred sacrificial implement, a typical symbol in Cretan shrines. This bull symbolizes the youthful god, sun-lover of the Great Mother, who, as the Europa of Greek mythology, reigned in Crete. She is the consort of the Cretan bull, in which form Zeus ravished her. Just as Eshmun emasculated himself with a labrys in order to escape from Astronoe, otherwise known as Astarte Aphrodite, so the Titans killed Zagreus Dionysus with a labrys. It is the instrument of sacramental castration, with which the bull, who later acted as a substitute for Dionysus, was sacrificed. Its Neolithic form is still preserved in the flint knives with which the Galli of Asia Minor unmanned themselves, 
and also in the flint knife attributed to Set. In later times, the sacrifice, castration, and dismemberment were no longer performed on a human victim, but on an animal. Boar, bull, and goat stand for the gods Dionysus, Zagreus, Osiris, Tammuz, etc. The decapitation of the bull subsequently replaced the sacrifice of the phallus, and in the same way his horns became phallic symbols. In Egypt, the head of the sacred Osiris Apis bull was not allowed to be eaten, but was thrown into the Nile. And this is consistent with the myth which relates that the phallus of Osiris disappeared in the Nile after his dismemberment. The connection between phallus and head is of the utmost significance in the mythological stages of conscious development. It is sufficient here to say that each can stand for the other, and that characteristically the bull's head symbolizes the human phallus. This substitution is the more understandable when one knows that the bull still appears as an archetypal sexuality and fertility symbol in modern dreams. There is plenty of support for our statement that in Crete, too, the fertility ritual was originally performed between the great mother and her son lover, and culminated in his sacrifice, but was subsequently replaced by the sacrifice of a bull. The individual details only acquire meaning when fitted into the picture as a whole, namely the archetypal dominance of the Great Mother. As everywhere, the Great Mother, goddess of Crete, the Demeter of the Greeks, is, as mistress of the underworld, also a goddess of death. The dead, named by Plutarch Demetroioi, are her property. Her earthly womb is the womb of death but yet it is the lap of fertility from which all life springs. The equation of Tammuz, Attis, Adonis, Eshmun, etc., with the Cretan Zeus, is further supported by the remark attributed to Theodore of Mopsuestia. The Cretans used to say of Zeus that he was a prince and was ripped up by a wild boar, and he was buried. The boar is a typical symbol of the doomed sun-lover and the killing of the boar is a mythological representation of his sacrifice to the Great Mother. On an Etruscan bronze relief, the Great Mother is depicted in her original form as Gorgo, strangling lions with both arms and spreading her legs wide in the attitude of ritual exhibitionism. The same fragment also shows the boar hunt as we know it in Cretan paintings, and in Greece at the time of the Cretan overlordship. The killing of the boar is the oldest symbol we know for the killing of the great mother's son-lover. Here, the goddess of fertility is a sow, and this is equally true of Isis, and later of Demeter in Eleusis. When the sow goddess is ousted by the cow, and Hathor Isis, for instance, appears instead of the porcine Isis, who was still associated with porcine Set, then the boar is likewise replaced by the bull. As we have seen, harvesting and tree felling are the equivalents of death, dismemberment, and castration in the fertility ritual. And in Crete, the breaking off of branches and fruit appeared to occupy an important place in the rites, together with an orgiastic sacred dance and a lamentation. The canon of the later Adonis festivals, for which the priests wore women's garments, is thus established. Furthermore, the ritual renewal of the Cretan kingship, which had to follow after every great year of eight years' duration, offers close parallels to the said festival of renewal among the Egyptians. Just as the renewal of kingship is to be interpreted as a late substitute for the original sacrifice of the annual king, so too in Crete we can follow the road leading from his castration and yearly death to the substitution of a human and eventually an animal victim, and last of all to the festival of renewal when the kingly power was ritually restored. The human sacrifices to the Minotaur, the bull king of Crete, which according to the Greek legend originally consisted in a tribute of seven youths and maidens, can probably be explained in this manner. Likewise, the passion evinced by Queen Pasiphae, mother of the Minotaur for the bull.
From Egypt, Africa, and Asia, and even from Scandinavia, the evidence accumulates that human sacrifice guaranteed and prolonged the king's strength. In Crete, as in Egypt, the rising patriarchate, with its concentration of power in the hands of the king and his nobles, evidently broke the sacred suzerainty of the mother goddess. In the process, the yearly kingship came to be replaced by one that had at first to prolong its life by combat, but later it became an unbroken kingship which sacralized its continuity by means of vicarious sacrifices and yearly rites of renewal and regeneration. We have shown that the Cretomycenan era of Great Mother Worship links up with Asia Minor, Libya, and Egypt, but its links with Greek myth and legendary history now appear in quite a new light. The historical accuracy of the myths proves itself yet again. Doubts as to their veracity derive from an age which had lost all knowledge of Aegean culture. Once more, Bachofen was the only one to have recognized with his myth-piercing eye the true content of Cretan culture from the historical records, even before the actual material of Aegean civilization had been unearthed. From Europa and her associations with the bull, with the Cretan and Dodonean Zeus, and with Dionysus, mythology derives the whole gloomy Cretan dynasty. Minos, Rhadamanthus, and Sarpedon. Her brother was Cadmus, whose history in Greece we have yet to trace. Both were children of Agenor, king of Phoenicia, who had among his ancestors Libya, daughter of Epaphus, and Io, his mother the wandering, milk-white moon-cow of Mycenae. In Egypt, Epaphus was worshipped as the bull Apis and Io as Isis. Libya, Egypt, Phoenicia, Crete, Mycenae, Greece, the historical connection between them is formulated as a genealogy. In the same way, we can recognize the symbolical and mythological sequence. The white moon-cow Mycenaean Io is the Egyptian Isis and the Cretan Europa, while associated with them are the Cretan Zeus Dionysus bull, the Egyptian bull Apis, and the Minotaur. Equally significant is the history of Cadmus, the legendary brother of Europa, who came from Phoenicia to found the city of Thebes. To him, Herodotus attributes the transmission of the Osiris Dionysus mysteries from Egypt to Pythagoras. In other words, Herodotus traces the origin of the late Greek mysteries and their Pythagorean and Orphic forerunners back to Egypt via Phoenicia. He also connects the Dodonaean Zeus, the Phallic Hermes, and the pre-Grecian or Pelasgian cult of the Kabiri at Samothrace with the Osiris of Egypt and the Ammon of Libya. Earlier, these connections were denied by science, but today they are obvious since the cultural continuity that extended from Libya and Egypt via Canaanite Phoenicia and Crete to Greece is supported by a wealth of factual evidence. Cadmus, founder of Thebes, is in league with Athene, but stands in an extremely ambivalent relationship to Aphrodite and her husband Ares. He slays the Chthonic dragon, son of Ares, but marries Harmonia, daughter of Ares and Aphrodite. The cow and the moon sickle who leads him from Delphi, founded by the Cretans, to the site where Thebes is to be built, and whom he there sacrifices, is the ancient mother and moon goddess of pre-Grecian days. She rules his life and that of his children, and proves more powerful than his helper Athene. It is the ancient cow goddess Aphrodite whose image breaks through in the daughters of Cadmus, and in them is manifested the terrible mythological power of the mother goddess. One of his daughters is Semele, mother of Dionysus, who remains a god-bearing goddess even though, as the mortal paramour of Zeus, she perishes in his lightning. The second daughter is Ino. In a fit of madness she throws herself into the sea together with her son Melisertes. Melisertes belongs to the cycle of sun-lover gods who are lost, slain, mourned, and worshipped with orgiastic rites. 
The third daughter is Agave, mother of Pentheus. She too is a terrible mother, for she kills and tears her son to pieces in the madness of the orgy and bears off his bloody head in triumph. Pentheus himself becomes Dionysus Zagreus, the dismembered god whom he tried to resist. The fourth daughter is Otanoe, mother of Actaeon, the young huntsman who unwittingly beheld the virginal Artemis in her nakedness and seized with terror, fled before her in the shape of a stag, only to be torn to pieces by his own hounds. Once more, animal transformation, dismemberment, and death. The virginal Artemis, goddess of the woods, is a pre-Grecian form of the terrible mother goddess, as is also the Artemis of Ephesus, Boetia, etc. Such are the daughters of Cadmus, and in all of them we see the dread sway of the terrible Aphrodite. Cadmus' only son is Polydorus, his grandson is Laius, and his great-grandson Oedipus. Even in the grandchild, the mother-son relationship leads to catastrophe. Only with him is this fatal bond between great mother and son lover finally broken. Europa and Cadmus form one tributary of the mythological stream that rises in Libya, Io, and reaches Greece via Phoenicia. The other tributary, also rising in Libya, leads to the Danaides and to Argos. Argos, an important area of Cretan culture in Greece, is associated in legend with Danaus, who introduced the cult of Apollo Lycaeus. According to Herodotus, his daughters, the Danaides, brought the feast of Demeter, the Thesmophoria, to Greece from Egypt. The Thesmophoria and its mysteries were a fertility festival, the central feature of which was a pit representing the womb of the earth mother. Into this womb pit, offerings were thrown, namely pine cones, the phalli of the tree sun, and live pigs, these being the offspring of the gravid earth mother, the sow. The pit was infested with snakes, the constant companions of the great mother, who are always associated with her gorgonesque womb. The noisome remains of the pigs were then fetched up again, and, in accordance with the age-old fertility rites, solemnly rent asunder and spread over the fields. Bakhoven has shown convincingly that the Danaides, by killing the bridegrooms whom they have been forced to accept, belong to the sphere of the emancipated virgin mother. Hypermnesta is the only one who, contrary to their mutual agreement, does not kill her husband, and with her the love relationship in mythology begins to be a matter for personal decision. Accordingly, she becomes the first mother of a line of heroes like Perseus and Heracles, who break the negative power of the Great Mother and establish a masculine culture. Both these belong to the type of hero fathered by a male deity and further assisted by Athene. The Perseus myth is the myth of the hero who conquers the symbol of matriarchal domination in the Libyan Gorgon, as Theseus does later in the case of the Minotaur. Thus, in Io's descendants, though not in this branch of mythology alone, the conflict between the patriarchal and the matriarchal world is represented as epic history and personalized as family history in the Greek hero myths. Unquestionably, the scientific study of history and religion today would be satisfied with a reduction to the ethnological groupings. But from a psychological standpoint, which has in mind the development of human consciousness, the supersession of the stage of the great mother and her son lover by a new mythological stage is not a fortuitous historical occurrence, but a necessary psychological one. To correlate the new stage with a definite race or national group is impossible, so far as we can see at present. For side by side with the overcoming of the mother archetype in the Greco-Indo-Germanic sphere of culture, stands its no less radical counterpart in the Hebraic-Semitic sphere. The conquest of the mother archetype has its proper place in the myth of the hero, and we shall be giving an account of it later. For the present, we have to examine more closely the stage of the great mother and her dominance over the son-lover.
The mythological and historical connection between the Cretan Aegean sphere and Greece is evident in other figures of Greek myth. Hecate, the dread goddess, is the mother of the man-eating Empusa, and the Lamias who suck the blood of young men and devour their flesh. But this triple-bodied, uroboric Hecate, mistress of the three realms, sky, earth, and underworld, is the teacher of Circe and Medea in the arts of magic and destruction. To her is attributed the power to enchant and change men into animals, and to smite with madness, which gift belongs to her as to all moon goddesses. The mysteries of the Great Mother were celebrated by women, peaceably enough in Eleusis, but in a sanguinary manner in the cult of Dionysus, and the orgiastic rending of goat and bull with the eating of the bloody fragments as a symbolic act of fertilization extends from Osiris to Dionysus Zagreus and Orpheus, Pentheus, and Actium. As the Orphic saying has it, the victim must be torn asunder and devoured. The mother goddess is the mistress of wild animals, whether she appears as Tauropolis, the bull grappler, in Crete and in Asia Minor, strangler of snakes, birds, and lions, or as Circe, who enslaves the men she has changed into beasts. That the worship of the earth and death goddess is often associated with swampy districts has been interpreted by Bachofen as symbolic of the dank level of existence on which, uroborically speaking, the dragon lives, devouring her progeny as soon as she has produced them. War, flagellation, blood offerings, and hunting are but the milder forms of her worship. The great mother in this character is not found only in prehistoric times. She rules over the Eleusinian mysteries of a later day and Euripides still knows Demeter as the wrathful goddess riding in a chariot drawn by lions to the accompaniment of bacchic rattles, drums, cymbals, and flutes. She is shadowy enough to stand very near to the Asiatic Artemis and Sibylle, and also to the Egyptian goddesses. Artemis Orthia of Sparta required human sacrifices and the whipping of boys— Human sacrifices were likewise required by the Taurian Artemis, and the Alphaic Artemis was worshipped by women with nocturnal dancing, for which they smeared their faces with mud. No barbaric goddesses are here being adored with sensual and Asiatic practices. All these things are merely the deeper-lying strata of great mother worship. She is the goddess of love having power over the fruitfulness of earth, men, cattle, and crops. She also presides over all birth, and is thus at one and the same time goddess of destiny, wisdom, death, and the underworld. Everywhere her rites are frenzied and orgiastic. As mistress of wild animals, she rules all male creatures, who in the form of the bull and the lion bear aloft her throne. There are numerous representations of these goddesses displaying their genitals in ritual exhibitionism, both in India and in Canaan, as, for instance, the Egyptian Isis or the Demeter and Baobo of the Greeks. The naked goddess who slumbers on the ground and abandons herself to love is an early version of the Great Mother, and still earlier versions are to be seen in the monstrous female idols of Neolithic times. Her attribute is the pig, a highly prolific animal, and upon it, or upon a basket, a female symbol like the cornucopia, the goddess sits with splayed legs, even in the supreme mystery of Eleusis. The pig, as a primitive emblem of the Great Mother, occurs not only as a fertility symbol, but is also to be found in the very earliest phase as a cosmic projection. The heretical image of the sky woman as a sow, which shows the star children going into her mouth in the manner of a sow eating her young, is to be found in a linguistically very early dramatic text preserved in the false tomb of Seti I, in the temple of Osiris at Abydos. Isis, like Nut the Korikosmu, appears as a white sow, and the head of the old god Set has been interpreted as that of a pig. 
In Troy, Schliemann found the figure of a pig dotted with stars, evidently representing the sky woman as a sow, and the cult of the sow as a mother goddess has left numerous traces. Probably the most primitive and most ancient of the pig associations is with the female genitals, which even in Greek and Latin were called pig, though the association can be traced back still further in the primitive name for the cowrie shell. The image of Isis sitting with wide open legs on a pig carries the line via Crete and Asia Minor to Greece. Speaking of Crete, where King Minos was suckled by a sow, Farnal says, The Cretans consider this animal sacred and will not taste of its flesh, and the men of Presos perform secret rites with the sow, making her the first offering of the sacrifice. The fact that the Syrians of Hierapolis could, in Lucian's day, discuss the sanctity or non-sanctity of the pig is merely a sign of ignorance and decadence. Its sanctity is attested not only by the bas-relief of the mother sow that was found at Byblos, and probably belongs to the Adonis cult, but even more by the Phoenician custom of not eating pork and of sacrificing pigs at the anniversary of the death of Adonis. Fraser has demonstrated the identity of Attis, Adonis, and Osiris, and their identification with the pig. Wherever the eating of pork is forbidden and the pig is held to be unclean, we may be sure of its originally sacred character. The association of pigs with fertility and sexual symbolism lingers on into our own day, where sexual matters are still negatively described as swinishness. Karenyi has drawn attention to the connection of the pig as the uterine animal of the earth with Demeter and Eleusis. It is important to remember that when Eleusis was permitted to make its own coinage, the pig was chosen as a symbol of the mysteries. The great feast of Aphrodite at Argos, when women appeared as men and men as women wearing veils, was called the hysteria, after the pig sacrifices associated with it. In the celebration of these anniversaries, the priestesses of Aphrodite worked themselves up into a wild state of frenzy, and the term hysteria became identified with a state of emotional derangement associated with such orgies. The word hysteria was used in the same sense as aphrodisia, that is, as a synonym for the festivals of the goddess. We might also mention that it is Aphrodite in her original character of Great Mother who sends the Aphrodisia mania. Not only does this emphasize the connection of the Great Mother archetype with sexuality and hysteria, but it is even more significant that the hermaphroditic festival, with its interchange of sex and clothing, was called the Hybristica. The repudiation of the hybrid, uboric state by patriarchal Greece is characteristically expressed in this designation, which is conjectured to be cognate with hybris, wantonness, outrage. The pig, then, symbolizes the female, the fruitful and receptive womb. As the uterine animal, it belongs to the earth, the gaping pit, which, in the Thesmophoria, is fertilized by pig sacrifices. Among the symbols of the devouring chasm, we must count the womb in its frightening aspect, the numinous heads of the gorgon and the medusa, the woman with beard and phallus, and the male-eating spider. The open womb is the devouring symbol of the Uroboric mother, especially when connected with phallic symbols. The gnashing mouth of the medusa, with its boar's tusks, betrays these features most plainly while the protruding tongue is obviously connected with a phallus. The snapping, that is to say, castrating womb, appears as the jaws of hell, and the serpents writhing around the Medusa's head are not personalistic, pubic hairs, but aggressive phallic elements characterizing the fearful aspect of the uroboric womb. The spider can be classified among this group of symbols not only because it devours the male after coitus, but because it symbolizes the female in general, who spreads nets for the unwary male. This dangerous aspect is much enhanced 
by the element of weaving, as we find it in the weird sisters who spin the thread of life, or the Norns who weave the web of the world in which every man born of woman is entangled. Finally, we come to the veil of Maya, denounced by male and female alike as illusion, the engulfing void, Pandora's box. Wherever the harmful character of the Great Mother predominates or is equal to her positive and creative side, and wherever her destructive side, the phallic element, appears together with her fruitful womb, the Ouroboros is still operative in the background. In all these cases, the adolescent stage of the ego has not been overcome, nor has the ego yet made itself independent of the unconscious. Chapter 2 Continued Relations Between Son Lover and Great Mother We can distinguish several stages in the youthful lover's relation to the Great Mother. The earliest is marked by a natural surrender to fate, to the power of the mother or Ouroboros. At this stage, suffering and sorrow remain anonymous. The young flower-like gods of vegetation, doomed to die, are still close to the stage of the sacrificed child. Implicit in this stage is the pious hope of the natural creature that he, like nature, will be reborn through the Great Mother out of the fullness of her grace, with no activity or merit on his part. It is the stage of complete impotence against the Uroboric mother and the overwhelming power of fate, as we still find it in Greek tragedy, and particularly in the figure of Oedipus. Masculinity and consciousness have not yet won to independence, and Uroboric incest has given way to the matriarchal incest of adolescence. The death ecstasy of sexual incest is symptomatic of an adolescent ego not yet strong enough to resist the forces symbolized by the Great Mother. The transition to the next stage is formed by the strugglers. In them, fear of the Great Mother is the first sign of centroversion, self-formation, and ego stability. The fear expresses itself in various forms of flight and resistance. The primary expression of flight, which is still completely under the dominance of the Great Mother, is self-castration and suicide, Attis, Eshmun, Bata, etc. Here the attitude of defiance, the refusal to love, leads nevertheless to the very thing the terrible Mother wants, namely the offering of the phallus, though the offering is made in a negative sense. The youths who flee in terror and madness from the demands of the Great Mother betray in the act of self-castration their abiding fixation to the central symbol of the Great Mother cult, the phallus. And this they offer up to her, albeit with denial in their consciousness and a protesting ego. This turning away from the Great Mother as an expression of centroversion can clearly be seen in the figures of Narcissus, Pentheus, and Hippolytus. All three resist the fiery loves of the great goddesses, but are punished by them or by their representatives. In the case of Narcissus, who rejects love and then becomes fatally infatuated with his own reflection, the turning toward oneself and away from the all-consuming object with its importunate demands is obvious enough but it is not sufficient to give exclusive predominance to this accentuation and love of one's own body. The tendency of an ego consciousness that is becoming aware of itself, the tendency of all self-consciousness, all reflection, to see itself as in a mirror, is a necessary and essential feature at this stage. Self-formation and self-realization begin in earnest when human consciousness develops into self-consciousness. Self-reflection is as characteristic of the pubertal phase of humanity as it is of the pubertal phase of the individual. It is a necessary phase of human knowledge, and it is only persistence in this phase that has fatal effects. The breaking of the great mother fixation through self-reflection is not a symbol of autoeroticism, but of centroversion. 
The nymphs, who vainly pursue Narcissus with their love, are simply aphrodisiac forces in personalized form, and to resist them is equivalent to resisting the Great Mother. Elsewhere, we shall examine the significance of the fragmentation of archetypes for the development of consciousness. In the Greek myths, we can see how this fragmentation proceeds. The terrible aspect of the Great Mother is almost wholly repressed, and only fleeting glimpses of it can be caught behind the seductive figure of Aphrodite. And Aphrodite herself no longer appears in her suprapersonal majesty. She is split up and personalized in the form of nymphs, sirens, water sprites, and dryads, or else she appears as the mother, stepmother, or the beloved, as Helen or Phaedra. This is not to say that the process always follows a perfectly clear course in the history of religion. Our starting point is the archetype and its relation to consciousness. Chronologically, however, nymphs, that is, partial aspects of the archetype, can appear just as easily before the historical worship of the mother archetype as afterwards. Structurally, they remain partial aspects of the archetype and are psychic fragmentations of it, even though the historian can point to a nymph cult that is antecedent to the cult of the great mother. In the collective unconscious, all archetypes are contemporaneous and exist side by side. Only with the development of consciousness do we come to a graduated hierarchy within the collective unconscious itself. Narcissus, seduced by his own reflection, is really a victim of Aphrodite, the great mother. He succumbs to her fatal law. His ego system is overpowered by the terrible instinctive force of love over which she presides. The fact that she borrows his reflection to effect the seduction only makes her the more treacherous. Pentheus is another of these strugglers who cannot successfully accomplish the heroic act of liberation. Although his struggles are directed against Dionysus, the fate meted out to him for his sins shows that his true enemy is the Great Mother. The Dionysus has affinities with the orgiastic worship of the Great Mother and with her son-lovers Osiris, Adonis, Tammuz, etc., is well known. We cannot go into the problematical figure of Semele, the mother of Dionysus, but Bachhofen correlates Dionysus with the Great Mother, and modern research confirms him in this. Dionysus was worshipped at Delphi as the infant or Cupid in the winnowing basket. His is a chthonic cult with a moon goddess Semele as Earth Mother. Since he originated in Thrace and settled in Asia Minor, there becoming merged with a Magna Mater cult, it is probable that a widespread primordial cult pertaining to the original pre-Grecian religion lives on in him. The heroic king Pentheus, so proud of his rationality, tries, with the help of his mother, next of kin to Dionysus, to oppose the orgies, but both are overwhelmed by the Dionysian frenzy. He suffers the fate of all the great mother's victims. Seized by madness, he dons women's clothing and joins in the orgies, whereupon his mother, raving mad, mistakes him for a lion and tears him to pieces. She then carries home his gory head in triumph, a reminder of the original act of castration which attended the dismemberment of the corpse. In this way, his mother, against the dictates of her conscious mind, turns into the great mother, while the son, despite the resistance put up by his ego, becomes her son-lover. Madness, the change into women's clothing and then into an animal, Dismemberment and castration, the whole archetypal destiny is here fulfilled. Pentheus, hiding in the top of a pine tree, becomes Dionysus Attis, and his mother, the Magna Mater. The figure of Hippolytus takes its place alongside that of Pentheus and Narcissus. From love of Artemis, from chastity and love of his own self, he scorns Aphrodite by scorning the love of his stepmother Phaedra and on the orders of his father, and with the help of the god Poseidon, he is dragged to death by his own horses. 
We cannot here enter into the deeper conflict which rages in Hippolytus between love for his mother, queen of the Amazons, and for his stepmother, sister of Ariadne, and which accounts for his resistance to Phaedra and his devotion to Artemis. We shall only give a brief analysis of the myth so far as is relevant to our theme. Because of secondary personalization, the myth as dramatized by Euripides has become a personal fate overlaid with personalistic detail, but it is still transparent enough to be interpreted back to its origins. The scorned Aphrodite and the scorned stepmother go together. They represent the great mother who amorously pursues the son and kills him when he resists. Hippolytus is bound to the virgin Artemis, not to the original mother virgin, but Artemis as a spiritual figure, the girlfriend who resembles Athene. Hippolytus himself is at the stage of critical resistance to the great mother, already conscious of himself as a young man struggling for autonomy and independence. This is evident from his repudiation of the great mother's advances and of her phallic, orgiistic sexuality. His chastity, however, means far more than a rejection of sex. It signifies the coming to consciousness of the higher masculinity as opposed to the lower phallic variety. On the subjective level, it is a conscious realization of the solar masculinity which Bachhofen contrasts with chthonic masculinity. This higher masculinity is correlated with light, the sun, the eye, and consciousness. Hippolytus' love for Artemis and for the chastity of nature is negatively characterized by his father as virtuous pride and self-adoration. It is quite in keeping with these traits that Hippolytus belongs to what we would call a youth society. We shall concern ourselves later with the strengthening of the masculine principle through male friendships, and also with the significance of the spiritual sister for the development of masculine consciousness. In Hippolytus, however, the defiance of youth ends in tragedy. Interpreted personalistically, this means that Aphrodite takes her revenge— the slanderous accusations of the stepmother he has scorned are believed by his father Theseus. She kills herself, and the father curses his son. Mechanically, Poseidon must grant the wish he gave Theseus and put Hippolytus to death. This rather senseless story of an Aphrodite intrigue, not in the least tragic to our way of thinking, is seen to have a very different content when psychologically interpreted. No more than Oedipus could hold out against heroic incest with his mother can Hippolytus keep up an attitude of defiance. The power of the great mother, the madness of love sent by Aphrodite, is stronger than his conscious ego resistance. He is dragged by his own horses, that is to say he falls victim to the world of his instincts of whose subjugation he was so proud. The horses, characteristically enough they are mares, fulfill the deadly will of Aphrodite. When one knows how the great mother wreaks her vengeance in the myths, one can see the story in its proper setting. The self-mutilation and suicide of Attis, Eshmoon, and Bata. Narcissus dying of self-attraction. Actaeon, like so many other youths, changed into an animal and torn to pieces. All this hangs together and whether it be Aethon burning in the fires of his own passion, or Daphnis languishing in insatiable desire because he does not love the girl Aphrodite sends him, whether we interpret the dragging to death of Hippolytus as madness, love, or retribution, in every case the central fact is the vengeance of the great mother, the overpowering of the ego by subterranean forces. Characteristically, too, Poseidon, even if only indirectly, is an instrument in the hand of Aphrodite, behind whose loveliness lurks the terrible mother. It is Poseidon who sends the monstrous bull from the sea, which drives the horses of Hippolytus mad and makes them drag their master. Once again we encounter the phallic figure of the earth-shaker and lord of the deep, companion of the great mother. 
Aphrodite seeks vengeance because Hippolytus, in the growing pride of ego consciousness, despises her and declares that she is the lowest among the heavenly ones. We have already met this development in the plaint of Gilgamesh against Ishtar. But in contrast to the figure of Hippolytus, a very negative hero, Gilgamesh, with his more powerfully developed masculinity, is a real hero. Supported by his friend Engidu, he lives the hero's life completely detached from the Great Mother, whereas Hippolytus remains unconsciously bound to her, although he defies and denies her with his conscious mind. The youth struggling for self-consciousness now begins, insofar as he is an individual, to have a personal fate, and for him the Great Mother becomes the deadly and unfaithful mother. She selects one young man after another to love and destroy. In this way she becomes the harlot, the sacred prostitute, which is what the Great Mother really is, as the vessel of fertility, takes on the negative character of the fickle jade and destroyer. With this, the great revaluation of the feminine begins, its conversion into the negative, thereafter carried to extremes in the patriarchal religions of the West. The growth of self-consciousness and the strengthening of masculinity thrust the image of the Great Mother into the background. The patriarchal society splits it up, and while only the picture of the Good Mother is retained in consciousness, her terrible aspect is relegated to the unconscious. The result of this fragmentation is that it is no longer the Great Mother who is the killer, but a hostile animal, for instance, a boar or bear, with a lamenting figure of the Good Mother ranged alongside. Bachhofen has shown that the bear is a mother symbol, and he has stressed its identity with Sibylle. We know today that the bear as a mother symbol belongs to the common stock of archetypes and is to be found in Europe and Asia equally. Bachhofen has also shown that the later substitution of the lion for the bear coincides with the supersession of the mother cult by the father cult. The circle is completed by Winkler's evidence that in astrology the sun god sets in the constellation of the great bear also called the boar. Since astrological images are projections of psychic images, we find the same connections here as in mythology. Later developments, therefore, the figure of the Great Mother splits into a negative half represented by an animal and a positive half having human form. Attis and the Cretan Zeus are both killed by a boar, a variant of the castration motif which is also linked with the taboo on the eating of pork in the Attis cult and with the swine figure of the Great Mother. The father's significance of the boar as an avenger sent by a jealous father deity is a late importation. The father plays no role at this stage of the young god doomed to die. Indeed, the divine youth is, without knowing it, his own father in another form. There is as yet no paternal progenitor other than the son himself. The reign of the maternal Ouroboros is characterized by the fact that the masculine features, later attributed to the father, are still integral parts of the Ouroboric nature of the great mother. The solitary tooth of the Graie and the other obviously masculine elements associated with weird sisters, hags, and witches might be mentioned here. Just as beard and phallus are parts of her androgynous nature, so she is the sow that farrows and the boar that kills. The emergence of the male killer in the cycle of great mother myths is an evolutionary advance, for it means that the son has gained a greater measure of independence. To begin with, the boar is part of the Ouroboros, but in the end he becomes part of the son himself. The boar is then the equivalent of the self-destruction which the myth represents as self-castration. No paternal character attaches as yet to the male killer. He is merely a symbol of the destructive tendency which turns against itself in the act of self-sacrifice. This dichotomy can be seen in the motif of the hostile twin brothers, the archetype of self-division. Fraser and Jeremias have both amply proved that the hero and the beast that kills him are very often identical, 
though they offer no explanation of this fact. The motif of hostile twin brothers belongs to the symbolism of the Great Mother. It appears when the male attends to self-consciousness by dividing himself into two opposing elements, one destructive and the other creative. The stage of the strugglers marks the separation of the conscious ego from the unconscious, but the ego was not yet stable enough to push on to the separation of the first parents and the victorious struggle of the hero. As we have emphasized, centroversion manifests itself negatively at first, in the guise of fear, flight, defiance, and resistance. This negative attitude of the ego, however, is not yet directed against the object, the Great Mother, as it is with a hero, but turns against itself in self-destruction, self-mutilation, and suicide. In the myth of Narcissus, the ego, seeking to break the power of the unconscious through self-reflection, succumbs to a catastrophic self-love. His suicidal death, by drowning, symbolizes the dissolution of ego consciousness. And the same thing is repeated in modern times in young suicides like Weiniger and Seidel. Seidel's book, Bewusstsein als Verhängnis, and the work of the misogynist Weininger bear the clear imprint of having been written by lovers of the Great Mother. They are fatally fascinated by her, and even in the futile resistance they put up, they are fulfilling their archetypal fate. The archetypal situation of the struggling and reluctant lover plays an important part in the psychology of suicide among modern neurotics, and also has a legitimate place in the psychology of puberty, of which the strugglers are the archetypal representatives. The negation, the self-denial, the Weltschmerz, the accumulated suicidal leanings of this period are all appropriate here, and so is the fascination, at once enticing and dangerous, which emanates from the female. The close of puberty is marked by the successful flight of the hero, as the rites of initiation testify. The youths who die by their own hand in puberty represent all those who succumb to the dangers of this fight, who cannot make the grade and perish in the trials of initiation, which still take place today, as always, but in the unconscious. Their self-destruction and tragic self-division are nevertheless heroic. The strugglers might be described as negative, doomed heroes, the male killer at work behind the destructive tendency is still, although the ego does not know it, the instrument of the Great Mother, and the boar that kills Adonis is, as it were, the gorgon's tusk become independent. But for all that, an ego that kills itself is more active, more independent and individual than the sad resignation of the languishing lover. In the separation of the male antagonist from the male-female Ouroboros, and in the splitting of the Great Mother into a good mother and her destructive male consort, we can already discern a certain differentiation of consciousness and a breaking down of the archetype. This separation and the consequent emergence of the twin-brother conflict mark an important stage on the way to the final dissolution of the Ouroboros, separation of the world parents and consolidation of ego consciousness. Once again, let us consider the primordial mythological images that portray this event. Just as the motif of the twins is a determining factor in the Egyptian myth of Osiris and Set, and plays an equally decisive part in Canaanite mythology, where it appears as the struggle between Baal and Mot, Reshep and Shalman, so we find it, with personalistic variations, in the Bible story of Jacob and Esau, and in the Jewish legends. It is interesting to note that there actually exists a pictorial representation of this group of symbols to which Albright has drawn attention. A cult stand of about the 12th century BC from Beth Shan, Palestine, shows a remarkable tableau in relief. A nude goddess holds two doves in her arms, as she sits with legs apart to show her sex. Below her are two male deities with arms interlocked in a struggle, with a dove at the feet of one of them, toward them from below 
creeps a serpent, and from one side advances a lion. The struggle between snake and lion, a life-and-death struggle, has also been preserved in the much later Mithraism, and the meaning is the same. This religion, being patriarchal, introduced certain variations, but in the cult images of the bull sacrifice we find below the bull the same two animals, snake and lion, symbolizing night and day, heaven and earth. The whole is flanked by the representatives of life and death, two youths with torches, one upraised, the other lowered. The womb of the Great Mother, in which the opposites were originally contained, appears here only in symbolic form, as the crater, guarantor of rebirth, and the two animals are shown hastening toward it. A masculine religion like Mithraism no longer tolerated direct representation of a female deity. Unfortunately, we cannot, in the present context, show how the archetypes are as operative today in the unconscious as they ever were in the projections of mythology. We should only note that the primordial image from Beth Shan unconsciously crops up in the work of a modern writer, Robert Louis Stevenson, where it still retains the meaning it had thousands of years ago. In his Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a recapitulation in modern personalistic form of the mythological struggle between the twin brothers Set and Osiris, Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll makes the following entry in his diary. The passage forms the theme of the whole story. It was the curse of mankind that these incongruous faggots were thus bound together that in the agonized womb of consciousness these polar twins should be continuously struggling, how then were they dissociated? Up to the present, the last conscious realization of this psychological problem is to be found in the psychoanalysis of Freud, who postulated the opposition of a life instinct and a death instinct in the unconscious. The problem also reappears as the principle of opposites in Jung's analytical psychology. Here, then, we have the same psychic archetype, the twin brothers locked in a life-and-death struggle in the womb of the Great Mother, as a myth, a pictorial image, a theme in a short story, and a psychological concept. We shall sum up the significance of this problem for the development of masculinity when we come to examine the difference between the terrible male and the terrible father. Here we can only say that, as a consequence of the males no longer being confronted with the superior power of the great mother, but with another male hostile to him, a conflict situation develops in which self-defense becomes possible for the first time. This psychological development corresponds to a change in the original fertility ritual that forms the background of these myths. In the beginning, the young fertility king was killed, his corpse cut up and spread over the fields, and his phallus was mummified as a guarantee of the next year's crops. Whether the female representative of the earth goddess was sacrificed at the same time is questionable. But in the beginning she probably was. With the rise of the mother deity, however, her representative, the Earth Queen, remained alive in order to celebrate her annual marriage with a young king. In later times, the sacrifice seems to have been replaced by a combat. The annual king consolidated his position and was permitted to fight for his life in combat with the next claimant. If defeated, he was sacrificed as the old year. If victorious, then his opponent died in his stead. Later, when the matriarchate changed into a patriarchate, a rite of renewal was celebrated annually or at set intervals, and the king was kept alive because the vicarious human or animal sacrifices at the feast, which was known in Egypt as the erection of the venerable Jed, rendered his death unnecessary. The development thus runs parallel to that which originally took place with the queen goddess. We shall see the final stage of the struggle between ego consciousness and the unconscious, when at a later phase of development the female is excluded by the patriarchate as a mere vessel, 
and the male, by reproducing himself, becomes the agent of his own rebirth. During the transition stage, however, the regenerative force, the creative magic of the mother, continues to exist side by side with a masculine principle. It makes whole and new, reduces the broken pieces to unity, gives new form and new life to the corruptible, and leads beyond death. But the nucleus of masculine personality remains unaffected by the regenerative force of the mother. It does not perish, seeming to have foreknowledge of rebirth. It is as though some remnant akin to the little loose bone of Jewish legend could not be destroyed by death and harbored in itself the power to effect its own resurrection. In contrast to the deadly Uroboric incest, where the embryonic ego dissolves like salt in water, the fortified ego launches forth into a life beyond death. Although this life is bestowed by the mother, it is at the same time mysteriously conditioned by the residual ego nucleus. As one of the hymns of the Rig Veda says, Creep into the earth, the mother, into the broad, roomy, most holy earth. Soft as wool is the earth to the wise. May she guard thee on the next lap of the journey. Arch thy broad back, press not downwards. Open thyself easily, let him in lightly. As a mother her son with a hem of her garment, so cover him over, O earth. Death is not the end, but a crossing over. It is a fallow period, but also the refuge afforded by the mother. The dying ego does not rejoice when it finds itself back again in the mother and no longer in existence. It shoots its life will beyond death and passes through it into the next lap of the journey, into the new. This development where death is not the predestined end and the mortality of the individual not the only aspect of life is, however, no longer accomplished in the old setting that is to say, in the relation of the youthful lover to the great mother. The masculine principle is now strong enough to have reached consciousness of itself. Ego consciousness is no longer the satellite son of the maternal Ouroboros chained to the almighty unconscious, but has become truly independent and capable of standing alone. With this, we reach the next stage in the evolution of consciousness, namely the separation of the world parents or the principle of opposites. Chapter 3. The Separation of the World Parents, the Principle of Opposites Rangi and Papa, the heaven and the earth, were regarded as the source from which all things, gods and men, originated. There was darkness, for these two still clung together, not yet having been rent apart, and the children begotten by them were ever thinking what the difference between darkness and light might be. They knew that beings had multiplied and increased, and yet light had never broken upon them, but ever darkness continued. Hence these sayings were found in the old Karakya. There was darkness from the first division of time to the tenth to the hundredth, to the thousandth, that is, for a vast space of time. And each of these divisions of time was regarded as a being, and each was termed Po, and it was because of them that there was yet no bright world of light, but darkness only for the beings which then existed. At last, worn out with the oppression of darkness, the beings begotten by Rangi and Papa consulted among themselves, saying, Let us determine what we shall do with Rangi and Papa, whether it would be better to slay them or to rend them apart. Then spoke Tu Matuenga, the fiercest of the sons of Rangi and Papa, It is well, let us slay them. Then spoke Tane Mahuta, the father of forests and of all things inhabiting the forests, or that are constructed of trees, nay, not so. It is better to rend them apart, and to let Rangi stand far above us, and Papa lie beneath our feet. 
Let Rangi become as a stranger to us, but the earth remain close to us as a nursing mother. To this proposal the brothers consented, with the exception of Tao Hirimatea, the father of winds and storms, and he, fearing that his kingdom was about to be overthrown, grieved at the thought of the parents being torn apart. Hence, also, these sayings of old are found in the Karakea, the Po, the Po, the light, the light, the seeking, the searching, in chaos, in chaos. These signifying how the offspring of Rangi and Papa sought for some way of dealing with their parents so that human beings might increase and live. So also the saying, the multitude, the length, signifying the multitude of their thoughts and the length of time they considered. Their plans having been agreed to, Ranga Matane, the god and father of cultivated food, arose that he might rend Rangi and Papa. He struggled, but he did not rend them apart. Next, Tangaroa, the god of fish and reptiles, arose, that he might rend apart Rangi and Papa. He also struggled, but he did not rend them apart. Next, Haumia Tikitiki, the god and father of food that springs without cultivation, arose and struggled, but quite ineffectually. Then Tu Matuenga, the god and father of fierce human beings, arose and struggled, but he too struggled ineffectually. Then, at last, Tane Mahuta, the god and father of forests, of birds, and of insects, arose and struggled with his parents. In vain, with hands and arms, he strove to rend them apart. He paused. Firmly he planted his head on his mother Papa, the earth, and his feet he raised up against his father, Rangi, the sky. He strained his back and his limbs in a mighty effort. Now were rent apart, Rangi and Papa, and with reproaches and groans of woe, they cried aloud, Wherefore do you thus slay your parents? Why commit so dark a crime as to slay us, to render us your parents apart? But Tane Mahuta paused not. He regarded not their cries and their groans. Far, far beneath him he pressed down Papa the earth. Far, far above him he thrust up Rangi the sky. Hence the saying of old time, It was the fiercest thrusting of Tane which tore the heaven from the earth, so that they were rent apart, and darkness was made manifest, and light made manifest also. This Maori creation myth contains all the elements of the stage in the evolution of human consciousness which follows that of Uruboric dominance. The separation of the world parents, the splitting off of opposites from unity, the creation of heaven and earth above and below, day and night, light and darkness, the deed that is a monstrous misdeed and a sin, all the features that occur in isolation and numerous other myths are here molded into a unity. Speaking of this separation of the world parents, Fraser says, It is a common belief of primitive peoples that sky and earth were originally joined together, the sky either lying flat on the earth or being raised so little above it that there was not room between them for people to walk upright. Where such beliefs prevail, the present elevation of the sky above the earth is often ascribed to the might of some god or hero who gave the firmament such a shove that it shot up and has remained up above ever since. Elsewhere, Fraser interprets the castration of the primordial father as the separation of the world parents. In this, we see a reference to the original Uroboric situation where heaven and earth are known as the two mothers. Again and again, we come back to the basic symbol, light, which is central to the creation myths. This light, the symbol of consciousness and illumination, is a prime object of the cosmogonies of all peoples. Accordingly, in the creation legends of nearly all peoples and religions, the process of creation merges with the coming of the light. As the Maori text says, the light, the light, the seeking, the searching, in chaos, 
in chaos. Only in the light of consciousness can man know, and this act of cognition, of conscious discrimination, sunders the world into opposites, for experience of the world is only possible through opposites. Once more we must emphasize that the symbolism of the myths, which helps us to understand the corresponding human stages, is not philosophy or speculation. The work of art also, the dream in all its meaningfulness, rises up in the same way from the depths of the psyche and yields its meaning to the discerning interpreter, though often enough it is not grasped spontaneously by the artist or dreamer himself. Similarly, the mythical form of expression is a naive demonstration of the psychic processes going on in humanity although humanity itself may experience and transmit the myth as something entirely different. We know that in all probability, a ritual, that is to say some ceremony or course of action, always precedes the formulation of the myth. And it is obvious that action must come before knowledge, the unconscious deed before the spoken content. Our formulations are therefore abstract summaries, Otherwise, we could not hope to survey the diversity of the material before us, and not statements such as primitive man could have made consciously about himself. Not until we have familiarized ourselves with the dominant images which direct the course of human development shall we be able to understand the variants and sidelines which cluster round the main track. Consciousness equals deliverance. That is the watchword inscribed above all man's efforts to deliver himself from the embrace of the primordial Uroboric dragon. Once the ego sets itself up as center and establishes itself in its own right as ego consciousness, the original situation is forcibly broken down. We can see what this self-identification with a waking human personality with the ego really means only when we remember the contrasted state of participation mystique ruled by Uroboric unconsciousness. Trite as it seems to us, the logical statement of identity, I am I, the fundamental statement of consciousness, is in reality a tremendous achievement. This act, whereby an ego is posited, and the personality identified with that ego however fallacious that identification may later prove to be, alone creates the possibility of a self-orienting consciousness. In this connection, we would again quote that passage from the Upanishads. In the beginning, this world was soul, Atman, alone, in the form of a person. Looking around, he saw nothing else than himself. He said first, I am. He was indeed as large as a woman and a man closely embraced. He caused that self to fall, pat, into two pieces. Therefrom arose a husband, Pati, and a wife, Patni. If, as we saw earlier, existence in the Ouroboros was existence in participation mystique, this also means that no ego center had as yet developed to relate the world to itself and itself to the world. Instead, man was all things at once, and his capacity for change was well-nigh universal. He was at one and the same time part of his group, a red cockatoo, and an embodied ancestral spirit. Everything inside was outside. That is to say, all his ideas came to him from outside as commands from a spirit or magician or medicine bird but also everything outside was inside. Between the hunted animal and the will of the hunter, there existed a magical, mystical rapport, just as it existed between the healing of the wound and the weapon that made it, since the wound deteriorated if the weapon were heated. This lack of differentiation was precisely what constituted the weakness and defenselessness of the ego which in its turn reinforced the participation. Thus, in the beginning, everything was double and had a double meaning, as we have seen from the intermingling of male and female, good and bad, in the Ouroboros. But life in the Ouroboros meant being linked at the same time, at the deepest level, 
with the unconscious and with nature, between which there subsisted a fluid continuum that coursed through man like a current of life. He was caught up in this circuit flowing from the unconscious to the world and from the world back to the unconscious, and its tidal motion buffeted him to and fro in the alternating rhythm of life to which he was exposed without knowing it. Differentiation of the ego, separation of the world parents, and dismemberment of the primordial dragon set man free as a son and exposed him to the light, and only then is he born as a personality with a stable ego. In man's original world picture, world unity was unimpaired. The Ouroboros was alive in everything. Everything was pregnant with meaning, or could at least become so. In this world continuum, single patches of life became visible here and there through their ever-changing capacity to evoke wonder and impress themselves as mana-charged contents. This impressionability was universal. That is to say, every part of the world was capable of making an impression. Everything was potentially holy, or, more accurately speaking, could turn out to be astonishing and thus charged with mana. The world begins only with the coming of light, which constellates the opposition between heaven and earth as the basic symbol of all other opposites. Before that, there reigns the illimitable darkness, as is said in the Maori myth. With the rising of the sun, or, in the language of ancient Egypt, the creation of the firmament, which divides the upper from the lower, mankind's day begins, and the universe becomes visible with all its contents. In relation to man and his ego, the creation of light and the birth of the sun are bound up with the separation of the world parents and the positive and negative consequences which ensue for the hero who separates them. There are, however, other accounts of the creation as an unrelated cosmic phenomenon, a stage in the evolution of the world itself. But even in the version we shall now quote, taken from the Upanishads, we can see the personal agency at work behind the evolutionary process, though in this text it is not accentuated. The sun is Brahma. This is the teaching. Here is the explanation. In the beginning, this world was non-being. This non-being became being. It developed. It turned into an egg. It lay there for a year. It burst asunder. One part of the eggshell was of silver. The other part was of gold. The silver part is the earth. The golden part is the sky. What was born of it is yonder sun. When it was born, there were shouts and hurrahs. All beings and all desires rose up to greet it. Therefore, at its rising and at its every return, there are shouts and hurrahs. All beings and all desires rise up to greet it. Kassira has shown, with ample supporting material, how the opposition between light and darkness has informed the spiritual world of all peoples and molded it into shape. The sacred world order and the sacred space, precinct or sanctuary, were oriented by this opposition. Not only man's theology, religion, and ritual, but the legal and economic orders that later grew out of them, the formation of the state and the whole pattern of secular life, down to the notion of property and its symbolism, are derived from this act of discrimination and the setting of boundaries made possible by the coming of light. World-building, city-building, the layout of temples, the Roman military encampment, and the spatial symbolism of the Christian Church are all reflections of the original mythology of space, which, beginning with the opposition between light and darkness, classifies and arranges the world in a continuous series of opposites. Space only came into being when, as the Egyptian myth puts it, the god of the air, Shu, parted the sky from the earth by stepping between them. Only then, as a result of his light-creating and space-creating intervention, was there heaven above and earth below, back and front, left and right. In other words, only then was space organized with reference to an ego.
Originally, there were no abstract spatial components. They all possessed a magical reference to the body, had a mythical, emotional character, and were associated with gods, colors, meanings, illusions. Gradually, with the growth of consciousness, things and places were organized into an abstract system and differentiated from one another. But originally, thing and place belonged together in a continuum and were fluidly related to an ever-changing ego. In this inchoate state, there was no distinction between I and you, inside and outside, or between men and things, just as there was no clear dividing line between man and the animals, man and man, man and the world. Everything participated in everything else, lived in the same undivided and overlapping state in the world of the unconscious as in the world of dreams. Indeed, in the fabric of images and symbolic presences woven by dreams, a reflection of this early situation still lives on in us, pointing to the original promiscuity of human life. Not only space, but time and the passage of time are oriented by the mythical space picture. And this formative capacity to orient oneself by the sequence of light and darkness, thus widening the scope of consciousness and one's grasp of reality, extends from the phasal organization of primitive society with its division into age groups to the modern psychology of life stages. In practically all cultures, therefore, the division of the world into four and the opposition of day and night play an extremely important part. Because light, consciousness, and culture are made possible only by the separation of the world parents, the original Ouroboros dragon often appears as the chaos dragon. From the standpoint of the orderly light and day world of consciousness, all that existed before was night. Darkness, chaos, tohoboru. The inward as well as the outward development of culture begins with the coming of light and the separation of the world parents. Not only do day and night, back and front, upper and lower, inside and outside, I and you, male and female, grow out of this development of opposites and differentiate themselves from the original promiscuity, but opposites like sacred and profane, good and evil, are now assigned their place in the world. The embedding of the germinal ego in the Ouroboros corresponds sociologically to the state in which collective ideas prevailed, and the group and group consciousness were dominant. In this state, the ego was not an autonomous individualized entity with a knowledge, morality, volition, and activity of its own, it functions solely as part of the group, and the group with its superordinate power was the only real subject. The emancipation of the ego, when the son establishes itself as an ego and separates the world parents, is accomplished on several different levels. The fact that at the beginning of conscious development everything is still interfused, and that each archetypal stage of transformation, such as the separation of the world parents, always reveals to us different levels of action with different effects and values, makes the task of presentation extraordinarily difficult. The experience of being different, which is the primary fact of nascent ego consciousness, and which occurs in the dawn light of discrimination, divides the world into subject and object. Orientation in time and space succeeds man's vague existence in the dim mists of prehistory and constitutes his early history. Besides disentangling itself from its fusion with nature and the group, the ego, having now opposed itself to the non-ego as another datum of experience, begins simultaneously to constellate its independence of nature as independence of the body. Later we shall have to come back to the question of how the ego and consciousness experience their own reality by distinguishing themselves from the body. This is one of the fundamental facts of the human mind and its discovery of itself as something distinct from nature. Early man is in the same case as the infant and small child. His body and his inside are part of an alien world. 
The acquisition of voluntary muscular movement, that is to say the fact that the ego discovers in its own person that its conscious will can control the body, may well be the basic experience at the root of all magic. The ego, having its seat, as it were, in the head, in the cerebral cortex, and experiencing the nether regions of the body as something strange to it, an alien reality, gradually begins to recognize that essential portions of this nether corporeal world are subject to its will and volition. It discovers that the sovereign power of thought is a real and actual fact. The hand in front of my face and the foot lower down do what I will. The obviousness of these facts should not blind us to the enormous impression which this very early discovery must make, and unquestionably has made, on every infantile ego nucleus. If techniques are an extension of the tool as a means for dominating the world around us, then the tool in its turn is nothing but an extension of the voluntary musculature. Man's will to dominate nature is but an extension and projection of that fundamental experience of the ego's potential power over the body, discovered in the voluntariness of muscular movement. Opposition between ego and body is, as we have said, an original condition. Containment in the Ouroboros and its supremacy over the ego mean on the bodily level that ego and consciousness are at the outset continually at the mercy of the instincts, impulses, sensations, and reactions deriving from the world of the body. To begin with, this ego, existing first as a point and then as an island, knows nothing of itself and consequently nothing of its difference. As it grows stronger, it detaches itself more and more from the world of the body. This leads finally, as we know, to a state of systematized ego consciousness where the entire bodily realm is to a large extent unconscious and the conscious system is split off from the body as the representative of unconscious processes. Though the split is not an effect so drastic as this, the illusion of it is so powerful and so real for the ego that the body region and the unconscious can only be rediscovered with a great effort. In yoga, for instance, a strenuous attempt is made to reconnect the conscious mind with the unconscious bodily processes. This exercise may, if overdone, lead to illness, but in itself it is quite sensible. In the beginning, the realm of ego consciousness and the spiritual and psychic realm are indissolubly united with the body. Instinct and volition are as little divided as instinct and consciousness. Even in modern man, depth psychology has found that the division which has resulted between these two spheres in the course of cultural development, for their mutual tensions constitute what we call culture, is largely an illusion. The activity of instinct lies behind actions which the ego coordinates with its sphere of decision and volition, and to an even higher degree, instincts and archetypes are at the back of our conscious attitudes and orientations. But whereas in modern man there is at any rate the possibility of decision and conscious orientation, the psychology of archaic man and of the child is marked by a mingling of these spheres. Volitions, moods, emotions, instincts, and somatic reactions are still, for all practical purposes, fused together. The same applies to the original ambivalence of effects, which are later resolved into antithetical positions. Love and hate, joy and sorrow, pleasure and pain, attraction and repulsion, yes and no, are at first juxtaposed and interfused, and do not possess the antithetical character they subsequently appear to have. Depth psychology has made the discovery that even today the opposites lie closer together and are more intimately connected than their actual degree of separation would lead one to suppose. Not only in the neurotic, but in the normal person, too, the poles are hard side by side. Pleasure turns to pain, hate to love, sorrow to joy far more readily than we would expect. 
This can be seen most clearly in children. Laughing and crying, starting a thing and then stopping it, liking and disliking, follow fast on one another's heels. No position is fixed, and none is a flat contradiction of its opposite, but both exist peaceably side by side and are realized in closest succession. Influences stream in and out from all sides, environment, ego, and interior world, objective tendencies, consciousness, and bodily tendencies operate simultaneously, and all the while no ego worth mentioning, or only a very diminutive ego, arranges, centers, accepts, and rejects. It is the same with a pair of opposites male and female. Man's original hermaphroditic disposition is still largely conserved in the child. Without the disturbing influences from outside, which foster the visible manifestation of sexual differences at an early date, children would just be children, and actively masculine features are in fact as common and effective in girls as are passively feminine ones in boys. It is only cultural influences, whose differentiating tendencies govern the child's early upbringing, that lead to an identification of the ego with the monosexual tendencies of the personality and to the suppression or repression of one's congenital contrasexuality. The split between inside and outside an archaic man and the child is no more complete than that between good and evil. The fancied playmate is real and unreal at once, like everything else and the image in the dream as real as the reality outside. Here the true reality of the soul still holds sway, that versatile make-believe of which the wizardry of art and fairy tale is a reflection. Here each of us can be all things, and so-called external reality has not yet made us forget the equally powerful reality within. Yet whereas the child's world is entirely governed by these laws, in the world of archaic man, only certain portions of his reality have remained childish and original in this sense. There is a world reality besides, where he masters his surroundings rationally and practically, organizes and elaborates, in other words, has the sort of culture we find intensified in modern man. Nor, as we have said, is a division between good and evil present in the beginning. Man and world have not yet been divided into pure and impure, good and bad. There is at most the difference between that which works, is pregnant with manna and loaded with taboo, and that which does not work. But what works is preeminent, beyond good and evil. Whatever works is powerful, be it black or white, or both, simultaneously or by turns. The consciousness of archaic man is no more discriminating than a child's. There are good magicians and bad magicians, but their range of action seems far more important than the goodness or badness of the act. What we find so difficult to understand is the credulous intensity of this level of existence, where seeming evil is accepted as readily as good and there is apparently not even the beginning of what man subsequently claims to experience and recognize as a moral world order. Within the original Uroboric unity, there were numerous organic and symbolic layers lying close together, which only became distinct and visible at the stage of separation. This confirms Jung's view of the polyvalence of a developmentally early constitution and hence of the infantile constitution. In later stages, different layers of symbols detach themselves from the original promiscuity and confront the ego. World and nature, the unconscious and the body, the group and the family, are all different systems of relationship, which, as independent parts separated off from the ego and from one another, now exert a variety of effects and build up a multiplicity of systems operating together with the ego. But this unfolding of position and counterposition only partly describes the situation that has arisen at the stage of the separation of the world parents. The transition from the Ouroboros to the adolescent stage was characterized by the emergence of fear 
and the death feeling, because the ego, not yet invested with full authority, felt the supremacy of the Ouroboros as an overwhelming danger. This change of emotional tonality must be emphasized at all phases of conscious development, and its presence as an undertone indicates emotional components whose significance has still to be discussed. We have already seen, when dealing with the adolescent, how the change from passivity to activity at first took the form of resistance, defiance, and a self-division, which at that stage led to self-destruction. Similarly, at the stage of the son who separates the world parents and its equivalent, the fight with a dragon, there is not only a change of content, but a changed level of emotionality. The action of the ego in separating the world parents is a struggle, a creative act, and in later sections devoted to the fight with a dragon, we shall give prominence to this aspect and also to the decisive change of personality that follows from this resolve to overcome the danger. For the moment, however, we shall concern ourselves with the other aspect of this deed, the fact that it is experienced as guilt, and moreover as original guilt, a fall. But first we have to discuss the emotional situation, and to understand that this deed, though it manifests itself as the coming of light, and as the creation of the world and of consciousness, is vitiated by a sense of suffering and loss so strong as almost to offset the creative gain. Through the heroic act of world creation and division of opposites, the ego steps forth from the magic circle of the Ouroboros and finds itself in a state of loneliness and discord. With the emergence of the fully-fledged ego, the paradisal situation is abolished. The infantile condition, in which life was regulated by something ampler and more embracing, is at an end, and with it the natural dependence on that ample embrace. We may think of this paradisal situation in terms of religion and say that everything was controlled by God, or we may formulate it ethically and say that everything was still good and that evil had not yet come into the world. Other myths dwell on the effortlessness of the Golden Age, when nature was bountiful and toil, suffering, and pain did not exist. Others stress the everlastingness, the deathlessness of such an existence. The factor common to all these early stages is that psychologically they tell us something about a pre-ego stage when there was no division into a conscious and an unconscious world. To that extent, all these stages are pre-individual and collective. There was no feeling of loneliness, which is the necessary concomitant of egohood and particularly of an ego conscious of its own existence. Ego consciousness not only brings a sense of loneliness, it also introduces suffering, toil, trouble, evil, sickness, and death into man's life as soon as these are perceived by an ego. By discovering itself, the lonely ego simultaneously perceives the negative and relates to it, so that it at once establishes a connection between these two facts, taking its own genesis as guilt and suffering, sickness, and death as condign punishment. The whole life feeling of primitive man is haunted by the negative influences all around him, and at the same time by the consciousness that he is to blame for everything negative that befalls. This is as much as to say that for primitive man chance does not exist. Everything negative comes from the infringement of a taboo, even though the infringement be unconscious. His Weltanschauung, or his conception of cause and effect, is for the most part emotionally colored, because based on a life feeling that has been profoundly disturbed by the growth of ego consciousness. Gone is the original Uroboric life feeling, for the more differentiated and self-related his ego consciousness becomes, the more it feels its own pettiness and impotence, with the result that dependence on the powers that be becomes the dominant feeling. The torpor of the animal, but also, as Rilke says, its open gaze is now lost. And yet, within the warm and watchful beast, 
is weight and care of some great melancholy. For to the beast as well, there always clings what often overwhelms us, memory, as though the goal to which we strive had once been nearer and more trustful, and its contact immeasurably tender. All is distance here. There it was breath. Compared with that first home, the second seems a hybrid thing and windy. O oh, rapture of the little creature which stays ever in the womb that brought it forth! Joy of the gnat that on its wedding day is womb in spasm still, for womb is all. But for the creature that has become an ego, only the other counts. This is called fate, this being opposite and being evermore in opposition. This being opposite and no longer contained in the womb is the dark feeling that pervades consciousness wherever the ego finds itself isolated and alone. It is the mark of man to be pitted against the world. It is his sorrow and his specialty, for what at first seems loss turns out a positive gain. But not only that, on a higher level there falls to man and to man alone the essential mark of relatedness because he, as an individual, enters into relations with an object, be it another man, a thing, the world, his own soul, or God. He then becomes part of a higher and qualitatively different unity, which is no longer the pre-egoid unity of Uroboric containment, but an alliance in which the ego, or rather the self, the totality of the individual, is preserved intact. But this new unity is likewise based on the opposition that came into the world with the separation of the world parents and the dawning of ego consciousness. Only with the separation of the world parents was the world made dual, as is said in the Jewish Midrash. This separation is due to the fundamental cleavage into a conscious portion of the personality, whose center is the ego, and a far greater unconscious portion. The partition also causes a modification of the ambivalence principle. Whereas originally the opposites could function side by side, without undue strain and without excluding one another, now, with the development and elaboration of the opposition between conscious and unconscious, they fly apart. That is to say, it is no longer possible for an object to be loved and hated at the same time. Ego and consciousness identify themselves in principle with one side of the opposition and leave the other in the unconscious, either preventing it from coming up at all, that is to say, consciously suppressing it, or else repressing it, that is to say, eliminating it from consciousness without being aware of doing so. Only deep psychological analysis can then discover the unconscious counterposition. But so long as the ego at the pre-psychological level is unaware of this, it remains oblivious of the other side, and consequently loses the wholeness and completeness of its world picture. This loss of wholeness and of total unconscious integration with the world is experienced as the primary loss. It is the original deprivation which occurs at the very outset of the ego's evolution. We could call this primary loss the primary castration. It must be emphasized, however, that primary castration, in contrast to castration on the matriarchal level, has no genital reference. In the former case, the separation and loss is like being cut off from a larger context. On the personalistic level, for instance, it is felt as separation from the mother's body. It is a self-imposed loss, a severance accomplished by the ego itself, but nevertheless experienced as loss and guilt. This self-liberation is a severing of the umbilical cord, not a mutilation. But with it, the greater unity, the mother-child identity within the Ouroboros, is shattered for good. The threat of matriarchal castration impends over an ego that has not yet broken its tie with the Great Mother. And we showed how, for such an ego, self-loss was symbolically identical with loss of the penis. But the primary loss at the stage of the separation of the world parents concerns a complete individual 
who makes himself independent by this very act. Here the loss has an emotional coloring, is expressed in guilt feelings, and has its source in the loss of participation mystique. The sloughing off of the bisexual Ouroboros can have either a paternal or a maternal accent, and may be felt as a severance from the father god or from the paradisal mother situation, or both. Primary castration is correlated with original sin and the loss of paradise. In the Judeo-Christian sphere of culture, the old mythological motifs were consciously modified and reinterpreted, so that we find only vestiges of the myth of the separation of the world parents. Nor does the literature contain anything more than a faint echo of the Babylonian version, where the divine hero Marduk cuts up the serpent Tiamat, mother of chaos, and builds the world from the pieces. In accordance with the Hebrew conception of God and the world, the moral element now occupies the foreground, knowledge of good and evil is accounted a sin, and relinquishment of the pristine Uroboric state is degraded to a punitive expulsion from paradise. The theme is not, however, confined to non-Greek cultures. Among the pre-Socratics, Anaximander held that the principle of original guilt is cosmic. In this sense is interpreted his saying, The origin of all things is the boundless, and into that from which they arise they pass away once more, as is meet, for they make reparation and satisfaction to one another for their injustice according to the ordering of time. The original unity of the world and God is supposed to have been cleft asunder by some pre-human guilt, and the world born of this rupture must accordingly suffer punishment. The same principle runs through Orphism and Pythagoreanism. In the view of the Gnostics, this feeling of privation became the driving force of the world process, though they introduced a highly paradoxical twist the reasons for which cannot be analyzed more closely here. On account of this complex feeling of loss, existence in the world meant being alone and cut off. Man was utterly forsaken, abandoned to the alien element. His original pleuromatic home, from which was derived the part worthy of redemption, is clearly uroboric, although too much stress is laid on the spirit pneuma aspect. The fundamental dualistic conception in Gnosticism of a higher spiritual part and a lower material part presupposes the separation of the world parents. Despite that, the Pleroma has the Uroboric character of completeness, wholeness, undifferentiatedness, wisdom, primordiality, etc., except that here the Ouroboros has more of a masculine and paternal nature, with feminine Sophia features shining through in contrast to the maternal Ouroboros, where the transpicuous features are masculine. Consequently, in Gnosticism, the way of salvation lies in heightening consciousness and returning to the transcendent spirit, with loss of the unconscious side, whereas Ouroboric salvation through the Great Mother demands the abandonment of the conscious principle and a homecoming to the unconscious. How powerful these basic archetypal images of the psyche are can be seen from the Kabbalah more clearly than from any other cultural phenomenon. Judaism has always tried to eliminate the mythologizing tendency and the whole realm of the psyche in favor of consciousness and morality. But in the esoteric doctrines of the Kabbalah, which is the hidden, pulsing lifeblood of Judaism, a compensatory counter-movement persisted underground. Not only does the Kabbalah reveal a large number of archetypal dominance, but through them it has had an important effect on the development and history of Judaism. Thus, in a treatise on the doctrine of evil in the Lurian Kabbalah, we read, Man is not only the end purpose of creation, nor is his dominion limited to this world alone, but on him depends the perfection of the higher worlds and of God himself. This saying, emphasizing as it does the distinctly anthropocentric standpoint of the Kabbalah, forms the basis of the following declaration. In the view of the Kabbalah, original sin consisted essentially in this, 
that damage was done to the deity. Concerning the nature of this damage, there are various views. The most widely accepted is that the first man, Adam Cadmon, made a division between king and queen, and that he sundered the Shekinah from union with her spouse and from the whole hierarchy of the Sephiroth. Here we have the old archetype of the separation of the world parents, but in a state of purity unknown even to the Gnostics, by whom the Kabbalah may conceivably have been influenced. Generally speaking, the influence of Gnosticism seems highly questionable in those numerous passages where archetypal formulations and images occur in the Kabbalistic writings, as, for instance, in Natham of Gaza, the disciple and inspirer of Sabbatai Zebi. We must resign ourselves to the fact that this influence, like the migration theory, is secondary, and we shall have to substitute for it Jung's discovery, since confirmed by all depth psychological analysis, that archetypal images are operative in every man and appear spontaneously whenever the layer of the collective unconscious is activated. In the great religions, the primal deed the separation of the world parents is theologized. An attempt is made to rationalize and moralize the undeniable sense of deficiency that attaches to the emancipated ego, interpreted as sin, apostasy, rebellion, disobedience. This emancipation is in reality the fundamental liberating act of man which releases him from the yoke of the unconscious and establishes him as an ego a conscious individual. But because this act, like every act and every liberation, entails sacrifice and suffering, the decision to take such a step is all the more momentous. The separation of the world parents is not merely an interruption of the original cohabitation and a destruction of the perfect cosmic state symbolized by the Ouroboros. This in itself, or in conjunction with what we have called the primary loss, would be enough to induce a feeling of original guilt, precisely because the Uruboric state is, by nature, a state of wholeness, embracing the world and man. The decisive thing, however, is that this separation is not experienced only as passive suffering and loss, but also as an actively destructive deed. It is symbolically identical with killing, sacrifice, dismemberment, and castration. Now, it is a very striking fact that what was done to the youthful lover by the maternal Ouroboros is at this point done to the Ouroboros itself. In mythology, it happens just as often that the sun god castrates the father god as that he cuts up the primordial dragon and builds the world from it. Mutilation, a theme which also occurs in alchemy, is the condition of all creation. So here we come upon two archetypal motifs that belong absolutely together and appear in all creation myths. Without the slaying of the old parents, their dismemberment and neutralization, there can be no beginning. We shall have to examine at some length this problem of parental murder. Obviously, it entails a genuine and necessary guilt. The emancipation of the youthful lover from the Ouroboros begins with an act which was shown to be a negative act, an act of destruction. Its psychological interpretation then enabled us to understand the symbolical nature of the masculinity which lies at the root of all consciousness. We describe the adolescent's advance towards independence and liberation as self-division. To become conscious of oneself, to be conscious at all, begins with saying no to the Ouroboros, to the Great Mother, to the unconscious. And when we scrutinize the acts upon which consciousness and the ego are built up, we must admit that to begin with, they are all negative acts. To discriminate, to distinguish, to mark off, to isolate oneself from the surrounding context, these are the basic acts of consciousness. Indeed, experimentation as the scientific method is a typical example of this process. A natural connection is broken down, and something is isolated and analyzed, for the motto of all consciousness is 
determinatio est negatio. As against the tendency of the unconscious to combine and melt down, to say to everything, tat dva masi, that art thou, consciousness strikes back with the reply, I am not that. Ego formation can only proceed by way of distinction from the non-ego, and consciousness only emerge where it detaches itself from what is unconscious, and the individual only arrives at individuation when he marks himself off from the anonymous collective. The breakdown of the Uroboric initial state leads to differentiation and duality, decombination of the original ambivalence, division of the hermaphroditic constitution, and the splitting of the world into subject and object, inside and outside, and to the creation of good and evil, which are only discriminated with the expulsion from the Uroboric Garden of Paradise where the opposites lie down together. Naturally enough, as soon as man becomes conscious and acquires an ego, he feels himself a divided being, since he also possesses a formidable other side which resists the process of becoming conscious. That is, he finds himself in doubt, and so long as his ego remains immature, this doubt may drive him to desperation and even to suicide which always means a murder of the ego and a self-mutilation that culminates with his death in the Great Mother. Until it has finally consolidated itself and is able to stand on its own feet, which, as we shall see, is only possible after the successful fight with the dragon, the adolescent ego remains insecure. Its insecurity derives from the internal split into two opposed psychic systems, and of these the conscious system with which the ego identifies itself is still feeble, undeveloped, and somewhat hazy about the meaning of its specific principle. This inner insecurity, taking the form, as we have said, of doubt, produces two complementary phenomena that are characteristic of the adolescent phase. The first is narcissism, with its excessive egocentricity, self-complacency, and self-absorption, the other is Weltschmerz. Narcissism is a necessary transitional phase during the consolidation of the ego. The emancipation of ego consciousness from thraldom to the unconscious leads, like all emancipation, to an exaggeration of one's own position and importance. The puberty of ego consciousness is accompanied by a depreciation of the place from which one came, the unconscious. This deflation of the unconscious tends in the same direction as secondary personalization and the exhaustion of emotional components. The meaning of all these processes lies in strengthening the principle of ego consciousness, but the danger inherent in this line of development is exaggerated self-importance, a megalomaniac ego consciousness which thinks itself independent of everything and which begins by devaluing and repressing the unconscious, and ends by denying it altogether. Overvaluation of the ego as a symptom of immature consciousness is compensated by a depressive self-destruction, which, in the form of Weltschmerz and self-hatred, often culminates in suicide, all these being characteristic symptoms of puberty. An analysis of this state discloses a feeling of guilt whose source is transpersonal, that is to say it goes back beyond the entanglements of the personalistic family romance. The heinous deed of separating the world parents appears as original guilt, but, and this is the important thing, it is in a sense the world parents, the unconscious itself, which makes the accusation, and not the ego. As a representative of the ancient law, the Uroboric unconscious struggles hard to prevent the emancipation of her son, consciousness, and so once again we find ourselves back in the orbit of the terrible mother who wants to destroy the son. So long as the conscious ego bows down before this accusation and accepts the death sentence, it is behaving like the son lover, and like him will end in self-destruction. It is very different when the son turns the tables upon the terrible mother and adopts her destructive attitude, directing it not against himself, but against her. 
This process is represented mythologically in the fight with a dragon. Summing up the change of personality which we shall be examining later as a consequence of this fight, we can say that the process corresponds psychologically to the formation of the conscious higher ego of the hero and to the raising of the buried treasure, knowledge. Nevertheless, the ego is bound to feel its aggression as guilt, because killing, dismemberment, castration, and sacrifice remain guilt, even though they serve the necessary purpose of vanquishing such an enemy as the Ouroboros dragon. This destruction is closely associated with the act of eating and assimilation, and is often represented as such. The formation of consciousness goes hand in hand with the fragmentation of the world continuum into separate objects, parts, figures, which can only then be assimilated, taken in, introjected, made conscious, in a word, eaten. When the sun hero, having been swallowed by the dragon of darkness, cuts out its heart and eats it, he is taking into himself the essence of this object. Consequently, aggression, destruction, dismemberment, and killing are intimately associated with the corresponding body functions of eating, chewing, biting, and particularly with the symbolism of the teeth as instruments of these activities, all of which are essential for the formation of an independent ego. In this lies the deeper meaning of aggression during the early phases of development. Far from being sadistic, it is a positive and indispensable preparation for the assimilation of the world. But precisely because of its elemental bond with the world of nature, the primitive mind has always regarded killing, even the destruction of animals and plants, as an outrage upon the world order that cried out for expiation. The spirits of the slain take their revenge unless propitiated. Fear of the vengeance of the powers that be for the separation of the world parents, and for man's criminal emancipation from the power of the divine Ouroboros, is the feeling of dread and guilt, this the original sin with which the history of mankind opens. The struggle against this fear, against the danger of being swallowed up again in the initial chaos through a regression that undoes the work of emancipation, is enacted in all its modulations in the fight with the dragon. Not until then will the ego and consciousness be firmly established. The son of the world parents has to prove himself a hero in this fight. The ego, newborn and helpless, has to transform itself into a procreator and conqueror. The victorious hero stands for a new beginning, the beginning of creation but a creation which is the work of man and which we call culture, as opposed to natural creation which is given to man at the outset and overshadows his beginnings. As we have already pointed out, it is consistent with the conscious-unconscious structure of the opposites that the unconscious should be regarded as predominantly feminine and consciousness as predominantly masculine. This correlation is self-evident because the unconscious, alike in its capacity to bring to birth and to destroy through absorption, has feminine affinities. The feminine is conceived mythologically under the aspect of this archetype. Ouroboros and Great Mother are both feminine dominants, and all the psychic constellations over which they rule are under the dominance of the unconscious. Conversely, its opposite, the system of ego consciousness, is masculine. With it are associated the qualities of volition, decision, and activity, as contrasted with the determinism and blind drives of the preconscious, egoless state. The development of ego consciousness, as we have sketched it, consisted in its gradual emancipation from the overpowering embrace of the unconscious, which was exerted to the full by the Ouroboros and to a lesser degree by the Great Mother. Observing the process more closely, we found that its central features were the growing independence of masculinity, originally present only in the germ, and the systematization of ego consciousness, of which in the early history of mankind, as in early infancy, only the smallest beginnings could be detected. The stage of separation of the world parents 
which initiates the independence of the ego and consciousness by giving rise to the principle of opposites, is therefore also the stage of increasing masculinity. Ego consciousness stands in manly opposition to the feminine unconscious. This strengthening of consciousness is borne out by the laying down of taboos and of moral attitudes which delimit the conscious from the unconscious by substituting knowing action for unwitting impulse. The meaning of ritual, irrespective of the useful effects which primitive man expects from it, lies precisely in strengthening the conscious system. The magical forms by means of which archaic man comes to terms with his surroundings are, all other considerations apart, anthropocentric systems of world domination. In his rituals, he makes himself the responsible center of the cosmos. On him depends the rising of the sun, the fertility of crops, and all the doings of the gods. These projections, and the various procedures by which the great individuals distinguish themselves from the herd as chiefs, medicine men, or divine kings, and the demons, spirits, and gods are crystallized out from a welter of indeterminate powers, we know to be expressions of a centering process that imposes order upon the chaos of unconscious events and leads to the possibility of conscious action. Although nature and the unconscious are ordinarily experienced by primitive man as a field of unseen forces which leave no room for chance, life remains chaotic for the germinal ego, dark and impenetrable, so long as no orientation is possible with regard to these forces. But orientation comes through ritual, through the subjugation of the world by magic, which imposes world order. Even though this order is different from the kind we impose, the connection between our conscious order and the magical order of early man can be proved at all points. The important thing is that consciousness as the acting center precedes consciousness as the cognitive center, in the same way as ritual precedes myth or magic, ceremonial, and ethical action precede the scientific view of the world and anthropological knowledge. The center common to conscious action through the will and to conscious knowledge through cognition is, however, the ego. From being acted upon by external forces, it develops slowly into the agent, just as it ascends from the state of being overpowered by revealed knowledge into the light of conscious knowledge. Once again, this process is first accomplished not in the collective parts of the group, but only in the great, that is to say, differentiated individuals who are the representative bearers of the group's consciousness. They are the institutional forerunners and leaders whom the group follows. The ritual marriage between fructifier and earth goddess, between king and queen, becomes the model for all marriages between members of the collective. The immortal soul of the divine king Osiris becomes the immortal soul of each and every Egyptian, even as Christ the Savior becomes the Christ soul of every Christian, the self within us. In the same way, the function of the chief, which is to will and to decide, becomes the model for all subsequent acts of free will in the ego of the individual, and the lawmaking function originally attributed to God and later to the mana personality, has in modern man become his inner court of conscience. We shall be discussing this process of introjection later, but for the moment we shall formulate the masculinization of consciousness and its theoretic importance thus. Through the masculinization and emancipation of ego consciousness, the ego becomes the hero. The story of the hero, as set forth in the myths, is the history of this self-emancipation of the ego struggling to free itself from the power of the unconscious and to hold its own against overwhelming odds. Chapter 2 The Slaying of the Mother Once the Ouroboros has divided into a pair of opposites, namely the world parents, and the son has placed himself between them, thereby establishing his masculinity, the first stage of his emancipation is successfully accomplished. 
the ego, standing in the center between the world parents, has challenged both sides of the Ouroboros, and by this hostile act has ranged both the upper and lower principles against him. He is now faced with what we have termed the dragon fight, a militant struggle with these contrary forces. Only the outcome of this struggle will reveal whether the emancipation is really successful and whether he has finally shaken off the tenacious grip of the Ouroboros. Turning to this fight with the dragon, a basic type in all mythologies, we must first distinguish the various stages of battle and its components. The numerous possible ways of interpreting this key theme of the unconscious must invite our caution. Contrary interpretations hang together as different stages within a basic situation, and only in the unity of all these interpretations will the true picture be disclosed. The dragon fight has three main components, the hero, the dragon, and the treasure. By vanquishing the dragon, the hero gains the treasure, which is the end product of the process symbolized by the fight. The nature of this treasure, variously known as the treasure hard to attain, the captive, the pearl of great price, the water of life, or the herb of immortality, will be dealt with later. At present, we are faced with a fundamental question. What does the symbol of the dragon mean? As Jung has already established, though without taking it sufficiently into account in his own interpretation, this dragon bears all the marks of the Ouroboros. It is masculine and feminine at once. The fight with the dragon is thus the fight with the first parents, a fight in which the murders of both father and mother, but not of one alone, have their ritually prescribed place. The dragon fight forms a central chapter in the evolution of mankind as of the individual. And in the personal development of the child, it is connected with events and processes which psychoanalysis knows as the Oedipus complex, and which we call the problem of the first parents. Freud's father-murder theory, which Rank has tried to elaborate, combines the following features in a systematic unity. The family romance, so far as it revolves round the boy, culminates in the son's incestuous longings for the mother, which are thwarted by the hostile father. The hero is the lad who kills his father and marries his mother. The hero myth thus becomes a mere fantasy for the direct or indirect fulfillment of this wishful idea. The theory is supported, or, to be more accurate, is overlaid, by Freud's illogical and anthropologically impossible hypothesis of a gorilla father. A formidable ape-like patriarch makes off with his son's women and is eventually done to death by the brotherly band. Heroism consists in liquidating your father. Freud takes all this as the literal truth, and from it he derives totemism and the basic features of culture and religion. Here, as everywhere, Freud, with his personalistic bias, has misinterpreted something very important. Nevertheless, the killing of the father remains an essential element of the dragon fight, though it is not the most essential, let alone the key to the whole history of mankind. While Rank takes a bigoted stand upon Freudian theory, Jung gives a very different answer to this problem in his early work, Psychology of the Unconscious. He arrives at two conclusions, which are, in our opinion, final. He shows first that the hero's fight is the fight with a mother who cannot be regarded as a personal figure in the family romance. Behind the personal figure of the mother there stands, as is evident from the symbology, what Jung was later to call the mother archetype. Jung was able to prove the transpersonal significance of the hero's fight because he did not make the personal family aspect of modern man the starting point of human development, but rather the development of the libido and its transformations. In this transformation process, the hero's fight plays an eternal and fundamental part 
in overcoming the inertia of the libido, which is symbolized by the encircling mother dragon, that is to say, the unconscious. Jung's second conclusion, the significance of which has not yet been generally accepted in psychology, demonstrate that the hero's incest is a regenerative incest. Victory over the mother, frequently taking the form of actual entry into her, that is to say, incest, brings about a rebirth. The incest produces a transformation of personality, which alone makes the hero a hero, that is, a higher and ideal representative of mankind. The present study, which is based on Jung's discoveries, attempts to distinguish the individual types of dragon fight and its different stages, and in this way to correct and combine the two opposing theories of Freud and Jung. In his Psychology of the Unconscious, Jung was still so much under the influence of Freud's father theory that his interpretations have to be corrected and recast in the light of his later discoveries. The conquest, or killing, of the mother forms one stratum in the myth of the dragon fight. The successful masculinization of the ego finds expression in its combativeness and readiness to expose itself to the danger which the dragon symbolizes. The ego's identification with masculine consciousness produces the psychic cleavage which drives it into opposing the dragon of the unconscious. This struggle is variously represented as the entry into the cave, the descent to the underworld, or as being swallowed, that is to say, incest with a mother. This is shown most clearly in the hero myths which take the form of sun myths. Here, the swallowing of the hero by the dragon, night, sea, underworld, corresponds to the sun's nocturnal journey, from which it emerges victoriously after having conquered the darkness. All reductive interpretations assert that being swallowed is identical with castration, with fear of the dragon and fear of the father, who prevents incest with the mother. That is to say, incest with the mother is in itself desirable, but is made terrible by this fear of the father. The mother is supposed to be a positive object of desire, and the father the real obstacle. This interpretation is erroneous, because incest and fear of castration are already apparent at the stage when no father is operative, much less a jealous father. The question goes deeper than that and touches a more primordial level. Fear of the dragon does not correspond to fear of the father, but to something far more elemental, namely the male's fear of the female in general. The hero's incest is incest with a great and terrible mother, who is by nature terrible and does not become terrible indirectly through the intervention of a third party. It is true that the dragon also symbolizes the hero's fear. But the dragon is sufficiently terrible without any surplus fear being added. The descent into the abyss, into the sea or the dark cave, has terrors enough without the bogey of a father to bar the way. The bisexual structure of the Uroboric dragon shows that the Great Mother possesses masculine but not paternal features. The aggressive and destructive features of the Great Mother, her function as a killer, for example, can be distinguished as masculine, and among her attributes we also find phallic symbols, as Jung has already pointed out. This is especially evident in the case of Hecate's attributes, key, whip, snake, dagger, and torch. They are masculine, but are not on that account paternal symbols. When the eunuch priests of the Great Mother perform their castrations and sacrifices, they are portraying her terrible character, but it is impossible to see these emasculated priests as father figures. The phallic figures who are better equipped to serve in this capacity are always subordinate. The Great Mother controls and uses them, and this fact contradicts their independent significance as father figures. The aggressive and destructive elements in the Great Mother 
can also appear symbolically and ritually as separate figures detached from her, in the form of attendants, priests, animals, etc. Warrior groups given to masculine orgies, such as the Curities, often belong to the sphere of the Great Mother, and so do the phallic consorts who execute her destructive will. At a still later stage, among the matriarchally governed Indians of North America, we find that the chiefs are executively dependent upon the Old Mother. In this category, we would also have to include not only the boar that kills the youthful god, but the maternal uncle as the instrument of the authority complex directed, for instance, against Isis's son Horus. Even the phallic chthonic sea god Poseidon and his brood of monsters belong by nature to the domain of the Great Mother, and not to that of the Great and Terrible Father. Later, however, when the Patriarchate has succeeded to the Great Mother's sovereignty, the role of the Terrible Father is projected upon the masculine representatives of her terrible aspect, especially when it is in the interests of patriarchal development to repress that aspect and to bring the figure of the good mother to the fore. The two forms of incest which we have studied so far were essentially passive, uroboric incest, in which the germinal ego was extinguished, and matriarchal incest, in which the son was seduced by the mother and the incest ended in matriarchal castration. But what distinguishes the hero is an active incest, the deliberate, conscious exposure of himself to the dangerous influence of the female and the overcoming of man's immemorial fear of woman. To overcome fear of castration is to overcome fear of the mother's power, which, for man, is associated with the danger of castration. This brings us to a question of considerable diagnostic, therapeutic, and theoretical importance. The differentiation of the various archetypal stages enables us to decide what form of incest we are dealing with and what is the position of the ego and consciousness, in a word, what the developmental situation is in each individual case. In his Psychology of the Unconscious, Jung was still so much under the spell of Freud that he failed to recognize the archetypal differences in this situation and consequently simplified the problem of the hero by treating it reductively. The feminine element in the androgynous son-lover, which Jung derives from regression to the mother, is on the contrary entirely original. As the androgyne's structurally undifferentiated disposition shows, and is not caused by the regression of an already developed masculinity. This disposition originates at a deeper level, where the Great Mother is still dominant, and masculinity not yet firmly established. Hence, there is no renunciation of masculinity. It is simply that this masculinity has not so far achieved any independence at all, Admittedly, the self-castration by which the adolescent sacrifices his masculinity is regressive, but it is only a partial regression, or we could say more accurately that his development has been nipped in the bud. The effeminate nature of the adolescent is an intermediate stage, which can also be regarded as an intersexual stage. The interpretation of the priest or prophet as such an intermediate type is psychologically correct, though not correct biologically. We have to distinguish between the adult ego's creative connection with the Great Mother and one in which the ego is not yet able to throw off her supremacy. But what, the reader may ask, does castration mean at this stage of heroic incest? Is it not a misleading generalization of neurotic psychology to speak of the male's immemorial fear of the female? For the ego and the male, the female is synonymous with the unconscious and the non-ego. Hence, with darkness, nothingness, the void, the bottomless pit. In Jung's words, it should be remarked that emptiness is a great feminine secret. It is something absolutely alien to man. The chasm, the unplumbed depths, the yin. 
Mother, womb, the pit, and hell are all identical. The womb of the female is the place of origin from whence one came. And so every female is, as a womb, a primordial womb of the great mother of all origination, the womb of the unconscious. She threatens the ego with the danger of self naughting of self-loss, in other words, with death and castration. We have seen that the narcissistic nature of the phallus-obsessed adolescent constellates a connection between the sexuality and the fear of castration. The death of the phallus and the female is symbolically equated with castration by the Great Mother, and in psychological terms, this means the ego's dissolution in the unconscious. But the masculinity and ego of the hero are no longer identical with the phallus and sexuality. On this level, another part of the body erects itself symbolically as the higher phallus, or the higher masculinity, the head, symbol of consciousness, with the eye for its ruling organ. And with this, the ego now identifies itself. The danger which threatens the upper principle, symbolized by head and eye, is closely connected with the help extended to the hero by what we call heaven. Even before the dragon fight has begun, this higher part is already developed and active. In the mythological sense, this proves his divine parentage and his hero's birth. Psychologically, it indicates his readiness to face the dragon like a hero and not like the lower, normal man. This upper part of his nature is confirmed and finally brought to birth if the struggle is victorious, but is threatened with extinction in the event of defeat. There is no need for us to demonstrate here that the head and the eye occur everywhere as symbols of the masculine and spiritual side of consciousness, of heaven and sun, the breath and logos groups also belong to this canon of symbols, where higher masculinity is distinguished from the lower masculinity of the phallic stage. It is therefore correct to interpret beheading and blinding as castration, but the castration occurs above, not below. This does not imply an upwards displacement, from which point of view losing one's head would be identical with impotence, an equation that is true neither mythologically nor symbolically nor psychologically. There are upper eunuchs as well as lower eunuchs, and the devotees of the phallus are just as likely to be eunuchs in the upper regions as the highbrows are in the lower. Only the combination of both zones produces a whole masculinity. Here again, Bachofen grasped the essence of the problem with his distinction between chthonic and solar masculinity. The corresponding symbolism is to be found in the story of Samson, a secondarily personalized myth, or, as happens equally often, a secondarily mythologized hero's story. As in numerous other places in the Old Testament, the gist of the story is Jehovah's struggle with the Canaanite Philistine Astarte principle. The main outlines are clear enough. Samson is dedicated to Jehovah, but his instincts succumb to the wiles of Delilah Astarte. Thereupon his fate is sealed, which means the cutting of his hair, blinding, and loss of the Jehovah power. The castration takes the form of loss of the hair, and this is all the more significant, because the worshippers of Jehovah and opponents of the Astarte principle may never cut their hair. Further, the loss of hair and strength relates to the archetypal stage of the sun hero who is castrated and devoured. The second element is the blinding. Once again, it is an upper as distinct from a lower castration. Upper castration, or loss of the Jehovah power, leads to the hero's captivity among the Philistines in the realm of Astarte. He lingers in the underworld, where he must tread the mill. Jeremiah has pointed out that the treading of the mill is a religious motif. This is confirmed by the reference to the temple of Dagon, in which Samson is held a prisoner, for Dagon 
is the corn god of the Canaanites, a vegetation deity like Osiris. Dagon is the father of Baal, but all the territories of this Jehovah-hating Baal are subject to the rule of the great mother of the Canaanites. Samson's captivity is therefore an expression of the servitude of the conquered male under the great mother, just as were the labors of Heracles under Omphali, when he wore women's clothes, another well-known symbol of enslavement to the great mother, to whom we must also attribute the mill as a symbol of fertility. Enslavement to the Astarte world is finally overcome by a resurgence of the victorious hero's solar power. Samson breaks the pillars of Dagon's temple, and in his sacrificial death, the old Jehovah power of the Nazarite is restored. For the collapse of the temple and Samson's self-renewal in death, Jehovah triumphs over his enemies and over the Astarte principle. The hero's fight is always concerned with a threat to the spiritual, masculine principle from the Uroboric dragon, and with the danger of being swallowed by the maternal unconscious. The most widely disseminated archetype of the dragon fight is the sun myth, where the hero is swallowed every evening by the nocturnal sea monster dwelling in the west, and who then grapples with its double, so to speak, the dragon whom he encounters in this uterine cavern. He is then reborn in the east as the victorious son, the Sol Invictus, or rather by hacking his way out of the monster, he accomplishes his own rebirth. In this sequence of danger, battle, and victory, the light, whose significance for consciousness we have repeatedly stressed, is the central symbol of the hero's reality. The hero is always a light-bringer and emissary of the light. At the nethermost point of the night sea journey, when the sun hero journeys through the underworld and must survive the fight with the dragon, the new sun is kindled at midnight, and the hero conquers the darkness. At this same lowest point of the year, Christ is born as the shining Redeemer, as the light of the year and light of the world and is worshipped with a Christmas tree at the winter solstice. The new light and the victory are symbolized by the illumination and transfiguration of the head, crowned and decked with an aureole. Even though the deeper meaning of this symbolism will only become clear to us later, it is evident that the hero's victory brings with it a new spiritual status, a new knowledge, and an alteration of the consciousness. In the mystery religions, too, the neophyte has to endure the perils of the underworld, pass through the seven portals, a very early feature found even in Ishtar's descent into hell, or spend the twelve night hours in the dark hemisphere, as described by Apuleius in his account of the Isis mysteries. The mysteries culminate in a deification, which in the Isis mysteries means identification with the sun god. The initiate receives the crown of life, the supreme illumination. His head is hallowed by the light and anointed with glory. Wundt characterizes the heroic age as the predominance of individual personality. This, he says, is what the hero represents. In fact, he derives the divine figure from the hero, seeing in God only an intensified hero figure. Even though this view is not altogether correct, there is, nevertheless, a connection between the hero as bearer of the ego with its power to discipline the will and mold the personality, and the formative phase in which the gods are crystallized out from a mass of impersonal forces. The development of the conscious system, having as its center an ego which breaks away from the despotic rule of the unconscious, is prefigured in the hero myth. The unconscious forces of this now obsolete psychic stage thereupon deploy themselves against the ego hero as fearsome monsters and dragons, demons and unclean spirits who threaten to swallow him up again. The terrible mother, the all-inclusive symbol of this devouring aspect of the unconscious, is therefore the great mother of all monsters. 
all dangerous effects and impulses, all the evils which come up from the unconscious and overwhelm the ego with their dynamism, are her progeny. This is precisely what is meant when Goya uses, as a motto for his caprichos, the dream of reason breeds monsters, or when in Greek mythology Hecate, the primeval and all-powerful goddess, appears as the mother of the man-eating Empusa and of the Lamias who devour the flesh of boys. She is the arch-enemy of the hero, who, as horseman or knight, tames the horse of unconscious instinct, or, as Michael, destroys the dragon. He is the bringer of light, form, and order, out of the monstrous, pollulating chaos of Mother Nature. One of the first figures we encounter in our investigation of the hero myth is the hero whose name has become a byword in modern psychology, and who has been so calamitously misinterpreted, Oedipus. He is the type of hero whose fight with the dragon is only partially successful. His tragic fate is eloquent of this abortive attempt and can only be understood from the transpersonal standpoint here adopted. There are three fateful points in the myth of Oedipus which must be borne in mind if we are to give him his rightful place in the evolution of human consciousness. Firstly, the victory over the Sphinx. Secondly, the incest with the mother. Thirdly, the murder of the father. Oedipus becomes a hero and dragon slayer because he vanquishes the Sphinx. This Sphinx is the age-old foe, the dragon of the abyss, representing the might of the Earth Mother in her Uroboric aspect. She is the Great Mother, whose deadly law runs in the fatherless Earth, threatening destruction upon all men who cannot answer her question. The fatal riddle she propounds, and whose answer is man, can only be solved by the hero. He alone answers fate by conquering it, and he conquers because in his answer fate itself is answered. This heroic answer, which makes him truly a man, is the victory of the spirit, man's triumph over chaos. Thus, by conquering the Sphinx, Oedipus becomes a hero and dragon slayer, and as such he commits incest with his mother, like every hero. The hero's incest and the conquering of the Sphinx are identical, two sides of the same process, by conquering his terror of the female, by entering into the womb, the abyss, the peril of the unconscious, he weds himself triumphantly with a great mother who castrates the young men, and with a sphinx who destroys them. His heroism transforms him into a fully grown male, independent enough to overcome the power of the female, and, what is more important, to reproduce a new being in her. Here, where the youth becomes the man, and active incest becomes reproductive incest, the male unites with his female opposite and brings to birth a new thing, the third. A synthesis arises in which, for the first time, male and female are equilibrated in a whole. The hero is not only conqueror of the mother, he also kills her terrible female aspect, so as to liberate the fruitful and bountiful aspect. If we follow up this line of thought, and disregard for the present the meaning of the father murder, we can see why Oedipus was only half a hero, and why the real deed of the hero remained only half accomplished. Though Oedipus conquers the Sphinx, he commits incest with his mother and murders his father unconsciously. He has no knowledge of what he has done and when he finds out he is unable to look his own deed, the deed of the hero, in the face. Consequently, he is overtaken by the fate that overtakes all those for whom the eternal feminine reverts to the great mother. He regresses to the stage of the son and suffers the fate of the son lover. He performs the act of self-castration by putting out his own eyes. Even if we discount Bachhofen's interpretation, which sees in the clasp used for the blinding a symbol of the old matriarchal system. The fact remains that he uses as an instrument an article belonging to his wife and mother. 
The blinding is no longer a puzzle for us. It signifies the destruction of the higher masculinity, of the very thing that characterizes the hero. And this form of spiritual self-castration cancels out all that was gained by his victory over the Sphinx. The masculine progression of the hero is thrown back by the old shock, the fear of the great mother, which seizes him after the deed. He becomes the victim of the Sphinx he had conquered. In Sophocles' Oedipus at Colonus, the old man finds rest and deliverance at last in the grove of the Erinys, representatives of the ancient mother power, and his path is rounded out to the full Uroboric circle. His end crowns his tragic life with lofty, mystical solemnity. Blind and infirm, he vanishes mysteriously into the bowels of the earth, guided by Theseus, the ideal hero of a later age, who refused to succumb to his stepmother, the sorceress Medea. The great earth mother takes Oedipus, the swellfoot, her phallic son, back into herself. His grave becomes a sanctuary. He is one of the great human figures, whose agony and suffering lead to more gracious and civilized behavior, who, still embedded in the old order of which they are the products, stand there as its last great victims, and at the same time as the founders of a new age. It is no accident that the story of Oedipus' origins lacks all of the characteristic marks of the hero's birth which connect him with a divinity. The story as we have it in Sophocles is no heroic tragedy, but the glorification of a fate beyond the control of man in the hands of dispassionate gods. The drama contains traces of the early matriarchal epoch when the human and the divine had not yet come together and the ego's dependence on the powers that be was paramount. The dominance of the Great Mother appears here, with a philosophical coloring, as total dependence upon fate. All such pessimistic systems are thinly veiled expositions of the Great Mother's ascendancy over the ego and consciousness. To the hero, the clutching Earth Mother appears as a dragon to be overcome. In the first part of the dragon fight, she twines herself about the sun and seeks to hold him fast as an embryo by preventing him from being born or by making him the eternal babe in arms and mother's darling. She is the deadly Uroboric mother, the abyss in the west, the kingdom of the dead, the underworld, the devouring maw of the earth into which, weary and submissive, the ordinary mortal sinks to his death in the dissolution of Uroboric or matriarchal incest. The devouring is often represented as a preliminary defeat in the dragon fight. Even in a typical victor myth like that of the Babylonian hero Marduk, there is a phase of captivity and defeat during his struggle with the monster Tiamat. This phase is the necessary prelude to rebirth. If, however, the hero succeeds in being a hero. If he proves his higher origin and his filiation to the divine forefather, then, like the sun hero, he enters into the terrible mother of fear and danger and emerges covered in glory from the belly of the whale or from the Augean stables or from the uterine cavern of the earth. The slaying of the mother and identification with the father god go together. If, through active incest, the hero penetrates into the dark, maternal, chthonic side, he can only do so by virtue of his kinship with heaven, his filiation to God. By hacking his way out of the darkness, he is reborn as the hero in the image of God, but at the same time as the son of the God-impregnated virgin and of the regenerative good mother. Whereas the first half of the night, when the westering sun descends into the belly of the whale, is dark and devouring, the second half is bright and bountiful, for out of it the sun hero climbs to the eastward, reborn. Midnight decides whether the sun will be born again as the hero to shed new light on a world renewed, 
or whether he will be castrated and devoured by the terrible mother, who kills him by destroying the heavenly part that makes him a hero. He then remains in the darkness a captive. Not only does he find himself grown fast to the rocks of the underworld like Theseus, or chained to the crag like Prometheus, or nailed to the cross like Jesus, but the world remains without a hero, and there is born, as Ernst Barlach says in his drama, A Dead Day. We shall discuss this drama, whose mythological symbolism is profounder than that of most classical tragedies, in some detail, because in it the symbolism of the dragon fight reappears in a modern writer. The basic theme of the work is the mother's resistance to the growth and development of her son. He has always lived with her, but now he threatens to go away. This mythical mother conceived her son by the sun god, who, on taking his departure, said he would return when the child had become a man, and would see how well she had brought him up. We then meet the blind personal father, the husband of our great mother. He understands that his son is a hero, a god's son, and with the help of his wife's familiar spirit, he tries to make the hero's fate and its necessity apparent to her and the boy. This familiar is a motherless spirit, visible only to the divine eyes of the son. He tells the son, It is rumored that your mother has a grown-up baby in her house, and adds, Men come from men. But the mother silences him. The words, Enough, mother, too little father, and A man is kin to the father and a nurse that speaks to him of the father feeds him better than a mother who keeps silent, are as poisonous to her ears as her husband's remark that their son is a hero. The blind personal father then says, Perhaps he is stuck fast in the world like a bird breaking from the egg. With his eyes he lives in the other world, and it has need of him. And God's sons are no mother's darlings. To this the mother answers, My son is no hero, I need no hero son, crying, The world's good is death to the mother. But the son has dreamt that his father appeared to him like a man having a son for his head, and in the dream he rode the son's steed of his future that his father gave him. Already this horse, named Herzhorn, which has wind in his belly and snuffs the sun, stands in the stable and gladdens the boy's heart. The invisible conflict sways round the existence or non-existence of this horse. The blind father then tries to interpret the world to the son. He tells him about the images of the future, which can and must come forth from the night, and how the hero must rouse them from their slumber in order to give the world a better face. He speaks of the truth, of the son that was, is, and shall be, trying to rouse up the son who is not his own. But to all this the mother replies impassively, Son's future is mother's past, and the hero must first bury his mother. Then the son begins to understand, perhaps the life we live is also the life of the gods. But the mother denies him his right to a future, lest the child grow away from her. So one night she secretly kills the sun horse, and by this murder destroys the future, both of her son and of the world. What now comes is the dead day, or as the mother says with half-unconscious irony, just a little boy born of the night, a newborn thing without light or consciousness. In despair the son cries out, But nobody can be anybody else! Nobody else can be what I am, nobody but me. But the mother slaps his face and tells him he is to remain his mother's son and not have an ego. Still not suspecting that his mother murdered the horse, the son grows up in the knowledge that he is not like the familiar spirit who was begotten of one parent only. So he has no hope that he could ever be reborn through the mother alone. No mother begot me alone, so she cannot give me back the life which she has not given me alone. 
He complains that he lacks a father, alleging that he needs his father's bodily presence and example, and rails against his invisibility. The son, brought up on the earthly wisdom of the mother that one cannot live by the bread that is baked in dreams, is thereupon scolded by the familiar spirit of father's son with no mother, and told, You bedwetter, my father's dreams would have shown me my heritage without my father's example. The body does not help, it must cleave to the spirit. So the son is torn between the elemental parents above and below. He hears the sun roaring above the mist, and the great heart of the earth hammering in the depths, and laments, from high and low, the echoes battle for my ears. Transfixed between mother and father, he twice calls out to his father, but his third call drifts back to the mother. As he once again breaks away from her, she curses him and kills herself. Now he must decide. Rejecting the fatal knife of self-destruction, he says, Father would not do it either. Only to follow his mother were the words, Mother's way suits me better after all. The mother has killed his horse and so castrated her son. There came a dead day, a day without son. His denial of Father God, identical with self-mutilation, ends in suicide. The mother's curse, counteracted by no paternal blessing, is fulfilled. He obeys the mother who bore him, and he dies by her curse, an accursed mother's son. This drama is a myth of early times. It enacts the history of men between the epoch of the great mother and the intermediate stage of the dragon fight, whose protagonist in antiquity is Oedipus, Oedipus the vanquished, not the victor. The next stage is dramatically presented in the Oresteia. It describes the victory of the son, who becomes a matricide in order to avenge his father, and who introduces the new age of the patriarchate with the help of the paternal solar principle. We use the word patriarchate in Bachofen's sense, to signify the predominantly masculine world of spirit, son, consciousness, and ego. In the matriarchate, on the other hand, the unconscious reigns supreme, and the predominant feature here is a pre-conscious, pre-logical, and pre-individual way of thinking and feeling. In the Oresteia, the son stands squarely on the side of the father. Liberation from the mother has gone a stage further. Just as in Indian mythology, Rama, at the behest of his father, beheads his mother with an axe, so in the Oresteia, and again with variations in Hamlet, the spirit of the father is the impelling force that compasses the death of the sinful mother. Here, identification with the father is so complete that the maternal principle can be killed even when it appears not in the symbolic form of a dragon, but as the real mother, and killed precisely because this principle has sinned against the father principle. As a defense against the mother world of vengeful furies, who hound down the matricide with intent to kill him, Orestes has for his ally the world of light. Apollo and Athene help him to obtain justice, and justice in this case means the setting up of a new law opposed to the old matriarchal law which knows no forgiveness for the inexpiable crime of mother murder. His cause is espoused by the goddess Athene, who herself was not born of woman, but sprang from the head of Zeus, and whose nature, therefore, is profoundly inimical to the chthonic feminine element in every mother and every woman born of a mother. This Athene aspect of woman is bound up with the psychological significance of the anima sister. It is this same virginal quality which comes to the aid of the hero in his fight with a mother dragon and helps him to overcome his terror of the erroneous face of the feminine unconscious. Chapter 3 The Slaying of the Father But if the fight with a dragon means incest with a mother, what does the slaying of the father mean, particularly in view of the fact 
that we described the dragon fight and mother incest as pre-patriarchal, that is to say, not bound to a patriarchal form of society or to the patriarchal family. If the dragon does not, as Freud and the early Jung thought, symbolize fear of the father who bars the way to the mother, but rather the mother herself in all her fearfulness, then we must explain why the hero's fight is connected with the murder of the father. The dangers of the unconscious, its rending, destroying, devouring, and castrating character, confront the hero as monsters, prodigies, beasts, giants, and so forth, which he has to conquer. An analysis of these figures shows that they are bisexual, like the Ouroboros, possessing masculine and feminine symbolic qualities. Accordingly, the hero has both the first parents against him and must overcome the masculine as well as the feminine part of the Ouroboros. To reduce all these figures to a father figure is an arbitrary and dogmatic violation of the facts. The situation of the hero presupposes very much more complicated parental relationships than the simplification of the Freudian family romance would allow. The type of hero represented, for instance, by Heracles, who is helped by his father and persecuted by his wicked stepmother, cannot be interpreted according to the same scheme that fits the Oedipus myth. Before we can interpret the murder of the father, there must be a fundamental clarification of the father principle. The structure of the father, whether personal or transpersonal, is two-sided, like that of the mother, positive and negative. In mythology there stands beside the creative, positive father, the destructive, negative father. And both father images are as alive in the soul of modern man as they were in the projections of mythology. There is, however, between the ego's relation to the father and father image and its relation to the mother and mother image, a difference whose significance from masculine and feminine psychology must not be underestimated. In relation to the ego, the mother image has both a productive and a destructive aspect, but over and above that, it preserves a certain immutability and eternality. Although it is two-faced and can assume many shapes, for the ego and consciousness it always remains the world of the origin, the world of the unconscious. In general, therefore, the mother represents the instinctual side of life, which, compared with the changing positions of the ego and consciousness, proves to be constant and relatively unalterable, whether it be good or bad, helpful and productive, or hurtful and terrible. Whereas man's ego and his consciousness have changed to an extraordinary degree during the last six thousand years, the unconscious, the mother, is a psychic structure that would seem to be fixed eternally and almost unalterably. Even when the mother image takes on the character of the spiritual mother, Sophia, it retains its unchangingness, for it is an embodiment of the everlasting and all-embracing, the healing, sustaining, loving, and saving principle. It is eternal in a sense quite different from that in which the father image is eternal. The transformations and developments in the creative background are in unconscious symbolism always correlated with masculine mobility and dynamism as expressed in the Logos son. In comparison with him, the mover and the moved, Sophia is the maternally quiescent. This is clearly revealed in modern psychology, where the significance of the personal mother is eclipsed by the mother archetype to a far greater degree than is the case with a personal father. The mother image is less conditioned by the temporal and cultural pattern. On the other hand, Besides the archetypal image of the father, the personal father image also has a significance, though it is conditioned less by his individual person than by the character of the culture and the changing cultural values which he represents. There is a broad resemblance between the mother figures of primitive, classical, medieval, and modern times. They remain embedded in nature. 
but the father figure changes with the culture he represents. Although in this case, too, there is in the background an indefinite archetypal figure of a spiritual father or creator god, it is an empty form. It is only filled out by the father figures that vary with the development of culture. As Van der Leeu says, when, for example, the myths call God the Father, they do so not on a given paternal basis, but because they set up a father figure to which every given father figure has to adjust itself. The male collective, which bodies forth the archetypal father figure to the creation of myths, imparts to the visible form of the archetype a critical stamp and coloring determined by the cultural situation. Our contention, that there is an essential difference between the father image and the mother image, confirms and supplements in a most surprising way one of Jung's central discoveries, namely the anima psychology of man and the animus psychology of woman. The empirical fact, which has hitherto been extremely difficult to explain, that the woman's unconscious is inhabited by a multiplicity of masculine spirit animus figures, contrasted with a single Janus-faced soul anima figure in the unconscious of man, now becomes more intelligible. The cultural diversity of what we have termed heaven, that is to say the numerous father-husband images known to humanity, has left a deposit in the unconscious experience of woman just as in the case with the uniform mother-wife image in the unconscious experience of man. In pre-patriarchal conditions, the men and the elders stand for heaven, and they transmit the collective cultural heritage of their day and generation. The fathers are the representatives of law and order, from the earliest taboos to the most modern juridical systems. They hand down the highest values of civilization whereas the mothers control the highest, that is to say, deepest, values of life and nature. The world of the fathers is thus the world of collective values. It is historical and related to the fluctuating level of conscious and cultural development within the group. The prevailing system of cultural values, that is to say, the canon of values which gives a culture its peculiar physiognomy and its stability, has its roots in the fathers, the grown men who represent and reinforce the religious, ethical, political, and social structure of the collective. These fathers are the guardians of masculinity and the supervisors of all education. That is to say, their existence is not merely symbolical. As pillars of the institutions that embody the cultural canon, they preside over the upbringing of each individual and certify his coming of age. It makes no difference how this cultural canon is constituted, whether its laws and taboos be those of a tribe of headhunters or of a Christian nation. Always the fathers see to it that the current values are impressed upon the young people, and that only those who have identified themselves with those values are included among the adults. The advocacy of the canon of values inherited from the fathers and enforced by education, manifests itself in the psychic structure of the individual as conscience. This paternal authority, whose necessity for culture and the development of consciousness is beyond dispute, differs from the maternal authority in that it is essentially relative, being conditioned by its day and generation, and not having the absolute character of the maternal authority. In normal times, when culture is stable and the paternal canon remains in force for generations, the father-son relationship consists in handing down these values to the son and impressing them upon him, after he has passed the tests of initiation in puberty. Such times, and the psychology that goes with them, are distinguished by the fact that there is no father-son problem or only the barest suggestion of one. We must not be deceived by the different experience of our own extraordinary age. The monotonous sameness of fathers and sons is the rule in a stable culture. This sameness only means 
that the paternal canon of rights and institutions which make the youth an adult and the father an elder holds undisputed sway, so that the young man undergoes his prescribed transition to adulthood just as naturally as the father undergoes his to old age. There is, however, one exception to this, and the exception is the creative individual, the hero. As Barlach says, the hero has to awaken the sleeping images of the future which can and must come forth from the night in order to give the world a new and better face. This necessarily makes him a breaker of the old law. He is the enemy of the old ruling system, of the old cultural values, and the existing court of conscience, and so he necessarily comes into conflict with the fathers and their spokesman, the personal father. In this conflict, the inner voice, the command of the transpersonal father or father archetype who wants the world to change, collides with the personal father who speaks for the old law. We know this conflict best from the Bible story of Jehovah's command to Abraham. Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, Genesis 12, 1, which the Midrash interprets as meaning that Abraham is to destroy the gods of his father. The message of Jesus is only an extension of the same conflict, and it repeats itself in every revolution. Whether the new picture of God in the world conflicts with an old picture or with the personal father is unimportant, for the father always represents the old order and hence also the old picture current in his cultural canon. If we keep to ranks summing up of the situation, we can begin with two statements. The first averse that the hero is the child of aristocratic parents, generally a king's son which incidentally is only partly true, because a large number of heroes and redeemers are of lowly origin. And the second, that the father always receives a warning. In addition to this, there are the extraordinary circumstances of the hero's birth, the fact that he is begotten by a god and born of a virgin. What the symbols and myths tell us about the essential nature of the hero can now be understood. The virgin mother, connected directly with the god who engenders the new order, but only indirectly with the husband, gives birth to the hero, who is destined to bring that new order into being and destroy the old. For this reason, the hero is frequently exposed with his mother, because a prophecy declares that her child will take over the rulership from the old king. The hero's descent from the reigning family is symbolic of the struggle for the system of rulership, for that is what the struggle is really about. A significant deviation from the general mythological pattern is the story of Moses, which Freud tried in vain to interpret along reductive lines. In general, the hero child is cast out from the unfriendly reigning house by the father king, only to be triumphantly reinstated later on. In the Moses story, the situation is somewhat different. Firstly, he is not a king's son, but a foundling. Secondly, although Pharaoh, the mythological terrible father, is as anxious as ever to have the hero child assassinated, slaying of the firstborn, not only does he not succeed in this, but Jehovah, the transpersonal father, with the help of Pharaoh's daughter, and in contradiction to the mythological pattern, brings the Redeemer child back into the alien system of rulership, which he should have overthrown, and from which he was to have been expelled. In this Hebrew variant, the relationship to the personal father, Amram, is preserved in a positive sense, but only as a side issue. The real reason why Jehovah's protege is installed in the household of the god king Pharaoh is to bring out the transpersonal meaning of the conflict already apparent in the hero's birth. We find an analogous situation in the myth of Heracles, although this is derived from a different sphere of culture and another level of being. Here the wicked father king, Eurystheus, who is in league with the goddess Hera, the jealous stepmother, 
imposes the labors which the hero performs with the aid of his divine father, Zeus. It is precisely the persecutions and dangers heaped upon him by the hateful father figure that make him a hero. The obstacles put in his way by the old patriarchal system become inner incentives to heroism, and so far as the killing of the father is concerned, Rank is quite right when he says that the heroism lies in overcoming the father who instigated the hero's exposure and set him the tasks. It is equally right to say that the hero, by solving the tasks which the father imposed with intent to destroy him, develops from a dissatisfied son into a socially valuable reformer, a conqueror of man-eating monsters that ravage the countryside, an inventor, a founder of cities, and bringer of culture. But only if we take the transpersonal background into account do we arrive at an interpretation which does justice to the hero as a maker of human history, and which sees in the hero myth a great prototypal event honored by all mankind. It is no uxorious gorilla father who, as Pater Familias drives out his sons to protect himself from the violence of his offspring, fast growing up and thirsting for power. No wicked king packs off his son to slay the monster, which is himself, as the nonsensical psychoanalytical interpretation would have us believe. No, the dragon fight as we now see it presents a very different picture. Two father and two mother figures have to be borne in mind. The wicked king, or personal father figure, representing the old ruling system, sends the hero forth to fight the monster, sphinx, witches, giants, wild beasts, etc., hoping that it will prove his undoing. This fight is the struggle with the Uroboric great mother, with the unconscious, to which the hero may easily succumb because it is the seat of the ego's anxiety and holds the threat of impotence. With the help of his divine father, however, the hero succeeds in vanquishing the monster. His higher nature and noble birth are victorious, and are themselves proven in the victory. The ruin wished upon him by the negative father redounds to his glory and to the negative father's own ruin. Thus the old king's expulsion of the son the hero's fight and the killing of the father hang together in a meaningful way. They form a necessary canon of events which, in symbol and in fact, are presupposed by the very existence of the hero who, as the bringer of the new, has to destroy the old. At his side there stands the good mother, in the shape of his own mother and the sisterly virgin, either fused together or as two separate figures. The Divine Father may intervene in the critical situations as a helper, or he may remain waiting in the wings. Waiting because only if the hero stands the test will he prove his genuine sonship, just as Horus could only be recognized as the true son of Osiris after he had overthrown Set. Thus, waiting and testing, the Divine Father may easily be confused with a negative father for the father who sends forth his son into danger is an ambiguous figure with personal and impersonal characteristics. But always the hero, as bringer of the new, is the instrument of a new manifestation of the father god. In him, the patriarchal gods struggle against the great mother, the invaders' gods against the indigenous gods, Jehovah against the gods of the heathen. Basically, it is a struggle between two god images or sets of gods, the old father god defending himself against the new sun god, and the old polytheistic system resisting usurpation by the new monotheism, as is exemplified by the archetypal wars of the gods. The picture becomes more complicated when the hero ceases to be an instrument of the gods and begins to play his own independent part as a human being and when he finally becomes, in modern man, a battleground for suprapersonal forces where the human ego pits itself against the deity. As breaker of the old law, man becomes the opponent of the old system, 
and the bringer of the new, which he confers upon mankind against the will of the old deity. The most typical example of this is the Promethean theft of fire. Another is the story of paradise, as interpreted by the Gnostics. Here, Jehovah is the vengeful old god, while Adam, in league with Eve and the serpent, is the hero who imparts the new knowledge to mankind. But he is also the son of a new father god, the Redeemer, who brings the new system to birth. As in all Gnostic systems, he is the son of the higher unknown deity and must take upon himself the struggle with the old. At this point, we must make an attempt to sort out, into separate layers, the hero's experience of the terrible male. The hero, as we have said, fights the androgynous figure of the Ouroboros. In the cosmic projection of celestial battles, we find at the outset the battle between light and darkness, where darkness is associated with a number of symbolic components, and light is always identified with a hero, whether he be a moon, sun, or star hero. The devouring darkness, however, can appear in feminine form, as Tiamat, Chaos, etc., just as easily as in the masculine form of a monster like Set or the Fenris wolf. Thus all child-eating father figures stand for the masculine aspect of the Ouroboros and the masculine negative side of the first parents. In these figures, the accent falls primarily on the devouring force, that is to say, the uterine cavern. Even when they later appear in the Patriarchate as genuine, terrible father figures, for example, Cronus or Moloch, their Urobore character is transparent so long as the symbolism of eating is in the foreground and hence their propinquity to the Great Mother. Similarly, the phallic, phonic earth and sea divinities are, as Bachhofen has rightly discerned, simply satellites of the Great Mother. For Hippolytus, the Great Mother is Aphrodite. For Perseus, she is the Medusa. And in both myths, Poseidon, although he appears as an independent god, remains the instrument of the Great Mother's destructive will. The earlier stage in which we met the languishing figure of the adolescent, the hero of ego-consciousness, and which we described as being under the dominance of the Great Mother, really comprises two stages. The first, when the doomed and sorrowful hero succumbs to the Great Mother. The second, when his resistance increases and he finds himself in a hopeless situation of conflict. The second stage of mounting resistance corresponds to a narcissistic turning away from the Great Mother, and it is at this point that the passive fate of being castrated and driven mad is superseded by active self-castration and suicide. The young hero's growing masculinity now experiences the destructive side of the Great Mother as something masculine. It is her murderous satellites, with whom are connected the destructive elements stone and iron, who carry out the sacrifice of the adolescent son. In mythology, this side manifests itself as a dark, homicidal male force, a savage animal, in particular the boar, which is akin to the sow, symbol of the Great Mother, but later it manifests itself as her masculine warrior consort or as the priest who performs the castration. The male's experience of himself, his sacrifice as a male by another male in the old fertility rites, for instance, begins at this point. When, with growing self-awareness, he experiences his relation to an opponent, and the sacrificed realizes his identity with a sacrificiant, and vice versa, the hitherto cosmic opposition of light and darkness is experienced as an opposition between human or divine twins, and the long succession of fraternal feuds in mythology opens with the squabbles between Osiris and Set, Baal and Mot. The earliest stage of the twin-brother conflict, based on the natural periodic rhythm of summer and winter, day and night, life and death, is still entirely under the dominance of the Great Mother. The dark, negative death force of the male is experienced as her destructive instrument, 
just as sociologically and mythologically Set, the maternal uncle of Horus, is the instrument of the hostile executive power of the matriarchate. As masculine self-consciousness grows stronger, the stage of matriarchy is followed by that of division. Symptomatic of this transition period is the twin brother motif in mythology, which expresses the mutual affinity of opposites. This division turns destructively against itself in self-mutilation and suicide. As we saw in Uroboric and matriarchal castration, the will of the Great Mother was paramount. But the centroversion tendency which underlies the ego-hero's struggle for self-preservation, and which first takes the form of anxiety, advances beyond the passive narcissistic stage and turns into resistance, defiance, and aggression directed against the Great Mother, as illustrated mythologically in the story of Hippolytus. The destruction of an ego system hostile to the unconscious, symbolized in the myths as persecution, dismemberment, and madness, presupposes an ego that has attained a relatively high degree of autonomy and maturity. The fact that for the great mother, the father and son are nothing but the fertilizing phallus can also be formulated from the masculine standpoint by saying that victor and victim are always the same the triumphant sacrificer himself becomes a future sacrifice. Consciousness of the bond between the male opponents is the beginning of masculine self-consciousness. This is not to say that the sacrificer and the sacrificed develop personal feelings for one another. Since the processes described are transpersonal, we are only permitted to draw conclusions from typical events. One such typical event is that the subordinate male group in the matriarchate gradually experiences and asserts its independence and no longer allows itself to be made the tool of rituals inimical to it. The development of masculine self-consciousness is both the cause and the product of this self-discovery, and gradually male enmities are replaced by male friendships. Accentuation of the man-to-man -man relationship eventually leads to the overthrow of the matriarchate by patriarchal rulers. Just as in Sparta, with its late matriarchal conditions, a strongly marked masculine relationship is to be observed among pairs of young warriors. So, at a much earlier date, we find the same thing in the Gilgamesh epic and numerous other hero myths. The countless male friendships in Greek mythology vindicate themselves like that between Gilgamesh and Engidu, in the hero's fight with the great mother dragon. The principle of opposites which formerly divided the hostile brothers has now become the principle of brotherhood. These friendly alliances often exist between unequal brothers, who, despite the fact that one is mortal and the other immortal, must be regarded as twins. We recall in connection with the hero's birth that very often the immortal twin and his mortal brother were both begotten in the same night by different fathers. These two parts now combine. In every case, the man-to-man -man relationship strengthens consciousness and invigorates the ego principle, no matter whether the alliance appears psychologically as the combination of ego and shadow or the combination of ego and self. That is to say, on one level, the ego's assimilation of the earthly shadow brother, that is to say, its instinctual, destructive, and self-destroying side, is more evident, while on another, it is the alliance of the earthly ego with its immortal twin brother, the self. In contrast to the passive, self-absorbed, and narcissistic resistance to the mother, the fleeting defiance and self-destruction this strengthening of masculine consciousness leads the ego to pit itself against the supremacy of the matriarchate, a process that can be followed out sociologically as well as psychologically. Sociologically, the advance is from matrilocal matriarchal marriage to a patrilocal matriarchal marriage, and finally to patriarchal marriage. The depotentiation of the female can be seen most clearly in the status of woman, 
At first, as the birth giver, she had complete control over her child. There was no father to contend with, particularly while the connection between the sexual act and birth remained unrecognized. Later, the father was a stranger institutionally excluded from exercising authority over the children. In the patriarchate, on the other hand, the father who begets the child is its master, and woman is only the vessel, the birth passage, the nurse. We have a corresponding psychological process when, with the strengthening of masculinity and ego consciousness, the fight with the mother dragon becomes the hero's that is to say, the egos struggle for self-liberation. In this struggle, the union of the hero with the masculine heaven brings about a self-regeneration in which the male reproduces himself without the aid of a female. The rise of the patriarchate brings with it a revaluation. The matriarchate, representing the supremacy of the unconscious, now becomes negative. Consequently, the mother assumes the character of dragon and terrible mother. She is the old order that has to be surpassed. In her stead, there appears the elder brother, the maternal uncle, bearer of the authority complex in the matriarchate, as we find it in the conflict between Set and Horus. The conflict between maternal uncle and son is eventually replaced by that between father and son. This development shows very clearly how the archetypal link between the bad old order and the enemy changes with the different stages of consciousness and is projected upon different carriers, but still continues to exist as such because archetypal. For the hero who represents the new consciousness, the hostile dragon is the old order, the obsolete psychic stage which threatens to swallow him up again. The most comprehensive and earliest form of this is the terrible mother. She is followed by the authoritarian male representative of the matriarchate, the maternal uncle. He is followed by the unfriendly old king, and only then do we get the father. The killing of the father in mythology is part of the problem of the first parents, and is not to be derived from the personal parents, much less from the son's sexual fixation to the mother. The conjectured originality of the patriarchal family is, as Brifo has rightly seen, a psychological residue caused by excessive reliance upon biblical research. With the refutation of this conjecture, the father-murder theory collapses, and with it the Oedipus complex and the anthropological proofs which Freud attempted in Totem and Taboo. Mythology makes it clear that Horus was positive to his father and negative to his maternal uncle Set, in whom, as we know, all authority was invested in the matriarchal family. This confirms Malinovsky's findings that in primitive societies founded upon matriarchal law there is a wish to kill not the father, but the mother's brother, who represents discipline, authority, and executive power within the family. The intention to kill, or rather the ambivalence underlying it, is therefore in no sense sexually based, and does not aim at possession of the mother. The boy's relation to the father who possesses the mother sexually is, if anything, tender. But against the maternal uncle, for whom the mother was sexually and in all other respects taboo from earliest childhood, there is nevertheless a death wish. And if in these cultures the sexually tabooed sister is unconsciously desired, she is as much taboo for the maternal uncle as for the boy himself, so that the motive of sexual jealousy breaks down in the case of the sister as well. Why then the death wish? Because the maternal uncle is the carrier of what we named heaven, which stands for masculinity. Malinovsky says of this maternal uncle, that he brings duty, prohibition, and coercion into the children's lives. He wields the power, he is idealized, and to him the mother and children are subject. Through him the boy acquires ideas like social ambition, fame, pride of birth, and feelings for his tribe, hope of future riches, and social position. 
It is against this authority who stands for collective law that the boy's death wish is directed, whether because his infantile side feels this authority to be overbearing or his heroic side feels it to be restrictive. It is through the maternal uncle, therefore, that the collectively determined super-ego component of the father archetype, conscience, is experienced. His killing has nothing and can have nothing to do with rivalry for the mother, because no such rivalry exists. We appreciate that the term father archetype is colored by our own patriarchal culture, but we retain it nevertheless because it helps to make our meaning clear. This resounding defeat for a psychoanalytical theory is particularly instructive in that it shows up the psychoanalyst's habit of making a spurious universal principle out of late personalistic phenomena. But it is also significant because it proves the importance of transpersonal factors such as the authoritarian side of the father archetype. The transpersonal factor is projected upon different objects, sometimes upon the maternal uncle and sometimes upon the father, according to the sociological and historical situation. But in every case, there must be an encounter with the carrier of this factor, for without the murder of the father, no development of consciousness and personality is possible. With the accession to power of the male, there also follows an intensified rivalry among the male groups which grows in proportion to the expansion of individual villages, tribes, and states, and the accumulation of property. Primitive culture is characterized by a rigid isolation of separate groups, sometimes carried to such grotesque length that different tribes inhabiting the same island do not know one another and remain in a state of xenophobia that is prehistoric. The spread of civilization creates increasing cross-connections and cross-conflicts. So begins man's political life, which is almost always identical with the rise of the patriarchate. And with it, there comes another shift in the principle of opposites, namely the masculine opposition between young and old, although originally this was in no sense identical with the father-son conflict. Originally, at the sacrifice of the seasonal king and fertility ritual, the representative of the old year or year cycle was just as young as the new king who succeeded him after his death. Only by virtue of his identification with the year was he symbolically old and therefore doomed to die. The lamentation, which even in quite late times was followed without any pause by resurrection, testifies to the ritual nature of this sacrifice. It also disproves the naturalistic explanation that the vegetation was killed by the summer heat and rose again in the spring. That would be to assume that between death and resurrection there lay a period of drought and winter time, a spell of some duration, which is not at all the case. On the contrary, the resurrection, originally that of the new king, followed immediately upon the death of the old. The conflict between the two kings was only a symbolical and not a factual conflict between old and young. Later, during the transition to the patriarchate, the annual king, or the secular king who reigned for a few years, was replaced by a king who had the right to defend his life in battle. The king, renewed annually or at longer intervals, had as his deputy a seasonal king who was sacrificed, though this was later superseded by the sacrifice of an animal. In this way, the permanent king, whose vitality represented the fertility of the group, could now really grow old and become feeble, and was expected to survive the fight with his deputy, or with anyone who challenged him. So long as he was victorious, he remained king. If conquered, he was sacrificed, and the victor succeeded him. Only with the institution of the permanent king, as described by Fraser, therefore, does there arise any conflict between old and young, the permanent king representing the old and his opponent the young? This early stage of the patriarchate was of great importance for the hero myth, because then and then only does the conflict arise between the old king and the young hero. The mythological element, 
The conflict between stepfather and hero is not a disguise for a conflict between the personal father and son. Again and again, we see from ancient history that the founding of dynasties by heroes and the overthrow of old kings and old dynasties are historical realities. The underlying principle of opposites, even when it appears in symbolical form, is much earlier than the patriarchal family and cannot be derived from or reduced to it. The terrible male who has to be killed and whose final form is the terrible father has then an antecedent history, which is not the case with a terrible mother. This confirms our hypothesis of the constant nature of the mother archetype and the cultural complexion of the father archetype. Compared with the uniform frightfulness of the mother dragon, the father dragon is a culturally stratified structure. From this angle also, she is nature, he is culture. The terrible male, like the terrible female, is always old and evil and to be overthrown, at any rate for the hero whose task it is to achieve something out of the common. The terrible male, however, functions not only as a principle that disintegrates consciousness, but even more as one that fixes it in a wrong direction. It is he who prevents the continued development of the ego and upholds the old system of consciousness. He is the destructive instrument of the matriarchate as its henchman. He is its authority as the maternal uncle. He is the negative force of self-destruction and the will to regression as the twin. And finally, he is the authority of the patriarchate as the terrible father. The terrible father appears to the hero in two transpersonal figures, as the phallic earth father and the frightening spirit father. The Earth Father, Lord of all phonic forces, belongs psychologically to the realm of the Great Mother. He manifests himself most commonly as the overwhelming aggressiveness of phallic instinct or as a destructive monster. But whenever the ego is overwhelmed by the sexual, aggressive, or power instincts of the male, or by any other form of instinct, we can see the dominance of the Great Mother for she is the instinctual ruler of the unconscious, mistress of animals, and the phallic, terrible father is only her satellite, not a masculine principle of equal weight. But the other side of the terrible father, who thwarts the son and hinders his self-development, is spiritual rather than phallic. Just as in Barlach's Der Tote Tag, the terrible earth mother prevents her son from becoming a hero and thus castrates him, so there is a terrible father who castrates the son by not letting him achieve self-fulfillment and victory. Once again, this father is transpersonal. He acts, as it were, like a spiritual system, which from beyond and above captures and destroys the son's consciousness. This spiritual system appears as the binding force of the old law, the old religion, the old morality, the old order as conscience, convention, tradition, or any other spiritual phenomenon that seizes hold of the sun and obstructs his progress into the future. Any content that functions through its emotional dynamisms, such as the paralyzing grip of inertia or an invasion by instinct, belongs to the sphere of the mother, to nature. But all contents capable of conscious realization, a value, an idea, a moral canon, or some other spiritual force, are related to the father, never to the mother system. Patriarchal castration has two forms, captivity and possession. In captivity, the ego remains totally dependent upon the father as the representative of collective norms. That is, it identifies with a lower father and thus loses its connection with the creative powers. It remains bound by traditional morality and conscience, and as though castrated by convention, loses the higher half of its dual nature. The other form of patriarchal castration is identification with the father god. This leads to the possessed state of heavenly inflation, annihilation through the spirit. Here, too, the ego hero loses consciousness of his dual nature by losing touch with his earthly part. Behind patriarchal castration through inflation, 
there looms the devouring figure of the Ouroboros, combining in itself the voracity of the male and of the female. In the vortex of the divine Pleroma, the paternal and maternal aspects of the Ouroboros fuse into one. Annihilation through the spirit, that is to say, through the heavenly father, and annihilation through the unconscious, that is to say, through the earth mother, are identical, as the study of every psychosis teaches. The collective spiritual forces are as much parts of the Ouroboros as the collective instinctual forces pulling in the opposite direction. Annihilation through the spirit is a motif that occurs as early as the Babylonian Etana myth, where the hero is borne up to heaven by an eagle and crashes to earth. Here, the unattainable heaven is related to the mother goddess Ishtar, who, uroborically speaking, is heaven and earth at once. The same mythological situation is repeated in Icarus, who flies too near the sun, and in Bellerophon, who attempts to reach heaven on the winged horse Pegasus, but crashes to earth and goes mad. The hubris of Theseus and other heroes depicts a similar constellation. Just because he is begotten by God, the hero must be devout and fully conscious of what he is doing. If he acts in the arrogance of egomania, which the Greeks called hubris, and does not reverence the numinosum against which he strives, then his deeds will infallibly come to naught. To fly too high and fall, to go too deep and get stuck, these are alike symptoms of an overvaluation of the ego that ends in disaster, death, or madness. An overweening contempt for the transpersonal powers above and below means falling victim to them, whether the hero crashes to earth like Etana, or plunges into the sea like Icarus, or sticks fast to the underworld like Theseus, or is chained to the rock like Prometheus, or does penance like the Titans. Patriarchal castration, involving as it must the sacrifice of man's earthly side, leads no less than matriarchal castration to the sacrifice of the phallus. This is yet another indication of the mysterious identity of the paternal with the maternal Ouroboros. Consequently, Castration symbols often occur in those who are overpowered by the spirit, for example, in Gnosis and the mystery religions. In the Gnostic Attis cult hymn, Attis is identified with Adonis, Osiris, Hermes, Adamas, Corybus, and Papas, it being said of all of them that they are the corpse, god, and baron. The element already encountered in the strugglers against the matriarchate reappears here, namely self-castration as an act of defiance against the Great Mother. The Gnostic strugglers are possessed by the Spirit Father. Fascinated, they succumb to patriarchal castration and thus to the Ouroboric Pleroma, which proves to be the Great Mother and the very thing they were trying to resist. They are overtaken by the same fate as the strugglers in the myth. Nevertheless, Patriarchal castration has a somewhat different coloring. Whereas matriarchal castration is orgiastic, the other tends towards asceticism. As with all extremes, the two forms overlap. For instance, certain Gnostic sects indulged in sexual orgies, but these were nullified in a typically Gnostic manner. The orgy, being an ecstatic phenomenon, was related to the spirit father, while at the same time the fertility principle attributed to the mother deity or the demiurge was negated to the point of systematic abortion and child murder. Father's sons are the parallels of the mother's sons already discussed. They owe their impotence to patriarchal castration, for which, when it takes the form of captivity, we could coin the term Isaac complex. Abraham is prepared to offer up his son Isaac who trusts him implicitly? We shall not consider the religious and psychological situation of Abraham, because here we are solely concerned with that of the son. Two symptoms are characteristic. The first, clearly indicated in the Bible, is Isaac's utter reliance upon his father, whom he follows in all things without ever standing on his own feet. The second is the peculiar nature of his religious experience, 
that is to say, of that part of his personality which is able to stand alone and which experiences God as Pachad Yitzchak, Isaac's fear and trembling. In all such cases of impotence and excessive respect for the law, conscience, or the authority of the old collective father, drowns the inner voice which announces the new manifestation of the divine. Just as with mother's sons the father god is eclipsed by the terrible mother, and they themselves are unconsciously held fast in the womb and cut off from the creative solar side of life, so for the father's sons the hero-bearing goddess is blotted out by the terrible father. They live entirely on the conscious plane and are incarcerated in a kind of spiritual uterus that never allows them to reach the fruitful feminine side of themselves, the creative unconscious. In this way, they are castrated like the mother's sons. The heroism that has been stifled in them manifests itself as sterile conservatism and a reactionary identification with the father, which lacks the living dialectical struggle between the generations. The reverse side of this father complex, which by no means implies liberation from it, is to be found in the Eternal Son, the permanent revolutionary. He identifies himself with a dragon-slaying hero, but is totally unconscious of his divine sonship. The absence of father identification prevents the eternal youth from ever obtaining his kingdom. His refusal to become a father and to assume power seems to him a guarantee of perpetual youth, for to assume power is to accept the fact that it must be passed on to a future son and ruler. The individualist is essentially non-archetypal, that is to say, the eternal revolutionary, as he grows older, turns out to be a neurotic who is not prepared to be his age and accept his limitations. To negate the Isaac complex is not to get beyond it. Thus, the hero's task in fighting the dragon is not merely to overcome the mother, but the father also. The conflict is never personal, but is always transpersonal. Even where the personal parents play a part, and in practice they always do so, their personal share is relatively small, while that of the transpersonal parental imagos acting through them is enormously important. When we examine the history of the individual, we find that the personal reality of the parents is not only distorted, but may sometimes be completely inverted, if the archetypal canon demands it. Even Freud observed with astonishment that a prohibition may be obstinately attributed to the parent who never expressed any such thing. Time and again it happens that aside from the secondary personalization which always conveys a false picture to the ego, the operative factors are the transpersonal components of the unconscious. The ego's encounter with these transpersonal factors alone creates personality and builds up its authorities. For this, the hero serves as a model. His deeds and his sufferings illustrate what will later fall to the lot of every individual. The formation of the personality is symbolically portrayed in his life. He is the first personality and his example is followed by all who become personalities. The three basic elements in the hero myth were the hero, the dragon, and the treasure. The nature of the hero was made clear in the chapter dealing with his birth, and that of the dragon in the chapters on the slaying of the mother and father. It still remains to analyze the third element, the goal of the dragon fight. This goal whether it be the beloved, the maiden in distress, or the treasure hard to attain, is intimately linked with what happens to the hero in the course of the fight. Only in this struggle does a hero show himself a hero and change his nature, for whether he is the doer who redeems or the conqueror who liberates, what he transforms transforms him too. Therefore, the third and last stage is the transformation myth. The nature and creation myths of the first stage, which led in the hero myth to the battle of the natures, culminate in the triumphal myth of transformation, of which it is written, Nature rules over nature. C. 
The Transformation Myth Nature Rules Over Nature Chapter 1 The Captive and the Treasure The mythological goal of the dragon fight is almost always the virgin, the captive, or more generally, the treasure hard to attain. It is to be noted that a purely material pile of gold, such as the Horde of the Nibelungs, is a late and degenerate form of the original motif. In the earliest mythologies, in ritual, in religion, and in mystical literature, as well as in fairy tales, legend, and poetry, gold and precious stones, but particularly diamonds and pearls, were originally symbolic carriers of immaterial values. Likewise, the water of life, the healing herb, the elixir of immortality, the philosopher's stone, miracle rings and wishing rings, magic hoods and winged cloaks, are all symbols of the treasure. There is one phenomenon which is of great importance in psychological interpretation, and this phenomenon we would call the typological dual focus of myth and symbol. This only means that it is the nature of myths and fairy tales to work in equal measure, though in different ways, upon contrary psychological types. That is to say, the extrovert as well as the introvert finds himself portrayed and addressed in the myth. For this reason, the myth must be interpreted on the objective level for the extrovert and on the subjective level for the introvert. But both interpretations are necessary and meaningful. To take an example, the captive on the objective level is to be understood as a real living woman. The problem of the man-woman relationship, its difficulties and its solutions, will then find its prototype in the myth, and so, as an external event, this motif can be understood by the naivest intelligence. But in primitive times, when the question of a partner presented no such problem as it does for us moderns, the winning and setting free of the captive meant very much more. The fight for her was a form of encounter between male and female, but like the first mother and the first father, this female is transpersonal and stands for a collective psychic element in mankind. Thus, besides interpretation on the objective level, there is from the very beginning another equally valid interpretation which sees the captive as something within, namely the soul herself. The myths deal with the relation of the masculine ego to this soul and with the adventures and perils of the fight and her final deliverance. So much prominence is given to the miraculous and unreal in the events leading up to the goal of the dragon fight that the events taking place in the psychic background, which for the introvert is the center of attention, must unquestionably have depicted themselves in the mythological symbolism. Naturally, the typologically different reactions, laying emphasis now on the psychic background and now on the world as an external object, always remain unconscious. The background events in the soul are projected outwards and are experienced through the object as a synthetic unity compounded of external reality and the psychic activation of this reality. The myth and its symbolism, however, are characterized by a preponderance of inner psychic element, which distinguishes the mythological event from the factual event. Besides the dual focus of the mythological motifs, psychological interpretation has also to consider the juxtaposition of personalistic and transpersonal factors. Not that the difference between a personalistic and a transpersonal interpretation is identical with the difference we have already indicated between the views of the extroverted and introverted type. Both types can have archetypal experiences, just as both can be limited to the purely personalistic plane. For instance, the introvert can stick to the personal contents of his consciousness or of his personal unconscious which are full of significance for him, while the extrovert can experience the transpersonal nature of the world through the object. Hence, the captive, as an interior quantity, 
can be experienced both personalistically and transpersonally on the subjective level, just as it can be experienced personalistically and transpersonally as an exterior feminine quality. A personalistic interpretation is no more identical with the objective level than a transpersonal interpretation with the subjective level. The myth, being a projection of the transpersonal collective unconscious, depicts transpersonal events, and whether interpreted objectively or subjectively, in no case is a personalistic interpretation adequate. Moreover, the subjective interpretation which sees the myth as a transpersonal psychic event is, in view of the myth's origins in the collective unconscious, much fairer than an attempt to interpret it objectively, for example, as a meteorological or astral event. Consequently, the hero myth is never concerned with a private history of an individual, but always with some prototypal and transpersonal event of collective significance. Even quasi-personal traits have an archetypal meaning, however much the individual heroes, their fates, and the goals of their respective dragon fights may appear to differ from one another. Again, even when we interpret the fight and its goal subjectively, as a process going on within the hero, it is really a transpersonal process. Although they appear as inner events, the victory and transformation of the hero are valid for all mankind. They are held up for our contemplation, to be lived out in our own lives, or at least re-experienced by us. While modern historiography, with its personalistic bias, is inclined to represent the collective events in the life of nations and mankind as being dependent upon the personalistic whims of monarchs and leaders, the myth reflects the transpersonal reality behind the singular events in the life of the hero. In a large number of myths, the goal of the hero's fight is the rescue of a captive from the power of a monster. This monster is archetypally a dragon, or where archetypal and personalistic features are intermingled, a witch or a magician, or personalistically a wicked father or wicked mother. So far, we have tried to interpret the fight with a dragon as an encounter with the mother-father archetype. It remains to clarify the relation of the captive and the treasure to the guardian powers symbolized by the two-faced dragon, and to explain what the goal means to the hero himself. In the end, the captive always marries the hero. Union with her is the essential outcome of dragon fights all the world over. The old fertility myths and the rituals underlying all spring and new year festivals form the cultic prototype of which the hero myth is a segment. The overcoming of monsters and enemies is the condition of the young hero king's triumphal union with the earth goddess, which magically restores the fertility of the year. The freeing and winning of the captive through the dragon fight is an offshoot of this old fertility ritual. We have already discussed the development of the hero's masculinity in his fight with a dragon and the overpowering of the terrible mother with which it is identical. The freeing and winning of the captive form a further stage in the evolution of masculine consciousness. The transformation which the male undergoes in the course of the dragon fight includes a change in his relation to the female, symbolically expressed in the liberation of the captive from the dragon's power. In other words, the feminine image extricates itself from the grip of the terrible mother, a process known in analytical psychology as the crystallization of the anima from the mother archetype. The union of the adolescent son with the great mother is followed by a phase of development in which an adult male combines with a feminine partner of his own age and kind in the Hiros Gamos. Only now is he mature enough to reproduce himself. He is no longer the tool of a superordinate earth mother, but, like a father, he assumes the care and responsibility for his offspring, and having established a permanent relationship with a woman, founds the family as the nucleus of all patriarchal culture, and beyond that, the dynasty 
and the state. With the freeing of the captive and the founding of a new kingdom, the patriarchal age comes into force. It is not yet patriarchal in the sense that the female is subjugated, only in the sense that the male exercises independent control over his children. Whether the woman shares this control or the man arrogates all the power to himself, as in the tyrannical form of patriarchy, is of secondary importance beside the fact that the autocratic rule of the mother over her offspring is now ended. We spoke earlier of the male's immemorial fear of the female, which appears as soon as he ceases to be childishly dependent upon the all-providing good mother and becomes a separate entity. This separation is natural and necessary. That is to say, there are more inside tendencies aiming at self-emancipation than there are outside tendencies which require and enforce this emancipation. No baleful father figure robs the infant of its mother. Even if this picture does occur, it is always the projection of an inner heavenly authority who insists upon the self-emancipation of the ego, just as, in the shape of the father, it exhorts the hero to fight. The youth's fear of the devouring great mother and the infant's beatific surrender to the Ouroboric good mother are both elementary forms of the male's experience of the female, but they must not be the only ones if a real man-woman relationship is to develop. So long as the man loves only the bounteous mother in woman, he remains infantile, and if he fears woman as the castrating womb, he can never combine with it and reproduce himself. What the hero kills is only the terrible side of the female, and this he does in order to set free the fruitful and joyous side with which she joins herself to him. This freeing of the positive feminine element and its separation from the terrifying image of the great mother mean the freeing of the captive and the slaying of the dragon in whose custody she languishes. The great mother, hitherto the sole and sovereign form in which woman was experienced, is killed and overthrown. The foreshadowing of this process in mythology, the transformation of the terrible mother, has been described by Keyes under the motif of the pacification of the beast of prey, though he does not consider the connections with which we are concerned here. He writes, The pacification of the untamed forces in the beast of prey, as we see it in the magical taming of the injurious powers of poisonous nature deities, and above all in the conquest of the Uraeus serpent as the royal diadem of Buto, is a very characteristic contribution of human thought in the historical epoch. Actually, the taming of terrible deities goes back to the prehistoric age of mythology, as when the Egyptian Hathor is mollified and her wrath averted with the help of dancing, music, and intoxicating liquor, or when Bast, the friendly form of the lion goddess Sekhmet, becomes the goddess of healing, and her priests become physicians. In Egyptian mythology, however, this development soon reaches a higher level. Now the wonder came to pass that the brutal goddess laid aside her nature and, as the good sister of her divine partner, changed into a human woman. Here the transformation of the terrible female still takes place on the divine plane, and characteristically enough it is Thoth, the god of wisdom, who undertakes to pacify Tefnut, another terrible lion goddess. But in the hero myth, where the action passes to the human world, the task of transforming and freeing the female is assigned to the hero. In the captive, she no longer appears as a mighty transpersonal archetype, but as a human creature, a partner with whom man can unite himself personally. More, she is something that cries out to be rescued, set free, and redeemed, and she demands that the man shall prove himself manly, not merely as the bearer of the phallic instrument of fertilization, but as a spiritual potency, a hero. She expects strength, cunning, resourcefulness, bravery, protection, and readiness to fight. 
Her demands upon her rescuer are many. They include the throwing open of dungeons, deliverance from deadly and magical powers both paternal and maternal, the hacking down of the thorny thickets and flaming hedges of inhibition and anxiety, liberation of the slumbering or enchained womanhood in her, the solution of riddles and guessing games in a battle of wits, and rescue from joyless depression. But always the captive to be set free is personal and hence a possible partner for the man, while the perils he has to overcome are transpersonal forces which, objectively speaking, bind the captive or, subjectively, hinder the hero's relation to her. Besides these rescue myths and dragon-slaying myths, there are others in which the hero kills the monster with the assistance of a friendly female figure. In this series, the woman, Medea Ariadne Athene, for example, is actively hostile to the dragon of the devouring mother archetype. These myths show us the helpful, sisterly side of woman, standing shoulder to shoulder with a hero as his beloved, helpmate, and companion, or as the eternal feminine who leads him to redemption. Fairy tales lay particular stress on the sisterliness of these figures who succor the hero in his peril, touchingly ready to sacrifice themselves and to love him with their purely human love, whose very differences complement his own. It is no accident that the many-sided figure of Isis was not only the wife of Osiris and the mother who bore him anew, but also his sister. The sisterly side of a man-woman relationship is that part of it which stresses the common human element. Consequently, it gives man a picture of woman that is closer to his ego and more friendly to his consciousness than the sexual side. It is a typical form of relationship, not a real one. Mother, sister, wife, and daughter are the four natural elements in any relationship between men and women. Not only do they differ typologically, but each has its legitimate place in the development and misdevelopment of the individual. In practice, however, these basic types may be mixed. For instance, maternal or conjugal traits may be involved in a man's relations with his sister. But the important thing is that the sister, the feminine soul image, who appears personally as Electra and transpersonally as Athene, is a spiritual being, representing the female as a separate ego-conscious individual who is quite distinct from the feminine collective aspect of the mothers. Once the anima sister side has been experienced through the rescue of the captive, the man-woman relationship can develop over the whole field of human culture. The freed captive is not merely a symbol of man's erotic relations in the narrow sense. The task of the hero is to free, through her, the living relation to the you, to the world at large. The primitive psychology of man is characterized by a tendency of the libido to activate incestuous family ties, which Jung has called kinship libido. That is to say, the original state of participation mystique in the Uruboros expresses itself as the force of inertia that keeps man fixed in the oldest and most intimate of family ties. These family ties are personalistically projected to mother and sister and the symbolic incest with them, straining back to the Ouroboros, is therefore marked by a lower femininity, which binds the individual and his ego to the unconscious. With the rescue of the captive, the hero frees himself from bondage to the endogamous kinship libido and advances toward exogamy, the conquest of a woman outside the family or tribe. This heterogynous aspect of the anima always has the character of higher femininity, because the anima sister, both as the captive awaiting deliverance and as the helper, is related to the higher masculinity of the hero, that is to say, to the activity of his ego consciousness. The experience of the captive and helper marks out within the threatening monstrous world of the unconscious presided over by the mothers a quiet space where the soul, the anima, 
can take shape as the feminine counterpart of the hero and as the complement to his ego consciousness. Though the anima figure also has transpersonal characteristics, she is closer to the ego, and contact with her is not only possible, but is the source of all fruitfulness. Familiarity with this higher aspect of woman helps man to overcome his terror of the fanged and castrating womb, the gorgon who bars his way to the captive, that is to say, prevents entry into the creative, receptive womb of a real woman. Besides the figure of Sophia Athene, the eternal feminine, we also find that of the captive princess, who not only draws the hero upward and on, but into herself, thus changing him from a callow youth into her lord and master. In this sense, the captive, Ariadne, Andromeda, etc., is primarily the beloved, Aphrodite. But this Aphrodite is no longer the primordial ocean symbolizing the Great Mother. She has been born out of it, and she carries its mark in altered form. We cannot dwell on the numerous anima aspects of the captive princes and their relation to the Great Mother. Suffice it to say that the hero unites himself with the woman he has set free and founds his kingdom with her. The right of marriage derives from the part played by the king in the old fertility ritual. The union of the earth goddess with the god-king becomes the prototype of marriage, and only with the institution of this symbolic ritual did the act of sexual union, endlessly repeated for millions of years, begin to be understood consciously. It now became evident, as an ideal and in actual fact, that the hitherto unconscious union, previously regulated only by instinct, has a meaning. Its link with the transpersonal invests a mindless, natural occurrence with the solemn significance of a ritual act. Thus, the hero's rescue of the captive corresponds to the discovery of a psychic world. This world is already of vast extent as the world of Eros, embracing everything that man has ever done for woman, everything that he has experienced and created for her sake. The world of art, of epic deeds, poesy, and song, which revolves around the liberated captive, spreads out like a virgin continent that has broken away from the world of the first parents. Great tracts of human culture, and not of art alone, spring from this interplay and counterplay of the sexes, or rather, of masculine and feminine. But the symbolism associated with the rescue of the captive goes even further. For with the liberation of the captive, a portion of the alien, hostile, feminine world of the unconscious enters into friendly alliance with a man's personality, if not actually with his consciousness. Personality is built up largely by acts of introjection. Contents that were before experienced outside are taken inside. Such external objects, as well as being contents of the objective world without, that is to say, things and persons, can also be contents of the psychic world of objects within. In this sense, the liberation of the captive and the dismemberment of the dragon mean not merely an analysis of the unconscious, but its assimilation resulting in the formation of the anima as one authority within the personality. It is a tremendous step forward when a feminine sisterly element, intangible but very real, can be added to the masculine ego consciousness as my beloved or my soul. The word my separates off from the anonymous hostile territory of the unconscious, a region which is felt to be peculiarly my own, belonging to my particular personality. And although it is experienced as feminine and therefore different, it has an elective affinity with the masculine ego, which would have been unthinkable in connection with the Great Mother. The dragon fight is correlated psychologically with different phases in the ontogenic development of consciousness. The conditions of the fight, its aim, and also the period in which it takes place vary. It occurs during the childhood phase, during puberty, and at the change of consciousness in the second half of life, wherever, in fact, 
a rebirth or a reorientation of consciousness is indicated. For the captive is the new element whose liberation makes further development possible. The tests of masculinity and the proofs of ego stability, willpower, bravery, knowledge of heaven, and so forth, which are demanded of the hero, have their historical equivalent in the rites of puberty. Just as the problem of the first parents is resolved in the dragon fight, and is in turn succeeded by the hero's encounter with a woman as his partner and his soul, so through the initiation ceremony the neophyte is detached from the parental sphere and becomes a marriageable young man capable of founding a family. But what happens in myth and in history also happens in the individual, and on the basis of the same archetypal determinism. The central feature of puberty psychology is the syndrome of the dragon fight. Time and again, the failure of the dragon fight, that is to say, involvement in the problem of the first parents, proves to be the central problem for neurotics during the first half of life and the cause of their inability to establish relations with a partner. The personal aspects of this situation, a small part of which has been formulated psychoanalytically as the personalistic Oedipus complex, are merely surface aspects of the conflict with the first parents, that is to say, with the parental archetypes. And in this process, not only the man, but, as will be shown elsewhere, the woman, too, has to kill the parents by overthrowing the tyranny of the parental archetypes. Only by killing the first parents can a way be found out of the conflict into personal life. To get stuck in this conflict and to yield to its fascination is characteristic of a large group of neurotics and also of a certain spiritual type of man whose limitations lie precisely in his failure to master the feminine psyche in his fight with a dragon. So long as the conflict with the first parents occupies the foreground, consciousness and ego remained rooted in the magic circle of this relationship. Although this circle is of almost infinite extent, and the struggle within it, the struggle with the primary forces of life, the fact remains that the activity of the individual who confines himself to this primal circle is essentially negative in character. He is the victim of his own isolation and seclusion. People who get exclusively involved with these primary forces, the first parents, remain in the retort, as the alchemists say, and never reach the stage of the red stone. The fact that they have failed to rescue and redeem the feminine side of themselves is often expressed psychologically in an intensive preoccupation with universals to the exclusion of the personal human element. Their heroic and idealistic concern with humanity at large lacks the self-limitation of the lover who is ready to cleave to the individual and not to mankind and the universe alone. All Redeemer and Savior figures whose victory stops short without rescuing the captive, without sacramentally uniting themselves with her, and therefore without having founded a kingdom, have something dubious about them from the psychological point of view. Their manifest lack of feminine relationship is compensated by an excessively strong unconscious tie to the Great Mother. The non-liberation of the captive expresses itself in the continued dominance of the Great Mother, under her deadly aspect, and the final result is alienation from the body and from the earth, hatred of life, and world negation. Despite the extraordinary importance of the captive for conscious development, we do not find in the myths any particular characterization of her as an individual, nor would this be consistent with the nature of the anima. It is only the captive's connection with the treasure hard to attain that reveals her nature, for the captive is herself the treasure, or is somehow related to it. The treasure is invested with magical properties. Its finder obtains the power to make witchcraft, to fulfill wishes, to become invisible and invulnerable, to change his shape, to have revelations, to conquer space and time, to become immortal. We constantly find it asserted that the magical treasure 
is merely the recrudescence of infantile wishful thinking, and that the faculties thereby acquired are nothing but wishful ideas. It would seem to be a question of what Freud was later to call the sovereign power of thought, an expression that has since become popular. By this, he meant the alleged peculiarity of childish and primitive natures to believe that wishes and thoughts are effective, that is to say, real. Here, too, Jung made discoveries of fundamental importance in his Psychology of the Unconscious, although at the time much of the material was taken in the narrow psychoanalytical sense and could only be rectified later in his Psychological Types. This applies in particular to introversion, the inward turning of the libido, which requires an interpretation on the subjective level. But before it was recognized that introversion and extroversion were equally legitimate attitude types, Jung himself interpreted introversion reductively and misunderstood it as an archaic and regressive phenomenon, that is to say, as a relapse into a primitive mode of functioning. This view is very much in evidence when Jung interprets the precious thing hard to attain as masturbation, particularly where the object of the hero's fight is the theft of fire. It is at first not altogether clear why, if masturbation is the precious thing, it should be so very hard to attain, especially as psychoanalysis states that it is a perfectly natural stage in infantile sexuality. Such a statement borders on the paradoxical when the captive crops up in connection with this precious thing. All the same, psychoanalysis has grasped an essential aspect of the mythological situation. It was correct in seeing the facts as symbolic, but it interpreted them personalistically and therefore falsely. As the precious thing hard to obtain, masturbation is to be taken in connection with the theft of fire as a symbol of creative generation, in which sense it has remarkable correspondences with the production of fire by rubbing and also with immortality, rebirth, and self-discovery. And indeed, if the liberation of the captive and the gaining of the treasure release a flood of productivity in the soul, causing the individual to feel himself in this creative act akin to the gods, then it is no wonder that mythology is so passionately concerned with the symbol of the treasure. In dealing with the creation myths, we pointed out that the childish question of where life comes from is bound up with the question of the parents and the nature of birth and generation. We found that personalistic interpretations and explanations, which only take account of sexuality, were inadequate. And this is true also in the present context. Just as the child is really asking about the first parents of all that lives, so it is not a question here of masturbation, but of the creative and self-generating powers of the soul. Mankind is not infantile and is not to be fobbed off with wishful thinking. Despite all the idiosyncrasies of human nature, a purely illusory sort of thinking, even in the case of primitive man, stands in flagrant contrast to his genius for adaptation and his sense of reality, to which we owe all the elementary inventions that make civilization possible. To take an example, the magical connection between ritual representation of the killing of an animal in Paleolithic art and the killing of it in reality is not real, that is to say, does not work in the way in which primitive man possibly thought that it did work. We, with our logical mode of thinking, first understand this magical working in terms of causality, and then declare that no such causal connection exists. But primitive man experiences the magical effect differently and more correctly. In any case, the effect of the pictorial killing upon the real animal is not the effect of thought, so that to speak of the sovereign power of thought is exceedingly problematical. We can establish as a scientific fact that the right is not likely to have any objective effect upon the animal, but that is not to say that the magic right is therefore illusory, infantile, and mere wishful thinking. The magical effect of the right is factual enough, and in no sense illusory. 
Moreover, it actually works out, just as primitive man supposes, in his hunting successes. Only the effect does not proceed via the object, but via the subject. The magical right, like all magic, and indeed every higher intention, including those of religion, acts upon the subject who practices the magic or the religion by altering and enhancing his own ability to act. In this sense, the outcome of the action, whether it be hunting, war, or whatever else, is in the highest degree objectively dependent upon the effect of the magic ritual. It was left for modern man to make the psychological discovery that the operative factor in magic is the reality of the soul and not the reality of the world. Originally, the reality of the soul was projected outwards upon an external reality. Even today, prayers for victory are commonly regarded not as an inner alteration of the psyche, but as an effort to influence God. In exactly the same way, hunting magic was experienced as an effort to influence the quarry, and not as an influencing of the hunter himself. In both cases, our enlightened rationalism misunderstands the magic and prayer as illusory, in its scientific pride at having established that the object cannot be influenced. In both cases, it is wrong. An effect that proceeds from an alteration in the subject is objective and real. The reality of the soul is one of the basic and most immediate experiences of mankind. It permeates primitive man's whole view of life, naturally without his being aware that it is an inner experience. The animating principle of mana, the effect of magic, the magical efficacy of spirits, and the reality of collective ideas, dreams, and ordeals are all governed by the laws of this interior reality which modern depth psychology is trying to bring to the surface. We must not forget that the discovery of the objective external world is a secondary phenomenon, the result of human consciousness endeavoring, with infinite labor and the help of the instruments and abstractions of modern science, to grasp the object as such independently of the primary reality of man, which is the reality of the psyche. But early man relates himself above all to this primary reality of psychic dominance, archetypes, primordial images, instincts, and patterns of behavior. This reality is the object of his science, and his efforts to deal with it in his cults and rituals were just as successful in controlling and manipulating the inner forces of the unconscious as are modern man's efforts to control and manipulate the forces of the physical world. This discovery of the reality of the psyche corresponds mythologically to the freeing of the captive and the unearthing of the treasure. The primordial creative powers of the psyche, which in the creation myths were projected upon the cosmos, are now experienced humanly as part of man's personality, as his soul. Only now does the hero become humanized, and only through this act of liberation do the transpersonal processes of the unconscious become psychic processes within a human person. By freeing the captive and raising the treasure, a man gains possession of his soul's treasures, which are not just wishes, that is to say, images of something he has not got but would like to have, but possibilities, that is to say, images of something he could have and ought to have. The task of the hero which is to awaken those sleeping images that can and must come forth from the night in order to give the world a better face, is far indeed from masturbation. And yet it is a preoccupation with oneself, a case of letting the libido stream inward without a partner, a kind of masturbatory self-fertilization in the uroboric manner, which alone makes possible the creative process of psychic palingenesis or self-birth. The reality of all culture, our own included, consists in realizing these images which lie dormant in the psyche. All art, religion, science, and technology, everything that has ever been done, spoken, or thought, has its origin in this creative center. 
The self-generating power of the soul is man's true and final secret, by virtue of which he is made in the likeness of God, the Creator, and distinguished from all other living things. These images, ideas, values, and potentialities of the treasure hidden in the unconscious are brought to birth and realized by the hero in his various guises, savior and man of action, seer and sage, founder and artist, inventor and discoverer, scientist and leader. It seems to be a well-established fact that the problem of creation lies at the heart of the mythological canon which once prevailed throughout the Near East. Everywhere the drama of the dying and resurgent god, enacted on New Year's Day by the king as the god's successor, was accompanied by a recitation of the current creation story. If we take this dramatic enactment of mythological events as a projection of the psychological processes going on in the hero, then the connection between creation, the New Year's ritual, and rebirth becomes self-evident. The question as to why mankind reproduces the natural process in his cults and rituals so indefatigably, so passionately, and apparently so senselessly, can now be answered. If primitive man holds the right responsible for the fruitfulness of the earth and postulates a magical connection between the two, we must surely ask, why does he do this? How comes it that he apparently overlooks the self-evident fact that the vegetation continues to grow and that nature can get on perfectly well without him? Man's magical religious behavior, which anthropocentrically includes his own actions as an essential part of the natural process, is the fountainhead of all culture. It is not true to say that he reproduces nature. Rather, by means of an analogous set of symbols, he produces in his own soul the same creative process which he finds outside himself in nature. This equation of creation inside with creation outside can be seen in the identification of the great individual who represents mankind or the group, for example, the fertility king, with the Creator God. The hero is a bringer of culture, like the God with whom the king is identical. It is related of Osiris that he led the Egyptians out of the state of savagery and cannibalism and gave them their laws, not only teaching them to honor the gods, but to plant corn, to gather fruit, and to cultivate the grape. In other words, civilization and agriculture are attributed to him. But why precisely to him? Because he is not merely a fertility god in the sense that he controls natural growth. He is this too, but his creativeness includes that capacity without being limited to it. Every culture hero has achieved a synthesis between consciousness and the creative unconscious. He has found within himself the fruitful center, the point of renewal and rebirth which in the New Year Fertility Festival is identified with a creative divinity and upon which the continued existence of the world depends. This is what the right, and through it mankind, means. About this knowledge of the creative point, of the buried treasure, which is the water of life, immortality, fertility, and the afterlife rolled into one, the aspirations of mankind unwearyingly revolve. The constellation of this point is not a reproduction of nature, but a genuine creation, and the symbolic recitation of the story of creation at the new year has its rightful place at this point. The inner object of the ritual is not the natural process, but the control of nature through the corresponding creative element in man. It is, however, impossible to find the treasure unless the hero has first found and redeemed his own soul, his own feminine counterpart which conceives and brings forth. This inner receptive side is on the subjective level the rescued captive, the virgin mother who conceives by the holy wind ghost and who is at once man's inspiration, his beloved and mother, the enchantress and prophetess, just as the hero is her lover and father. The fruitfulness of the Great Mother, in other words, the predominance of the collective unconscious, 
causes a flood of unconscious material to erupt into the personality, sweeping it along, and sometimes even annihilating it like an elemental force. But the fruitfulness of the hero who gains the captive is a human and cultural fruitfulness. From the union of the hero's ego consciousness with the creative side of the soul, when he knows and realizes both the world and the anima, there is begotten the true birth, the synthesis of both. The symbolic marriage of ego hero and anima, as well as being the precondition of fertility, offers a firm foundation on which the personality can stand and fight the dragon, whether this be the dragon of the world or of the unconscious. Hero and princess, ego and anima, man and woman, pair off and form the personal center, which, modeled on the first parents and yet opposed to them, constitutes the proper human sphere of action. In this marriage, which in the oldest mythologies was consummated at the New Year festival, immediately after the defeat of the dragon, the hero is the embodiment of the heaven and father archetype, just as the fruitful side of the mother archetype is embodied in the rejuvenated and humanized figure of the rescued virgin. The liberation of the captive has the effect of releasing the virgin wife, the young mother and partner, from her fusion with the Uroboric mother, in whom dragon and virgin mother were still one. But now they are finally differentiated from one another through the activated masculine consciousness of the hero. After having discussed the symbol of the captive in all its ramifications, we shall sum up by taking the story of Perseus as a paradigm of the hero myth, for only now is it possible to understand the background and the symbolic meaning of all the mythological data. Perseus was the child of Danai, who conceived him by Zeus in a shower of golden rain. The negative father appears twice over in personal form, first as the grandfather, King Acrisius of Argos, who, because the oracle had prophesied that he would meet his death at the hands of his grandson, causes his daughter Danai and her improvidently begotten child to be shot in a chest and cast into the sea. The second negative father figure is Polydectus, the hospitable ruler who marries Danai and, to get rid of Perseus, commands him to bring back the Gorgon's head. Now the Gorgons are the daughters of Phorcys, the Grey One, who, like his two sisters Cato, the monstrous, and Eurybia, the great in strength, and his brother Taumas, the wonder-maker, is a child of the deep, Pontos. All of them give birth to a terrifying and fabulous brood of monsters. The Gorgons, metallic-winged, serpent-haired, and serpent-engirdled, tusked like boars, bearded and barbed, and with protruding tongues, are Uroboric symbols of what we might justly call the infernal feminine. Their sisters and guardians are the Greae, whose name means fear and dread. They too, with their one eye and one tooth between them, are Uroboric creatures who dwell on the uttermost confines of night and death, far to the westward, by the shores of the primeval ocean. Perseus has Hermes and Athena on his side, the tutelary deities of wisdom and consciousness, with whose help he outwits the grey eye, contriving to learn from them the way to the nymphs. These beneficent sea goddesses give him the helmet of invisibility that belongs to Hades, a pair of winged sandals, and a wallet. Hermes presents him with a sword, and Athene lends him her brazen shield for a mirror, in which he can see the Medusa's head reflected, and so is able to kill her for to look directly upon the Gorgon's features is to risk certain death by being instantly turned to stone. We cannot enter more closely into this exceedingly interesting symbolism, except to say that intellect and spiritualization symbols play a most significant part. Flying, invisibility, and reflected sight form a homogeneous group, and to this we would add the wallet in which Perseus hides the Gorgon's head thus making it invisible and harmless, as a symbol of repression. Now what is so very odd 
is the manner in which Perseus is represented in early Greek art. The main feature is not, as one might think, the killing of the Gorgon, but the hero's headlong flight from the pursuing sisters. To our way of thinking, it is strange indeed to see the valiant Perseus depicted over and over again as a tearing fugitive. Evidently, the winged sandals, the helmet of invisibility, and the hiding wallet are much more important to him than the death-dealing sword, and his fear greatly enhances the horrific aspect of the slain but ever-pursuing Gorgon. Once more, we encounter the mythological prototype of Orestes, pursued by the Furies, for, like him, Perseus becomes a hero because he has killed the terrible mother. The Ouroboric character of the Gorgon can be adduced not only from the symbols, but also from the history of religion. In connection with a Gorgonesque sculpture on the Temple of Artemis in Corfu, dating from the 6th century, Woodward writes, It may seem odd that this uncouth, grimacing figure should be given the place of honor on the temple pediment, but the idea behind it takes us back to a time long before these Gorgon figures were identified with the creatures of the Perseus legend. With her attendant lions, she embodies the great nature spirit of primitive belief, who appears in early Asiatic and Ionian works of art as a goddess, with birds, lions, or snakes heraldically set on either side of her, the prototype of the Sibylle of Phrygian worship and the Artemis of the Greeks. Here, through one aspect of her nature, she has become partly identified with Medusa. Without pausing to comment on this passage, we can take it that the identity of the Gorgon dispatched by Perseus and the figure of the great mother who rules over wild animals is proven, even for investigators not familiar with the real background of the myth. The hero's flight and escape, then, testify very clearly to the overpowering character of the Great Mother. Despite the assistance of Hermes and Athena, despite the miraculous gifts bestowed on him by the nymphs, and despite the fact that he averts his face for the death stroke, he is barely man enough to kill her. Note that the paralyzing and petrifying effect of the hideous death mask reappears as the stick-fast motif in the story of Theseus. Attempting to abduct Persephone from the underworld, he sticks fast to the rocks and is tormented by the Aranes until Heracles comes to his rescue. The power of the Great Mother is too overwhelming for any consciousness to tackle direct. Only by indirect means, when reflected in Athene's mirror, can the Gorgon be destroyed. In other words, only with the help of the patron goddess of consciousness, who, as the daughter of Zeus, stands for heaven. On his way back from killing the mother, Perseus frees Andromeda from a horrible sea monster that ravages the land and is about to devour the girl. This monster has been sent by Poseidon, who is referred to as the Medusa's lover, and is as ruler of the ocean himself the monster. He is the terrible father, and since he is the Medusa's lover, he is clearly related to the great mother as her invincible phallic consort. Again and again in his wrath, he sends monsters to devastate the land and destroy the inhabitants. He is the dragon or bull who represents the destructive masculine side of the Urboros, which has split off and become autonomous. The defeat of this monster is the task of the hero, whether he be called Bellerophon or Perseus, Theseus or Heracles. Thus, the sequence so typical of the hero myth is recapitulated in the story of Perseus. The killing of the transpersonal mother and father, the Medusa and the sea monster, precedes the rescue of the captive, Andromeda. His father a god, and his mother the bride of a god, a personal father who hates him, then the killing of the transpersonal first parents, and finally the liberation of the captive, these are the stages that mark the progress of the hero. But this path can only be trodden to its triumphal conclusion with the help of the Divine Father, whose agent here is Hermes, and with the help of Athene, whose spiritual character and hostility to the Great Mother 
we have already emphasized. The fact that Perseus then gives the Gorgon's head to Athene, and that she emblazons it upon her shield, crowns this whole development as the victory of Athene over the Great Mother, of the warrior aspect which is favorable to man and consciousness, and which we also meet in the Oresteia. The most striking feature in the figure of Athene is the defeat of the old mother goddess by the new, feminine, spiritual principle. Athene still has all the characteristics of the great Cretan goddess. On numerous vase paintings, she is surrounded by snakes. Indeed, the great snake is her constant companion right to the end. Likewise, her emblem, the tree, and her appearance in the form of a bird betray her Cretan origins. But the primordial power of the female has been subdued by her. She now wears the gorgon's head as a trophy upon her shield. From quite early times, she had been the patron goddess of the ruler and was worshipped in his palace, so that she came to symbolize the revolution which in the patriarchal age broke the power of the mother deity. Sprung from the head of Zeus, she is father-born and motherless in contrast to the mother-born, fatherless figures of ancient times, and in contrast again to the terrible mother's animosity toward all things masculine, she is the companion and helper of the masculine hero. This fellowship between man and woman is illustrated on a vase dating from the second quarter of the 6th century B.C., which shows Perseus hurling stones at the monster. Andromeda is not, as is usually the case, chained and passive. She is standing beside Perseus as his helpmate. Another symbolically important feature of the myth tells us that a winged horse, Pegasus, sprang from the decapitated trunk of the Gorgon. The horse belongs to the chthonic phallic world and was said to be the offspring of Poseidon. He represents nature and instinct, which are all powerful in half-human creatures like the centaurs. The seahorse sporting among the white-crested breakers is a variant of the same motif. As the moved and moving element in the stormy sea of the unconscious, he is the destructive impulse. Whereas in the horse, as a domesticated animal, nature is tamed and submissive. It is interesting to note that in an early picture of the slaying of the Medusa from the 7th century BC, she appears as a centaur. This symbolism seems to be primordial and is the basis of the story that Pegasus sprang from the slain Medusa. The winged horse is set free when the centaurus is destroyed by the winged man. What the winged horse symbolizes is the freeing of libido from the Great Mother and its soaring flight, in other words, its spiritualization. It is, with the help of the same Pegasus, that Bellerophon performs his heroic deeds. He withstands the seductions of Anthea, who thereupon sends him forth to fight the Chimera and the Amazons. Again, the symbolism points clearly enough to the victory of the masculine conscious spirit over the powers of the matriarchate. The profound psychological intuition of the myth is revealed even more strikingly in the fact that Pegasus, on being released from the Medusa, is credited with a creative work upon earth. We are told that as the winged horse flew up to Zeus amid thunder and lightning, he struck the fountain of the muses from the ground. The archetypal affinity between horse and fountain is the same as that between natural impulse and creative fertilization. In Pegasus, it takes the form of transformation and sublimation. The winged horse strikes the fountain of poesy from the earth. As we shall see later, this aspect of the Pegasus myth lies at the root of all creativity. The destruction of the dragon means not only the liberation of the captive, but the ascent of the libido. The process known in psychological theory as the crystallization of the anima from the mother archetype is dynamically portrayed in the myth of Pegasus. The soaring creative forces are set free by the death of the dragon. Pegasus is the libido which, as winged spiritual energy, carries the hero Bellerophon 
also called Hippanous, skilled with a horse, to victory. But he has also inward-flowing libido that wells forth as creative art. In neither case is the release of libido undirected. It rises up in the direction of spirit. Thus, to put it abstractly, the hero Perseus espouses the spiritual side. He is the winged one, and the gods of the spirit are his allies in the fight with the unconscious. His foe is the Uroboric Gorgon, dwelling far to the west, in the land of death, flanked by her hideous sisters, the Greyi, denizens of the deep. Perseus defeats the unconscious through the typical act of conscious realization. He would not be strong enough to gaze directly upon the petrifying face of the Ouroboros, so he raises its image to consciousness and kills it by reflection. The treasure he gains is firstly Andromeda, the freed captive, and secondly Pegasus, the spiritual libido of the Gorgon, now released and transformed. Pegasus is therefore a spiritual and transcendent symbol in one. He combines the spirituality of the bird with a horse character of the gorgon. The development of personality proceeds in three different dimensions. The first is outward adaptation to the world and things, otherwise known as extraversion. The second is inward adaptation to the objective psyche and the archetypes, otherwise known as introversion. The third is centroversion the self-formative or individuating tendency, which proceeds within the psyche itself, independent of the other two attitudes and their development. In the foregoing, we have tried to show what the goal and content of the dragon fight, the captive and the treasure, meant for the extroverted and introverted attitude types. In conclusion, we have to demonstrate their significance from the point of view of centroversion. Chapter 2. Transformation, or Osiris The aim of the extroverted type of hero is action. He is the founder, leader, and liberator whose deeds change the face of the world. The introverted type is the culture-bringer, the redeemer and savior who discovers the inner values, exalting them as knowledge and wisdom, as a law and a faith, a work to be accomplished, and an example to be followed. The creative act of raising the buried treasure is common to both types of hero, and the prerequisite for this union with a liberated captive, who is as much the mother of the creative act as the hero is its father. The third type of hero does not seek to change the world through his struggle with inside or outside, but to transform the personality. Self-transformation is his true aim, and the liberating effect this has upon the world is only secondary. His self-transformation may be held up as a human ideal, but his consciousness is not directed in the narrower sense to the collective, for in him central version expresses a natural and fundamental trend of the human psyche which is operative from the very beginning and which forms the basis not only of self-preservation, but of self-formation as well. We have followed the birth of ego consciousness and of the individual all through the archetypal stages whose climax was reached in the hero's fight with the dragon. In this development, a constant increase of central version can be detected, tending toward the consolidation of the ego and the stabilization of consciousness. It gives rise to a standpoint, indeed a rallying point, from which to combat the dangerous fascination of the world and the unconscious, a fascination that lowers the level of consciousness and disintegrates the personality. Both attitude types, introversion as well as extroversion, can easily succumb to this danger. Centroversion, by building up the conscious ego and by strengthening the personality, tries to protect them and to counteract the danger of disintegration. In this sense, the growth of individuality and its development are mankind's answer to the perils of the soul that threaten from within and to the perils of the world 
that threaten from without. Magic and religion, art, science, and technics are man's creative efforts to cope with his threat on two fronts. At the center of all of these endeavors stands the creative individual as the hero, who, in the name of the collective, even when he is a lonely figure standing out against it, molds it into shape by molding himself. Before we examine the psychological side of this process, namely the formation of personality, we shall have to turn our attention to the myths which are its archetypal repositories. Stability and indestructibility, the true goals of centroversion, have their mythological prototype in the conquest of death, in man's defenses against its power, for death is a primordial symbol of the decay and dissolution of the personality. Primitive man's refusal to recognize death as a natural occurrence, the immortalization of the king among the ancient Egyptians, ancestor worship, and the belief in the immortality of the soul in the great world religions, all these are but different expressions of the same fundamental tendency in man to experience himself as imperishable and indestructible. The best example of centroversion and its symbolism is to be found in ancient Egypt, in the cults and myths that cluster round the figure of Osiris. The story of Osiris is the first self-delineation of this process of personality transformation, whose counterpart is the visible emergence of the spiritual principle from the natural or biological principle. It is no accident that in the figure of Osiris, we can see a matriarchal, life-affirming world changing into a patriarchal one, where the accent falls on spirit. Thus, the Osiris myth throws light on an important chapter in the early history of mankind, but it also furnishes the clue to a chief aspect of the hero myth, namely the transformation resulting from the fight with the dragon and the relation of the hero son to the father figure. Osiris is a many-sided figure, but in his most original form, he is unquestionably a fertility god. We have seen how, in the matriarchal phase of fertility ritual, the great mother predominated, and how the bloody dismemberment of the young king guaranteed the earth's fertility. The regeneration of Osiris through Isis belongs to this stage. As we read in the pyramid texts, Thy mother has come to thee, that thou mayest not perish away. The great modeler she is come, that thou mayest not perish away. She sets thy head in place for thee. She puts together thy limbs for thee. What she brings to thee is thy heart, is thy body. So dost thou become he who presides over his forerunners. Thou givest command to thy ancestors, and also thou makest thy house to prosper after thee. Thou dost defend thy children from affliction. Or, in the lament of Isis for Osiris, Come to thy house, come to thy house, thou pillar. Come to thy house, beautiful bull, lord of men, beloved, lord of women. Although derived from a late papyrus, this is the age-old lament for the dead, known as the Maneros Lament. The lament for the loss of the living phallus, which is why the symbol of the pillar, the jed, emblem of Osiris, is found in conjunction with a bull. The identification of Horus with the Ithyphallic Min was later transferred to Horus, but the significance of the chthonic Osiris, the beloved and lord of women, is age-old. This same Osiris, as Horus, the son of Isis, is called the bull of his mother. Just as in Heliopolis, he is invoked as the son of the white sow. The lower Osiris belongs to the matriarchal sphere of fertility, and so in all probability did the Sem priest, who with a leopard skin and long tail was called the pillar of his mother. The signification of Osiris as the living phallus connects him with Mendes, another place where he was worshipped, and with the sacred goat. It is no accident that the cult assigned a special role to a certain queen whose image was set up in the temple and bore the name Arsinoe Philadelphos, beloved of the goat. 
The sexual union of the divine animal with one of the sacred priestesses was an ancient rite. So once more we find ourselves back in the old sphere of matriarchal fertility with its phallic deities. This phase is ruled by the earth goddess and by Osiris as a corn god. The grain significance of fertility gods is widespread. Likewise, the analogy of their death and resurrection with the corruption and resurrection of the seed grain. In the coronation ceremony of the Egyptian kings, the significance of the grain formed the most ancient element. Osiris, the grain, is threshed by his enemy Set. Barley is placed on the threshing floor and trodden by oxen. The oxen represent the followers of Set and the barley Osiris, who was thus cut in pieces. There is a play here on the words it, barley, and it, father, in Coptic, as the oxen were driven round the threshing floor, an act equated with Horus smiting the followers of Set. Horus says, I have smitten for thee, Osiris, them that smote thee. The threshing over, the corn was carried away on the backs of asses. This symbolized the ascent of Osiris into heaven, supported by Set and his confederates. This interpretation of Blackman's is undoubtedly correct, at least as far as the last sentence about Osiris' resurrection. In the Book of the Dead, too, we find Set identified with a sacrificial oxen, but this identification, although pre-dynastic, probably does not derive from the oldest level. The oldest may well be that in which Set, as well as Isis and Osiris, appears as a pig or boar. Fraser has pointed out that originally the grain was trodden into the earth by swineherds. This would seem to be the earliest form of the killing of Osiris by Set, while the threshing is perhaps the second form. As we have seen, Osiris is killed twice over by Set in the myth. Firstly, he is drowned in the Nile or shut up in a chest, and secondly, he is hacked to pieces— the equivalent of threshing by being trodden underfoot. The dismemberment of the corpse and the burial of its parts in the fields is the magical analogy of inseminating the earth with grain, a ritual that may have been connected with the original mode of interment practiced by the pre-dynastic inhabitants of Egypt who dismembered the dead body. Another characteristic of the matriarchal fertility rites has assumed the greatest significance. In all probability, the phallus of the dismembered king was mummified as a symbol of male potency and preserved until the death of his successor. Fraser has given numerous examples of the last vestiges of this ceremony, showing that the spirit of vegetation in the shape of a sheaf of grain or something similar was preserved until the next sowing or harvest and was regarded as a sacred object. The fertility king, or his substitute, an animal, sheaf of grain, etc., suffers a double fate. In the first place, he is killed and cut up, but a portion of him, the sacred phallus, or the thing representing it, remains. This remainder is stored in or under the earth, like the seed or the corpse. Its descent into the underworld is accompanied by a threnody for the dead. The descent or katagogia, as it is called in the peasant festal calendar, corresponds to the hiding of grain in subterranean chambers for future sowing. Descent and entombment, therefore, are not only identical with the burial of the dead and the insemination of the earth, but amount to a rite for the perpetuation of fertility. He who remains was originally represented by the permanent mummified phallus of the slain fertility king or by corresponding phallic symbols which were preserved underground with a buried seed, that is to say, with the dead, until the resurrection festival of the young grain. From the very beginning, however, Osiris was not identical with these young fertility gods. Very early stress was laid not so much upon the transitoriness of the youthful figure as upon his everlasting nature. Worshipped as vegetation, grain, and in Byblos as the tree, he is a god of fertility, earth, and nature, thus combining in himself the characteristics of all the divine sons of the Great Mother. 
but he is also water, sap, the Nile. In other words, he is the animating principle of vegetation. Whereas in the gardens of Adonis, for instance, Adonis stands only for growth. The ceremonial effigy of Osiris, with stalks growing out of him, proves that he is more than the grain. He is, in fact, the moisture and the prime cause whence the grain springs. He is not just the god who dies to rise again. He is the god who does not die, who remains forever. A paradox indeed, for he is the mummy with the long member. It can easily be shown that this cognomen expresses the essential nature of Osiris. It accords with certain peculiar features of the myth, which have never been sufficiently emphasized, much less understood. The myth says that when the dismembered portions of Osiris were put together again, the phallus could not be found, that Isis replaced it by a wooden or cult phallus, and that she was made pregnant by the dead Osiris. So, although lacking a phallus, or equipped only with a wooden one, Osiris became the father of Horus, an exceedingly remarkable feature in a fertility god. In all matriarchal fertility rites, castration and fertilization, phallic worship and dismemberment are interrelated parts of a symbolic canon. The problem of Osiris, however, goes deeper than that and demands interpretation on many more levels. To understand the fertility of Osiris only as the lower phallic fertility of the earth, as water, as the fertilizing Nile, as the living verdure of vegetation, and as the grain, is to limit the range of his action. Indeed, the whole nature of Osiris lies in transcending this lower fertility. The higher, as opposed to the lower nature of Osiris, can be conceived as a transformation or as a new phase of his self-revelation. Both natures are connected with the same object, the cult phallus. The death of the original fertility king led, as we saw, to two distinct ceremonies, the dismemberment of the body and the induration of the phallus. Dismemberment, sowing, and threshing are equivalent to destroying the personality and breaking down the living unit. Such was originally the fate meted out to the dead body of Osiris. The principle opposed to this found embodiment in the mummification of the phallus, to make it hard and everlasting. And the symbol of everlastingness is Osiris, the mummy with the long member. This paradoxical double significance of Osiris, evidently present right from the beginning, forms the basis of his development in Egyptian religion. On the one hand, as a dismembered god, he is the bringer of fertility, the young king who passes away and returns. On the other hand, as the procreative mummy with a long member, he is everlasting and imperishable. Not only is he the living phallus, but he retains his potency even as the mummified phallus. As such, he begets his son Horus, and thus, as a spirit, as the dead man who remains, his fertility is imbued with a higher meaning. In this mysterious symbol of the fertile dead, mankind has unconsciously stumbled on a vital factor which it projected outside itself, because no clearer formation of it was then possible the everlastingness and fruitfulness of the living spirit as opposed to the everlastingness and fruitfulness of nature. The great antagonist of Osiris was symbolized by Set, the black boar, whose emblem is the primeval flint knife, the instrument of dismemberment and death. This Set is the epitome of darkness, evil, destructiveness. Being twin brother to Osiris, he is the archetypal antagonist, not only in the cosmic sense, in which he stands for the powers of darkness, but also in the historical sense, for he represents the matriarchate and the destructive side of Isis, against which Osiris is fighting as founder of the patriarchate. Dismemberment, whose symbols are the knife of Set, the Apopis serpent, and the whole demonic horde of scorpions, snakes, monsters, and gorillas, is the danger that threatens the dead. 
It is the danger of psychophysical decay and extinction. The most vital parts of the Egyptian religion and the whole of the Book of the Dead are devoted to averting this danger. Homage to thee, O my divine father Osiris, thou hast thy being with thy members. Thou didst not decay, thou didst not become worms, thou didst not diminish, thou didst not become corruption, thou didst not putrefy, and thou didst not turn into worms. I am the god Kepera, and my members shall have an everlasting existence. I shall have my being. I shall live. I shall germinate. I shall wake up in peace. I shall not putrefy. My intestines shall not perish. I shall not suffer injury. Mine eye shall not decay. The form of my visage shall not disappear. Mine ears shall not become deaf. My head shall not be separated from my neck. My tongue shall not be carried away. My hair shall not be cut off. My eyebrows shall not be shaved off, and no baleful injury shall come upon me. My body shall be established, and it shall neither fall into ruin nor be destroyed on this earth. The fundamental trend of centroversion, the conquest of death through everlastingness, finds its mythological and religious symbol in Osiris. Mummification, the preservation for all eternity of the body's shape, as the outward and visible sign of its unity, this gives living expression to the anti-set principle of Osiris. Osiris is the self-perfected, he who has overthrown Set and escaped the threat of dismemberment, whereas on the matriarchal level he is reborn of the animating wind breath through his mother-sister spouse, or in the pyramid texts has his head restored to him by the mother goddess Mut as a symbol of unity, he is finally worshipped precisely because he renews himself. We read in the Book of the Dead, I have knit myself together. I have made myself whole and complete. I have renewed my youth. I am Osiris, the Lord of Eternity. The evident fact that the archaic custom of cutting up the corpse for burial was repudiated indeed anathematized by a later tribe of settlers, is, as so often happens, only the historical reflection of a much deeper psychic change. Dismemberment of the dead is practiced only among primitive peoples who have no consciousness of personality, and for whom the deciding motive is their fear of revenance. In Egypt, however, the intensification of ego-consciousness and the development of centroversion are particularly clear. In these circumstances, dismemberment would obviously be regarded as a supreme danger, and the preservation of a man's bodily shape through embalming the supreme good. The mummified Osiris could become the legitimate exponent of this tendency, because even in the earliest times when the matriarchal fertility cult held sway, he had been the bearer and representative of the cult phallus, and as such, he who remains. The earliest Osiris symbol is the Jed, and his earliest place of worship, Dedu, the old Busiris on the Nile Delta. The interpretation of the Jed pillar has remained a puzzle to this day. Generally, the Jed is taken to represent a tree trunk, with the stumps of branches projecting to either side at the top. In the cult, at all events, it was as bulky and heavy as a tree trunk, as can be seen very clearly from the illustrations of the erection of the Jed at the festivals. Moreover, the Osiris myth fully indicates that the Jed pillar was a tree trunk. Isis fetched the body of Osiris from Byblos and Phoenicia, enclosed in a tree trunk which the king of that place, husband of Queen Astarte, had used as a pillar in the hall of his court. Isis cut the coffer out of the tree, but the tree she wrapped in fine linen and anointed, and right down to Plutarch's day, it was still worshipped in Byblos as the wood of Isis. We have already discussed the tree cult in Byblos, and its relation to Isis and Osiris in connection with the sun lover and the mother goddess. Here we would only draw attention 
to the significance of timber for Egypt. The religious and cultural links between Egypt and Phoenicia are extremely ancient. Trees, and particularly very big trees like the cedars of Lebanon, offer a powerful contrast to the fleeting life of vegetation, which in a treeless land like Egypt comes and goes with a season. They are the things that endure, so it is understandable that in early times the tree became the symbol of the jed, signifying duration, for the tree is a fully grown thing that nevertheless endures. To the primitive Egyptian, wood symbolized organic living duration as opposed to the inorganic dead duration of stone and the ephemeral life of vegetation. In the Canaanite sphere of culture centering upon Byblos, the tree trunk was sacred to the great mother, Queen Astarte, in the form of a post with hewn off lateral branches. At all events, it comes under the broad category of sacred trees and posts. Another salient point is the identity of the tree trunk and the wooden sarcophagus, the most important item in the Egyptian rites for the dead. The mythical entombment of Osiris in a tree coffin by his brother Set and the Byblos episode bring out his Jed nature, both as a god in the form of a pillar and as a mummy. But the mummy and the coffin are a means for making the corpse everlasting, and Osiris, whether as tree, pillar, or mummy, is identical with a wooden cult phallus which replaced the embalmed phallus of the seasonal king. According to the Egyptian belief, which held that the dismembered portions of Osiris were distributed among the various places of worship, the backbone was buried in Dedu, and in view of its articulated structure, the Jed pillar lends itself to such a conception. The pillar is composed of two segments. Derived originally from the trunk of a tree, the upper segment, corresponding to the tree top, with its four lateral branch stumps, finally came to be correlated with the neck and head region of Osiris, while the lower segment, corresponding to the trunk, was correlated with the backbone. Like many another Egyptian fetish, the Jed pillar shows us very clearly how the original figure became humanized. First it sprouted arms, as on the west wall of the temple at Abydos, then the eyes were painted in, and finally the pillar was equated with the entire figure of Osiris. In what manner the Jed pillar arose has, so it seems to us, been demonstrated with the utmost clarity by Budge. From a comparison of the paintings, he has established that it was formed by combining Osiris' sacrum, the lowest joint in the spinal column, with a tree trunk dedicated to the old god of Busiris, upon which it was erected. The ordinary Jed symbol is a stylization of this combination. Three components enter into conjunction here. The first is phallic, since the sacrum is the lower part of the backbone of Osiris, which was believed to form the seat of his virility. The second component is the aforesaid duration. The fact that the sacrum, a bony structure, is used here instead of the phallus, serves, like the pillar, to emphasize the character of everlastingness. For this reason, the Jed symbol and the image of the tree with branch stumps could easily coalesce, both as regards their form and their content. But the third, and for us the most important factor, is the erection, that is to say, the fact that the sacrum was set on the top of the tree trunk. In this way, the everlasting begetter, the erected or higher phallus, becomes the head, which proves its character as a spermatic or spiritual symbol. Like the solar phallus, another spiritual symbol, the head of the tree begets and brings forth in the tree birth. But neither the everlasting begetter nor the begotten stands for the lower principle. On the contrary, they are erected, that is, raised up, as the ritual itself shows. Because the sublimation of the erection and transformation of the lower principle into the higher was the most important component of the Jed symbol, its upper segment was later identified with the head of Osiris, 
I am Osiris, the lord of the heads that live, mighty of breast and powerful of back, with a phallus which goeth to the remotest men and women. I have become a spirit, I have been judged, I have become a divine being. I have come, and I have avenged mine own body. I have taken up my seat by the divine birth chamber of Osiris, and I have destroyed the sickness and suffering which were there. From the Book of the Dead. This reuniting of the head with the body for the purpose of producing a whole figure and nullifying the dismemberment is one of the main features of the Osiris cult. A chapter in the Book of the Dead is entitled, The Chapter of Not Letting the Head of a Man Be Cut Off from Him in the Underworld. The restoring of the head was absolutely essential if Osiris was to be put together again, and what we know of the mystery cult at Abydos confirms this. In the reconstitution of the body of Osiris, we are told that the crowning scene was erection of the backbone of Osiris and the placing of the head of the god upon it. Thus, the Jed Pillar symbolizes the reunited Osiris, the everlasting, who can say of himself, I have made myself whole and complete. This interpretation of the union of head and backbone in the Jed is also confirmed by the prayer which had to be spoken while laying a golden Jed on the neck of the dead man. Rise up, O Osiris! Thou hast thy backbone. O still heart, thou hast the ligatures of thy neck and back. O still heart, place thyself upon thy base. There are thus two determining motifs running through the Egyptian belief in a future life, both connected with Osiris. The first is perpetual duration, the preservation of the body's shape, and therefore of the personality, in the funeral rites by means of embalming and by safeguarding the mummies in pyramids. The second is resurrection and transformation. The figure of Osiris is from the very beginning bound up with the principle of ascension. The earliest picture of him shows him as the god at the top of the staircase. He is the ladder from earth to heaven, and those who could not be buried in Abydos itself tried at least to set up a stone there at the staircase of the great god. Budge writes, This ladder is referred to in the pyramid texts. It was made originally for Osiris, who by means of it ascended into heaven. It was set up by Horus and Set, each of whom held one side while they assisted the god to mount it. In the tombs of the ancient and middle empires, several models of ladders have been found. Osiris, the dismembered fertility god, who overcomes his dismemberment, Lord of the Ascent and the Heavenly Ladder, is on the cosmic level of mythology the same as Osiris, the moon god. Brifo has put together a mass of material, proving that the kingship of Osiris was originally of a lunar character. This association is archetypal. In the matriarchate, the fertility kingship of the adolescent lover is always connected with the moon, which is quartered and reborn and thus guarantees fertility. It is, however, important to note how significantly the figure of Osiris rises above these matriarchal associations. By ascending from earth to heaven and conquering death and dismemberment, Osiris becomes the exemplar of transformation and resurrection. In the Book of the Dead, the dead man who was identified with Osiris says, I set up a ladder to heaven among the gods, and I am a divine being among them. His ascension and resurrection reflect a psychic transformation which is mythologically projected as the union of the lower, earthly Osiris with the higher, or the union of the dismembered but reconstituted body of Osiris with the higher spiritual soul and spiritual body. This self-transformation, resurrection, and sublimation, which is at once a union with the self, is described as the union of Osiris, god of the underworld, with the sun god, Ra. The ascent of Osiris is depicted in the Book of the Dead as the rising of the Horus sun, signifying life, out of the Jed pillar. 
and the pillar itself is shown placed between the twin mountain peaks of sunrise and sunset. The jed is therefore the material body that gives rise to the sun's soul. On the other hand, at the Memphis festival, the mummy was worshipped with a jed for its head. In other words, it was worshipped as the whole body to which the head had been restored. Dadu Busiris, the oldest shrine of Osiris, is situated in a gnome whose emblem was of great importance for the development of Osiris symbolism. We can trace the development of the basic symbols as the Osiris cult moved from Busiris to Abydos. Osiris took over the symbols of the old reigning god Ansti, the original lord of Busiris, which were the scourge and the scepter. The Ansi symbol consisted, besides these, in a body shaped like a post or fasces, surmounted by a head with two ostrich plumes. And it is clear that Osiris was able to assimilate both symbols, the fasces and the head. The same thing happened when the Osiris religion assimilated the Abydos symbols. Here as well, the old symbols, together with the local cult of the first among the Western ones, that is to say, a god of the dead, accommodated themselves with the greatest ease to the nature of Osiris. After Osiris had established himself in Abydos, the local emblem, likewise a fasces bearing a kind of head with two ostrich feathers and a sun, was equated with the Ansi symbol and the head of Osiris. An ancient model shows this Abydos pillar, surmounted by the head relic with its sun and feathers, planted in the mountain hieroglyph. The relation to the sun becomes all the stronger when we note that, at the foot of the Abydos emblem, the pillar is supported on both sides by two lions, the Akeru, symbolizing the morning and evening sun, yesterday and today. In the vignettes, they are shown flanking both the rising and the setting sun. The Osiris symbol in Abydos was, a fact overlooked by Winlock, the sinking sun. The local god was worshipped like Osiris as the first among the western ones, that is, as the evening sun and god of the dead. And in later times, Abydos was considered to be the place where the head of Osiris was buried. If we now sum up this syncretistic development, we shall see that the symbolism is extremely significant. Osiris, Osiris' head, and Osiris the sun all go together for sun and head reflect his spirituality. The head of Ansi, the Abydos head, and the head of Osiris are one. But since Abydos lies to the west, it became the place where Osiris was worshipped as the evening sun and god of the dead, and where the head of Osiris rests. Osiris, however, is not just the sinking sun. The Abydos emblem is also held to symbolize the head soul of Ra, and his worshippers are depicted as Horus-headed and also as jackal-headed demons, indicating that they worship the morning as well as the evening sun. Osiris has two shapes. He is the western god of the underworld, ruler of the dead, and equally he is the everlasting lord of heaven. Originally he was the ruler of the earth and the underworld, who reigned in the west, while Ra, the lord of heaven, reigned in the east. But before long these two figures came together in the double structure of Osiris to form the double soul. Thy material body liveth in Dedu and in Nifurtet, and thy soul liveth in heaven each day. The mythological statement about the double nature of Osiris, the unity of Osiris and Ra, corresponds to the psychological statement about the union of the heart-soul, Ba, which is the transpersonal body center, with the spiritual soul, or subtle body, Ku. In this union lies the mystery of Osiris. I am the divine soul which dwelleth in the divine twin gods. Question. Who is this? Answer, it is Osiris. 
he goes to Dedu and findeth there the soul of Ra. Each god embraces the other, and the divine souls spring into being within the divine twin gods. The same chapter contains other formulations of this double nature, such as, Yesterday is Osiris, and today is Ra, on the day when he shall destroy the enemies of Osiris, and when he shall establish as prince and ruler his son Horus. I know the god who dwelleth therein. Who then is this? It is Osiris, or as others say, Ra is his name. Or it is the phallus of Ra, wherewith he was united to himself. Again, in the book of things which are and of things which shall be, we read, Who then is that? It is Osiris. Or, as others say, it is his dead body. Or, as others say, it is his filth. The things which are and the things which shall be are his dead body. Or, as others say, they are eternity and everlastingness. Eternity is the day and everlastingness is the night. The God who begets himself is depicted more particularly as the Kepri, the scarab or dung beetle. Because he rolls a ball of dung before him, this beetle was venerated as the sun-moving principle. Even more significant is the fact that, his task completed, he buries the sun-ball in a hole in the ground and dies, and in the following spring the new beetle creeps out of the ball as the new sun risen from under the earth. He is thus a symbol of the self-begotten, and is deemed creator of the gods. Budge says, He is a form of the rising sun, and his seat is in the boat of the sun god. He is the god of matter, which is at the point of passing from inertness into life, and also of the dead body, from which a spiritual and glorified body is about to burst forth. The Capri also symbolizes the heart, Ab, but Osiris, even though he is likened to the heart's soul which animates the body, and of which it is said, My heart, my mother, is something suprapersonal. The heart is shown in the shape of the self-begetting scarab. It is the seat of the powers of conscience, which appear as the assessors of the judgment of the dead, and in the creation myth of Memphis, the creative organ par excellence. It is the heart which makes all that results to come forth, and it is the tongue which repeats, expresses, the thought that the heart created. The demiurge who created all the gods and their cas is in his heart. The hieroglyph for thought is written with the ideogram for heart, which indicates that the heart's soul is a spiritual principle. At the same time, it is the libido principle of all earthly life, hence the phallic form of Osiris, the he-goat or ram of Mendes, Ba, is identified with the heart-soul, Ba. However, Osiris is not only the lower phallic principle, but the higher solar principle as well. He is the Bennu bird, the Greek phoenix. Thou art the great phoenix that was born in the branches of the tree at the great house of princes in Heliopolis. Self-renewal and tree-birth, the higher nativity, go together. The Osiris who was born of the tree is born of himself, in the precise sense of one risen from his coffin. For Osiris, tree and coffin are one and the same. Hence, the tree-birth is identical with rebirth. Osiris is the sun rising out of the tree, just as he is the sign of life rising out of the jed pillar. This vignette illustrates one of the oldest chapters in the Book of the Dead, the 14th, whose opening words sum up all the essential points in the mystery of Osiris. I am yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and I have the power to be born a second time. I am the divine hidden soul who created the gods. The problem of death was originally solved by the simple device of regarding the next world as a continuation of this. The change in point of view that resulted in a spiritual instead of a materialistic answer to this question 
a change also reflected in the transformation of Osiris, can be seen very clearly in a dialogue between the dead Osiris and Atum, a species of creator god. The latter says, I have given glorification in place of water, air, and gratification of the senses, and a light heart in place of bread and beer. And he ends with this promise, Thou shalt exist for longer than a million million years, an era of millions, but I shall destroy all that I have created. The earth shall appear once more as the primeval ocean, as the flood of waters that was in the beginning. I am that which shall remain, together with Osiris, after I have changed myself back into a serpent, which no man knoweth, which no god seeth. Atom's answer passes beyond the next world. It is an eschatological answer that holds a promise of perpetuity even when the world has reverted to the Uroboric state. Together with Osiris, this is a promise that the soul shall be the deathless companion of the Creator. The identity of Osiris, the human soul, and the prime creative force amounts to identity with the creativity of Godhead. In this sense, too, we can understand the mysterious saying of the dead man who describes his transformation into Osiris as an initiation into the mystery of metempsychosis. I have entered in as a man of no understanding, and I shall come forth in the form of a strong spirit, and I shall look upon my form, which shall be that of men and women forever and ever. False theories abound, all trying to prove that the symbolic contents of this passage express a later spiritualization, but characteristically enough it does not belong to a late chapter at all. It is taken from an exceedingly solemn text that sums up the essence of the Book of the Dead in a single chapter, the shorter version of which is ascribed to the First Dynasty. Osiris of the Double Soul, then, is the luminary of the upper and lower worlds, the self-unifier, preserving and yet changing his shape, conqueror of death, the self-begotten, holder of the secret of resurrection and rebirth, through which the lower power is transformed into the higher. The pharaoh, too, in imitation of Osiris, is at his death changed into a spirit dwelling in heaven. He undergoes an Osirification, which consists in the union of his soul parts, and the first condition of this is the preservation of the mummy and its magical resuscitation. The whole purpose of the ritual in the Book of the Dead is to make the earthly body immortal by uniting the parts and preventing it from being dismembered. Preservation of the body through embalming, its purification, also the purification of the ka, the ghost soul belonging to the body, these are the preliminaries that lead up to the grand Osiren mystery, namely the germination of the spiritual body from the mummified corpse. The heart soul, ba, a human-headed falcon who is the life principle of the body, and the mummy is connected with the spiritual soul, ku, which is the life principle of the spiritual body, sahu. Whereas the ku is immortal, its companion heart soul is material and immaterial according to its pleasure. Ba, ku, and kepri, heart, are all coordinated. Naturally, these part souls or soul parts are mythological projections and cannot be defined more closely. The crucial task is their transformation and unification resulting in the production of the deathless double-being Osiris Ra. This is the great work which Osiris accomplishes and which Pharaoh accomplishes after him. The Ka soul has a particularly important part to play in this process. It is extraordinarily difficult for us to understand what is meant by the Ka, because the Ka soul corresponds to no concept in our modern consciousness and is an archetypal entity. The Egyptians conceived it as a man's double, as his genius or guardian angel, as his name and as that which nourished him. It was eternally youthful, for which reason to die was the same as 
Allez vivre avec son cas. Moray sums up its meaning in these words. Sous ce nom de cas, il faut donc entendre non pas seulement le principe de vie du pharaon, des dieux et des hommes, mais l'ensemble des forces vitales et la nourriture qui alimente et sans laquelle dépérit tout ce qui existe dans l'univers. The same authority writes, « This Ka is the father and the being which causes man to live, presides over the intellect and the moral forces, gives spiritual and physical life. It is connected with the cow sustenance, and is therefore an elementary libido and life symbol. From this essential and collective Ka, a primordial substance living in heaven, the gods detach an individual ka for the king. When the ka and the body are purified and united, the king, like Osiris before him and every individual after him, is a complete being who achieves perfection. The ka soul is therefore an archetypal prefiguration of what we know today as the self. In its union with the other soul parts, and in the transformation of personality thereby affected, we have the first historical example, in mythological projection, of the psychic process we call individuation, or the integration of the personality. Through this union of soul parts, the king becomes a ba, a heart soul, who dwells with the gods and possesses the breath of life. He is now an Akhu, a perfect spiritual being. The king is reborn in the glory of the eastern horizon Akhet, and he who is born in the east becomes an Akh, a glorious shining one. The archetypal affinities between light, sun, spirit, and soul, all referring to Osiris in his transformation, have seldom been expressed more plainly. Seen against this symbolic and mythological background, the actual content of the ritual will more readily yield up its meaning. Our knowledge of the Osiris ritual derives from three sources. The Osiris festivals, in particular the erection of the Venerable Jed on New Year's Day in Dedo Busiris, the coronation ceremonies, and the said festival of the pharaohs, the purpose of which was to strengthen and renew the kingly power. On more than one occasion, we have pointed out the significance of Osiris for fertility, and his connection with the Great Mother. This stage, however, had already been passed at the time when the Osiris ritual was celebrated at Dedu at the Feast of the New Year. Traces of the old seasonal kingship still lingered, but the dominant feature was the idea of duration, which gave its name to the Jed Pillar and also to the city. Following the eclipse of his moon character, Osiris came to embody in himself the whole year, as we can see from the 365 lights that accompanied the voyage of the 34 little papyrus boats down the Nile on All Souls Day, the 22nd of Koyak. The wooden effigy of Osiris, which had been buried in the ground the previous year, was then dug up, and having been replaced by a new one, was laid upon boughs of sycamore, as a symbol of the resurrection of the year and the birth of the sun from a tree. The erection of the jed, which is the main feature of the festivities, symbolizes the resuscitation of Osiris, that is to say, the coming to life of the dead, and not the resurrection of a young vegetation god. The festal calendar of Dendera says, As for the last day of the fourth month of Achet, the raising of the Jed takes place in Busiris on that day of the burying of Osiris in the region of Ba, in the vault under the Izd trees. For on that day the divine body of Osiris comes into him after the wrapping of Osiris. The new year was celebrated on the day following this erection and resurrection. It was the anniversary of Horus of Edfu, also prescribed as the day on which the Egyptian king mounted the throne and on which the said feast was celebrated for the periodic renewal of Egyptian kingship. The original interment of the old king of the year at his death and the enthronement of the new, 
are still perceptible in these ceremonies. The raising of the jed corresponds to the embalming of the phallus and the annual killing of the king in the old fertility ritual, as is apparent from the connection between the setting up of the jed and the new king's enthronement. In the harvest festival, too, we find that the Horus king cuts a sheaf of grain, symbolizing the old vegetation spirit with a sickle. The connection between the Horus king's enthronement and the simultaneous resurrection of Osiris, however, reveals something else, which means more than just the supplanting of the old by the new. In the Osiris myth, the vestiges of the original conflict between the old and the new king, so evident in the fertility rites, are completely overgrown by a new psychic constellation in which the son has a positive relation to the father. We have seen how the originally matriarchal figure of Isis and the rites pertaining to her were superseded by the rule of the Horus kings under the patriarchal protection of Osiris, of whom it was said that he leaves the son in his father's place. Isis helps him in this. She conducts a lawsuit for the legitimacy of her son and of his claim to the throne, and gets the gods to recognize Horus' paternity, the basis of the patriarchate. The supersession of the matriarchal by a patriarchal epoch is an archetypal process. That is to say, it is a universal and necessary phenomenon in the history of mankind. We interpret it in this sense without respect to the possible and even probable overthrow of a pre-dynastic matriarchal Egypt by patriarchal tribes owing allegiance to Horus, and without discussing the possible union of a late Horus sun cult with an earlier Osiris moon cult. Moray has examined the decay of this matriarchal uterine system. He speaks of an evolution of society from the uterine system in which each woman of the clan believes herself impregnated by the totem to the paternal system in which the husband is the true father and he associates the transition from clan to family and from the supremacy of the community to that of the individual with this development. We have still to discuss the role of the god-king as the great individual who, with his heroic consciousness, breaks down the power of the great mother. Interestingly enough, traces of this shifting of the center of gravity can still be seen in Egyptian myth and ritual. The early capitals of Upper and Lower Egypt were cities where two mother goddesses of lasting splendor had reigned from time immemorial, the vulture goddess Nekbet of Nekhen in Upper Egypt and the snake goddess Uachet of Buto in Lower Egypt. In the Osiris myth, the city of Buto has a sinister connection with death and dismemberment. Horus was killed there by a scorpion a creature sacred to Isis, and it was there that the rediscovered body of Osiris was cut in pieces by Set. Buto and Neken are twin cities, also known as Pideb and Nekeb Neken. It is significant that in the north and south, the Horus cities and the mother cities lie facing one another on opposite banks of the river. Traces of the age-old conflict between the patriarchal Horus and the ancient matriarchal rulers, can still be seen in the ritual. For instance, in the ceremonial performance of the battle between Pe and Dep, Horus first is attacked, but the end shows his victorious incest with his mother, which proves him a hero. Later, at the time of the historical dynasties, the vulture and snake symbols of the vanquished female deities occur as emblems in the crown of the Horus kings, and their names form part of the fivefold royal title. These patriarchal kings, the sons of Horus, who take over the inheritance of Osiris, necessarily become the avengers of their father and adversaries of the maternal uncle Set, Osiris' deadly enemy. Whether in consequence, the role of an elder Horus devolves upon a younger Horus is of no importance here. The protection that Osiris extends to his son derives from their old battles with Set. 
In this struggle, Horus strikes off Set's testicles. The wound that Horus receives in his eye heals. The dead Osiris is restored to life with the help of this same Eye of Horus. And Horus is thereupon invested with the symbols of power, two scepters in which Set's testicles are incorporated. The restoration of Osiris is identical with his resurrection and transformation, which make him the king of the spirits and his son king of the earth. Thus, the enthronement and rulership of the son rest upon the spiritualization of the father. The raising of the dead man, which is symbolically identical with the erection of the jed pillar and the placing of the previous year's effigy of Osiris upon the sycamore branches, precedes both the enthronement of Horus and the said festival every time. Any interpretation which assumes that these rites merely entreat the dead to help the living is quite inadequate. The close connection between the Osiris ritual, the coronation ceremonies, and the said festival makes such a general interpretation impossible. One of the basic phenomena of totemism, and of all initiation rites, is that the totem, or ancestor, is reincarnated in the initiate, finding in him a new dwelling place, and at the same time constituting his higher self. This result can be traced all the way from the sonship of the Horus hero and its connection with the apotheosis of his father Osiris to the Christian incarnation and the phenomenon of individuation in modern man. Between the son who regenerates himself as a hero, his divine parentage, and the rebirth of the dead father in the son, there exists a fundamental relationship which was formulated as I and the father are one. In Egypt, this relationship was mythologically prefigured in the process to which we have repeatedly drawn attention. Horus, as the avenger of his father, becomes the supreme temporal ruler. But at the same time, his earthly power is grounded in the spiritual authority exercised by Osiris. The erection of the Jed Pillar occupies a central position in the enthronement of Horus and in the said festival. The succession of the Horus kings is based on this ritual, by which the rite of succession of the son, who is always Horus, and the elevation of the father, who is always Osiris, are archetypally established as universal laws. As the generations succeed one another, and yet remain magically connected, the patriarchal line of fathers and sons is seen to rest upon the spiritual phenomenon of their identity, which transcends their differences. Every king was once Horus and becomes Osiris. Every Osiris was once Horus. Horus and Osiris are one. This identity is reinforced by the figure of Isis, who confronts both of them as mother, wife, and sister. Mother, because she gives birth to Horus and awakens the dead Osiris to new life. Wife, because she conceives Horus by Osiris and the Horus sons by Horus. Sister, because, if we equate the function of the sister with a role played by Athena in respect of Perseus and Orestes, she fights for the dynastic rights of the dead Osiris and the living Horus. As son and heir, the Horus king reigns over the earthly world and represents its phallic fertility. The coronation ceremonies show how far he has become the permanent successor to the old fertility king. The original sacrifice of this king was replaced by a fight with his deputy. Now the fight with evil falls to the lot of the hero and victorious king. The defeat of Set by Horus, which plays such an important part in the Edfu ritual, and in the coronation ceremonies, and again at the erection of the Jed during the said festival, is the condition of the god-king's triumphant fertility. The identification of Horus with the phallic bull-god of Min and the creator god Ta the victory of the corn god, the annexation of Set's testicles, the sacred marriage with Hathor and Edfu, and the ritual renewal of kingship at the harvest festival are all evidence of this fertility character.
It is now abundantly clear that the Horus King no longer acts the part of a temporary fertility king under the dominance of the Earth Mother. He has become the ever-fruitful patriarch who continually fertilizes the Earth and reigns over its progeny. His function has made itself independent of the natural rhythm which was given sacred expression in the old fertility ritual. But it achieved independence only because it found support in an authority that was itself independent of the natural process and its periodicity. The earthly king, like the divine Horus' son with whom he identified himself, needed a higher sanction, and this they both found in the spiritual principle of duration, the incorruptibility and everlastingness symbolized by Osiris. In the matriarchate, death and resurrection occurred on the same earthly plane. Death meant the cessation of fertility, and resurrection meant the reappearance of living vegetation. But both poles remained bound to the rhythm of nature. With Osiris, however, resurrection means realizing his eternal and lasting essence, becoming a perfected soul, escaping from the flux of natural occurrence. The corollary of this is Horus' enthronement as the son of Osiris. As the son of Isis, he would be no more than a fleeting god of vegetation, having his roots in the eternal but eternally changing nature of the Great Mother. Now, however, he is conjoined to the Father, the everlasting and unchanging spiritual Father who rules over the spirits. Like him, he lasts forever. He is at once his avenger, his heir, and the cause of his elevation. When the ladder of Osiris is raised up in the coronation ceremonies, and the erection of the Jed and elevation of the old king usher in the crowning of Horus, this means that his power is grounded in the higher father, and no longer in the lower mother. We can now understand why it is the dead Osiris who begets Horus. This is a primitive symbolical way of expressing spiritual generation. It is not an earthly generation. The father is the mummy with a long member, or, as another image puts it, the scarab with the phallus, eternally potent. And that, too, is why Osiris, when he rose from the dead, lacked a male organ. Isis replaced the missing phallus by a wooden cult phallus. The eunuch is, so to speak, a spermatic eunuch, a not uncommon symbol of spiritual generation, which occurs again and again in the mystery religions and secret teachings. The dead man who begets is a spirit ancestor. He is spermatic spirit, blowing where he listeth, invisible as the wind spirit. The collective unconscious, expressing itself through a modern psychotic and an Egyptian magic papyrus, both agree that the seat of this pneumatic principle is the sun. The solar phallus is the source of the wind, they say. But the sun is Ra Horus and Osiris combined. The problem of creation and the allied problem of spirit found definitive symbolic formulation in the Osiris myth. I and the Father are one. Osiris and Horus are, psychologically speaking, parts of a single personality. The father, without a phallus, or to be more accurate, with a spirit phallus, has his counterpart in the chthonic phallic son. Each depends on the other for his creative powers. But Horus addresses himself to the world and is the temporal ruler, while Osiris, the eternal power behind him, rules the spirits. Son and father, together, are the god of this world and the next. The relation to one another is analogous to that between the ego and the self in psychology. The symbolism that gravitates round the figure of Osiris embraces the most primitive levels of man's psychology, as well as its highest reaches. It has its sources in prehistoric burial customs, and it finally ends with projections of the process known today as integration. If we briefly review the different layers of symbolism which illustrate the transformation of human personality and man's growing awareness of this process, we shall see how clearly the trend of centroversion has been seeking to assert itself 
in mankind from the very beginning. The most primitive layer is the recombination of the severed parts, the attempt to make durable and to preserve, but also to elevate. This is seen in the raising up of the body of Osiris upon the tree, in the symbol of tree birth, the lifting of the buried effigy, the placing of the sacrum upon the tree in the jed symbol, and above all in the erection of the jed pillar. The mystique of erection and ascension is intimately connected with the mystery of wholeness and integration, reunion of the divided parts, mummification and preservation of the body form its basis, but this primitive ritual soon passes over into the symbolism of ascent and transformation. The union of body and head then becomes the union of the upper and lower Osiris, and finally the union of Osiris and Ra. But this is equivalent to self-transformation, for Osiris unites himself with his Ra soul to form a perfect being. All this is archetypal when played out among the gods, but the process becomes humanized as soon as the role of Osiris is taken over by the Egyptian king, who, as Horus, unites himself with Osiris. Once the king is included in the divine drama, mythological processes begin to reveal themselves as psychological ones. The process finally takes the form of psychic unification and psychic transformation, by which the discrete soul parts become integrated and the earthly Horus ego aspect of the personality combines with the spiritual divine self. The outcome of both processes, union and transformation on ever higher levels, is the conquest of death, which has always been the supreme goal even in the psychology of primitive man. The patriarchal father-son relationship ousted the once-dominant mother figure Isis in the religious, psychological, social, and political spheres. Vestiges of the original matriarchal rule still remained, but in historical times they were already overshadowed by the father-king. The investiture and enthronement of the son are based on the resurrection of Osiris and the defeat of his enemies. Horus' struggle with the principle of evil, Set, is in a sense the prototype of God's holy war which each of his sons has to wage. With this, the ring closes, and we come back to the hero myth and the dragon fight. Only, we must read the Osiris myth in such a way as to include Horus, the hero, as part of Osiris. We have seen that certain elements of the hero myth belong essentially together. The hero is an ego hero. That is, he represents the struggles of consciousness and the ego against the unconscious. The masculinization and strengthening of the ego, apparent in the hero's martial deeds, enable him to overcome his fear of the dragon and give him courage to face the terrible mother, Isis, and her henchman, Set. The hero is the higher man, the erected phallus, whose potency is expressed in head, eye, and sun symbols. His fight bears witness to his kinship with heaven and to his divine parentage and sets up a dual relationship. On the one hand, he needs the support of heaven in fighting the dragon, and on the other, he has to fight it in order to prove himself worthy of such support. As one regenerated through the fight, the hero is ritually identical with the Father God and is his incarnation. The reborn son, is child of the Divine Father, Father of Himself. And by fathering the rebirth of the Father in Himself, He also becomes His Father's Father. Thus all the essential elements of the hero myth are to be found in the myth of Horus and Osiris. There is only one qualification, and that has to do with the patriarchal conquest of the Terrible Mother. The myth contains traces of the Terrible Isis, but the fact that Horus beheads her and commits incest with her in the Memphis festivities is clear proof that she has been overcome. In general, however, her negative role is taken over by Set, and Isis becomes the good mother. 
In this way, the hero myth develops into the myth of self-transformation, the myth of man's divine sonship, which is latent in him from the beginning, but can only be realized through the heroic union of the ego, Horus, with the self, Osiris. This union had its first exponent in the mythical Horus, and then in the Egyptian kings who succeeded him. These were followed by individual Egyptians, though in their case identification with the king was a matter of primitive magic only, and finally, in the course of further spiritual development, the principle that man had an immortal soul became the inalienable property of every individual. Everywhere the influence of the Osiris myth has been prodigious. Traces of it are to be found in the classical mysteries, in Gnosticism, Christianity, alchemy, mysticism, and even in modern times. In some of the classical mystery religions there is evidence of initiation rites whose purpose it was to produce the higher masculinity, to transform the initiate into the higher man, and so make him akin to, or identical with, God. For instance, the solificatio of the Isis mysteries stresses identification with the sun god, while in certain others the aim is to achieve fellowship with God by means of participation mystique. The path varies, but whether the celebrant is seized with ecstasy and becomes entheos, or is ritually regenerated, or takes God into his own body through communion with him, always the goal is the higher man, the attainment of his spiritual, heavenly part. As the Gnostics of a later day expressed it, the initiate becomes an enus, one who possesses nous, or whom the nous possesses a pneumaticus. A common feature of these mysteries is castration, obviously symbolizing the mortification of lower masculinity in the interests of the higher. When, for example, this happens as a result of the celebrant identifying himself with Attis, or when we find in the Adonis mysteries that the couch upon which Adonis rests is strewn with lettuces, food of the dead and plant of eunuchs, which drives out the generative forces, and that Hemlock plays the same role in the Eleusinian mysteries, this only means that the sacrifice of lower masculinity is the precondition of spirituality. All these ascetic trends are ruled by the Ouroboros and Great Mother principle, and form part of the mystique of the suffering son. Their ultimate goal is the mystic Ouroboric incest that hides behind castration. In terms of stadial development, these mystery cults have either not yet reached the stage of the hero fight or have remained fixed at that level. The aim of this fight is to combine the phallic phonic with the spiritual heavenly masculinity, and the creative union with the anima in the hieros gamos is symptomatic of this. But since in the mystery religions the fight with the dragon is conceived only as the fight with the mother dragon, representing the unconscious chthonic aspect, the inevitable result is identification with the spiritual father, so far as the dragon fight situation has reached at all in the mystery religions. The failure of the fight with the father dragon, the overwhelming force of spirit, leads to patriarchal castration, inflation, loss of the body in the ecstasy of ascension, and so to a world-negating mysticism. This phenomenon is particularly evident in Gnosticism and Gnostic Christianity. The infiltration of Iranian and Manichaean influences strengthens the martial component in the hero, but because he is still a Gnostic at heart, he remains hostile to the world, the body, materiality, and woman. Although there are certain elements in Gnosis that strive for a synthesis of opposites, these always fly apart in the end. The heavenly side of man triumphs, and the earthly is sacrificed. Behind the ecstatic afflatus of patriarchal castration, there lurks the threat and the fascination of Ouroboric incest. Ouroboros and Great Mother are reactivated. That explains why the mysteries are almost always rebirth mysteries. But there is no active self regeneration as in the hero myth. Here, the rebirth is passively experienced by one already dead. 
In the Phrygian mysteries, for example, the limbs of the dead man are put together again. The awakening of the dead as a rebirth mystery is a very characteristic feature of religion everywhere. But it is important to note whether it is initiated by the mother deity, by the priest who represents the self, or by the ego. The situation as we find it in myth and ritual is that simultaneously with the ego's experience of its death, a revivifying self appears in the form of a god. The hero myth is fulfilled only when the ego identifies with this self. In other words, when it realizes that the support of heaven at the moment of death means nothing less than to be begotten by a god and born anew. Only in this paradoxical situation, when the personality experiences dying as a simultaneous act of self-reproduction, will the twofold man be reborn as the total man. Accordingly, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the dead and the dying are summoned to a visionary knowledge of this reproductive act. Likewise, the widespread form of mystery in which the celebrant brings the god to life is an early mythological form of self-generation, where, on the other hand, the celebrant undergoes a symbolical death, but the revivifying god is represented by a priest, there can be no full realization of the likeness between father and son. Already in the Hellenic mysteries, we can see how symbolic contents, which had once been acted out in the ritual performance of mythical events, gradually turn inward becoming first the sacred experience of the initiate, and finally processes within the individualized psyche. This progressive interiorization is a symptom of the individualization and intensification of human consciousness, and this same principle, which first promoted the growth of personality, continues to cover the next phase of its development. Historically speaking, however, the synthetic path of development which includes the stage of the hero fight, was never followed in Christianity as it grew up under Gnostic influences, but only in alchemy, the Kabbalah, and above all, in Hasidism. In alchemy, from which the term Ouroboros is borrowed, we discover all the archetypal stages and their symbolism down to the last detail, including even the symbol of Osiris as the basic symbol of the arcane substance, so that the whole process of alchemical change and sublimation can be interpreted as a transformation of Osiris. Thus, the archetypal stages of conscious development have their crowning symbol in the transfiguration of Osiris, an archaic mythological form of the phenomenon which was destined to reappear thousands of years later as the process of individuation in modern man. But now there comes a new development. As though a Copernican revolution had taken place within the psyche, consciousness faces inward and becomes aware of the self, about which the ego revolves in a perpetual paradox of identity and non-identity. The psychological process of assimilating the unconscious into our present-day consciousness begins at this point, and the consequent shifting of the center of gravity from the ego to the self, signalizes the latest stage in the evolution of human consciousness.